Preface to the Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1, by Edward Tyus Cook. Preface men and women are divided in relation to their papers into hoarders and scatterers miss nightingale was a hoarder and as she lived to be ninety the accumulation of papers stored in her house at the time of her death was very great the papers referring to years up to eighteen sixty one had been neatly done up by herself but it was evident that not everything had been kept after that date time and strength to sort and weed had been wanting and miss nightingale seems to have thrown little away even soiled sheets of blotting paper on which she had made notes in pencil were preserved by a will executed in eighteen ninety six she had directed that all her letters papers and manuscripts with some specific exceptions should be destroyed by a codicil executed in the following year she revoked this direction and bequeathed the letters papers and manuscripts to her cousin mr henry bonham carter after her death the papers were sorted chronologically by his direction and they have formed the principal foundation of this memoir of expressly autobiographical notes miss nightingale left very few at the date of the codicil mentioned above she seems to have contemplated the probability of some authoritative record of her life for in that year she wrote a short summary of what she called my responsibility to india detailing her relations with successive secretaries of state governors-general and other administrators her memory in these matters was still accurate for the summary is fully borne out by letters and other papers of the several dates it adds some personal details in private letters she sometimes recounted at later times episodes or experiences in her life but such references are few nor except for a few years did miss nightingale keep any formal diary and during the crimean episode she was too incessantly busy with her multitudinous duties to find time for many private notes the principal authority for miss nightingale's life is thus the collection of papers aforesaid and these are very copious in information the records in one sort or another of her earlier years are full the papers relating to her work during the Crimean War are voluminous, and I have supplemented the study of these by consulting the official documents concerning Miss Nightingale's mission, which are preserved among War Office papers in the Public Record Office. Her papers relating to public affairs during the years 1856 to 1861 are also very voluminous after the latter date she seems as already stated to have kept almost everything even every advertisement that she received she often made notes for important letters that she sent and sometimes kept copies of them of official documents of printed memoranda pamphlets reports and returns she accumulated an immense collection and though she was not a regular diarist she was in the habit of jotting down on sheets of note-paper her engagements impressions thoughts meditations and also in many cases reports of conversations the collection of letters received by miss nightingale and of her notes for letters sent by her has been supplemented through the kindness of many of her correspondents or their representatives by letters which were received from her I am more especially indebted in this respect to the care of the late Sir Douglas Galton, whose docketed collection of letters from Miss Nightingale, taken in conjunction with a long series of his letters to her, forms a main authority for much of the record of her activity in public affairs. Her letters to Julius and Mary Ball, returned to her after the death of the latter, are in another way of peculiar interest. I am particularly indebted among the lenders of letters addressed to nursing friends to Miss Pringle and to the father of the late Mrs. Daniel Morris, Miss Rachel Williams. Miss Pringle has also favored me with personal reminiscences. 
for permission to print letters written to miss nightingale i am indebted to many of her relations friends and correspondents or their representatives to so many indeed that i ask them to accept here a general acknowledgment i am especially indebted to the king who has been pleased to permit the publication of letters from queen victoria and some other members of the royal family the german emperor has graciously given a like permission in the case of correspondence with the empress frederick the dowager grand duchess louise of baden has allowed me to quote from a long series of letters addressed by her to miss nightingale next to the letters and other papers above described the most valuable material for the life of miss nightingale is contained in her own printed writings many of them published some and these from the biographical point of view the most important privately printed in the case of the crimean war material under both of these heads is particularly abundant her published notes on hospitals and notes on nursing and other works relating to those subjects together with her privately circulated addresses to probationers supplement her private records for her inner life her privately printed book suggestions for thought is of special importance a list of miss nightingale's printed writings whether published or privately circulated is given at the end of the second volume appendix a my purpose in compiling this list was biographical illustration not biographical minuteness i have not included every scrap from miss nightingale's pen which has appeared in print but have given every piece which is directly or indirectly referred to in the memoir or which is of any importance the list will i hope serve a double purpose it enables me to abbreviate in the text the references to my authorities and it provides in chronological order a conspectus of miss nightingale's varied activities so far as they were reflected in her printed writings lastly there is much biographical material not only in blue books and official reports but in writings about miss nightingale except in the case of the crimean war where many eye-witnesses recorded their observations or impressions this material is not all of great value throughout her subsequent life miss nightingale was screened from the public gaze a somewhat legendary figure grew up and it is that which for the most part appears in books about her this however is a subject fully dealt with in an introductory chapter in appendix b i give a short list of writings about miss nightingale here again the purpose is not bibliographical there is a great mass of such writing and a complete list would have been altogether outside the scope of a biography i have included only first-hand authorities or such other books etc as for one reason or another explained in the notes upon each item seemed relevant to the memoir this second list also serves the purpose of simplifying references in the text in a third appendix c i have enumerated the principal portraits of miss nightingale notes on those reproduced in this book will there be found i am indebted to the kindness of sir william richmond and sir harry verney for the inclusion of the portrait which forms the frontispiece to the second volume and to mrs cunliffe for the frontispiece to the present volume to miss nightingale's executors i am indebted for the confidence which they have shown in entrusting her papers to my discretion a biography is worth nothing unless it is sincere the aim of the present book has been to tell the truth about the subject of it and i have done my work under no conscious temptation to suppress exaggerate extenuate or distort from miss nightingale's executors and from other of her friends and relatives i have received help and information which has been of the greatest assistance more especially i am indebted to her cousin mrs vaughan nash who has been good enough to read my book both in manuscript and in proof and who has favored me throughout with valuable information corrections suggestions and criticisms this obligation makes it the more incumbent upon me to add that for any faults in the book whether of commission or of omission i alone must bear the blame end of preface
Introduction to the Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1, by Edward Tyus Cook. Introductory among miss nightingale's memoranda on books and reading there is this injunction quote, the preface of a book ought to set forth the importance of what it is going to treat of so that the reader may understand what he is reading for End quote. the saying is typical of the methodical and positive spirit which as we shall learn was one of the dominant strains in miss nightingale's work and character she wanted to know at every stage precisely what a person or a book or an institution was driving at of all human sounds she said i think the words i don't know are the saddest unless a book had something of definite importance to say it had better she thought not be written and in order to save the reader's time and fix his attention he should be told at once wherein the significance of the book consists this though it may be a hard saying is perhaps not unwholesome even to biographers at any rate as miss nightingale's biographer i am moved to obey her injunction i propose therefore in this introductory chapter to state wherein as i conceive the significance and importance of miss nightingale's life consists and what the work was that she did in the world One. Quote, in the course of a life's experience such as scarcely any one has ever had i have always found said miss nightingale that no one ever deserves his or her character be it better or worse than the real one it is always unlike the real one End quote. of course of no one is this saying more true than of herself it has been your fate said mr jowett to her once to become a legend in your lifetime now nothing is more persistent than a legend and the legend of florence nightingale became fixed early in her life at a time indeed antecedent to that at which her best work in the world as she thought had begun the popular imagination of miss nightingale is of a girl of high degree who moved by a wave of pity forsook the pleasures of fashionable life for the horrors of the crimean war who went about the hospitals of scutari with a lamp scattering flowers of comfort and ministration who retired at the close of the war into private life and lived thenceforth in the seclusion of an invalid's room a seclusion varied only by good deeds to hospitals and nurses and by gracious and sentimental pieties i do not mean of course that this was all that anybody knew or wrote about her any such suggestion would be far from the truth but the popular idea of florence nightingale's life has been based on some such lines as i have indicated and the general conception of her character is to this day founded upon them the legend was fixed by longfellow's poem and miss young's golden deeds its growth was favored by the fact of miss nightingale's seclusion by the hidden almost the secretive manner in which she worked by her shrinking from publicity by her extreme reticence about herself it is only now when her papers are accessible that her real life can be known there are some elements of truth in the popular legend but it is so remote from the whole truth as to convey in general impression everything but the truth the real florence nightingale was very different from the legendary but also greater her life was built on larger lines her work had more importance than belonged to the legend the crimean war was not the first thing and still less was it the last that is significant in miss nightingale's life the story of her earlier years is that of the building up of a character it shows us a girl of high natural ability and of considerable attractions feeling her way to an ideal alike in practice and in speculation having found it she was thrown into revolt against the environment of her home we shall see her pursuing her ideal with consistent though with self-torturing tenacity against alike the obstacles and the temptations of circumstance she had already served an apprenticeship when the call to the crimea came 
it was a call not to sacrifice but to the fulfilment of her dearest wishes for a life of active usefulness such is the theme of the first part which i have called aspiration many other women have passed through similar experiences but there is special significance in them in the case of florence nightingale a significance both historic and personal the glamour that surrounded her service in the crimea the wide world publicity that was given to her name and deeds invested with peculiar importance her fight for freedom to do as florence nightingale did became an object of imitation which the well-to-do world was henceforth readier to condone or even to approve and thus the story of miss nightingale's earlier years is the history of a pioneer on one side in the emancipation of women for the understanding of her own later life the earlier years are all important they give the clue to her character and explain much that would otherwise be puzzling or confused through great difficulties and at a heavy price she had purchased her birthright her ideal of self-expression in work on her return from the crimea she was placed on the one hand owing to her fame in a position of special opportunity on the other hand owing to illness in a position of special disability she shaped her life henceforward so as to make these two factors conform to the continued fulfillment of her ideal i need not here forestall what subsequent chapters will abundantly illustrate i will only say that the resultant effect was a manner of life and work both extraordinary and to me at least of the greatest interest the second part of the memoir is devoted to the crimean war the popular conception with regard to miss nightingale's work during this episode in her life is not untrue so far as it goes but it is amazingly short of the whole truth as now ascertainable from her papers the popular imagination pictures florence nightingale at scutari and in the crimea as the ministering angel and such in very truth she was but the deeper significance of her work in the crimean war lies elsewhere it was as administrator and reformer more than as angel that she showed her peculiar powers queen victoria with native shrewdness and a touch of humor hit off the truth about miss nightingale's services in the crimea in concise words quote, such a clear head i wish we had her in the war office End quote. the influence of miss nightingale's service in the crimea was great some of it is obvious and on the moral side longfellow's poem said the first and the last word she may also be accounted if not the founder yet the promoter of female nursing in the war and the red cross societies throughout the world are as we shall hear the direct outcome of her labors in the crimea the indirect and less obvious results were in many spheres from a sick room in the west end of london miss nightingale played a part and a much larger part than could be known without access to her papers in reforming the sanitary administration of the british army in reconstructing hospitals throughout the world in founding the modern art of nursing in setting up a sanitary administration in india and in promoting various other reforms in that country miss nightingale's return from the crimea it will thus be seen was not the end of her active life in a sense it was the beginning the nursing at scutari and in the crimea was an episode the fame which she shunned but which nevertheless came to her gave her a starting point for doing work which was destined as she hoped and as in large measure was granted to be of permanent service to her country and the world the first chapter of the third part shows her laying her plans for the health of the british soldier and the subsequent chapters tell what followed this is the period of miss nightingale's close cooperation with sidney herbert to the writer this latter phase of miss nightingale's life with its ingenious adjustment of means to ends its masterful resourcefulness its incessant industry and then with its perpetual struggle against physical weakness and its extraordinary power of devoted concentration has seemed not less interesting than the crimean episode the fourth part describes as its main themes the work which miss nightingale did concurrently with that described in the preceding part as hospital reformer and the founder of modern nursing 
other chapters introduce two topics which might at first sight seem widely separate but which were yet closely associated in miss nightingale's mind they deal with her respectively as a passionate statistician and as a religious thinker the nature of her speculations is fully explained in the latter chapters and elsewhere in the memoir it will be seen that miss nightingale had thought out a scheme of religious belief which widely differed from the creeds of christian orthodoxy whether catholic or protestant but which yet admitted of accommodation to much of their language and formularities it admitted also as will appear in due course of close alliance with mysticism miss nightingale believed intensely in a personal god and in personal religion the language which expressed most adequately to her the sense of union with god was the language of the greek and christian mystics but law was to her the thought of god union with god meant cooperation with him towards human perfectibility and for the discovery of the thought of god statistics were to her mind an indispensable means in the fifth part we are introduced to a new interest in miss nightingale's life a new sphere of her work for forty years she worked at indian questions she took up the subject at first through interest in the army it was a natural supplement to her efforts for the health of the british soldier at home to make a like attempt on behalf of the army in india gradually she was drawn into other questions and she became a keen indian reformer all along the line her assiduity her persistence her ingenuity were as marked in this sphere as in others it was only her immediate success that was less in relation to the primary object with which she began her indian campaigns miss nightingale's life and work have great importance the royal commission of eighteen fifty nine through sixty three which was due to her and the measures taken in consequence of its report were the starting point of a new era in sanitary improvement for the army the results have been most salutary miss nightingale's friendship with lord stanley and with sir john lawrence here served her somewhat as that with mr herbert served in the earlier campaign in the wider sphere of indian sanitation generally miss nightingale's efforts were not so successful the field was perhaps too vast the conditions were too adverse for any great and immediate success to be possible yet this and her other efforts for india were the part of miss nightingale's life and work to which she attached most importance and by the record of which she set most store even in the will afterwards revoked directing her papers to be destroyed she made exception of those relating to india and as already stated in the preface one of her few pieces of autobiographical record related to her indian work perhaps it was with the special affection which a mother often feels for the least robust or least successful child perhaps it was that she took long views and that foreseeing a future time when many of the reforms for which she had toiled might be accomplished she desired to be remembered as a pioneer sanitation said a high authority in eighteen ninety four is the cinderella of the indian administrative family the difficulty of finding money and the reluctance to introduce western reforms in advance of eastern opinion are objections with which we shall often meet in the correspondence of indian officials with miss nightingale and they are still raised in the present day on the other hand the under secretary for india in his budget statement for nineteen thirteen declared that quote, the service which has the strongest claim after education on the resources of the government is sanitation end quote, and explained that quote, the budget estimate of expenditure for sanitation comes this year to nearly two million pounds showcasing an increase of one hundred and twelve per cent over the expenditure of three years ago end quote so perhaps cinderella is to go to the ball if ever the glass slipper is found let it be remembered as this memoir will show that miss nightingale was the good fairy her indian work continued as long as she was able to work at all and from eighteen sixty two onwards it forms one of the recurring themes in our story the sixth part while continuing that subject introduces another sphere in which miss nightingale's life and work have important significance from the reform of hospital nursing 
she turned in conjunction with the late mr william rathbone to the reform of workhouse nursing and as one thing led to another it will be seen that miss nightingale deserves to be remembered also as a poor law reformer the seventh part comprises the last thirty-eight years of miss nightingale's life eighteen seventy two through nineteen ten and a word or two here may be said to explain an apparent alteration of scale in a biography the scale must be proportionate not to the number of the years but to their richness in characteristic significance after eighteen seventy two the year in which as miss nightingale put it she went out of office her life was less full theretofore in new activities the germinant seeds had all been sown but these later years though they have admitted of more summary treatment were full of interest the chapters in which they are recorded deal first with miss nightingale's literary work and more especially with her studies in plato and the christian mystics these studies were in part a result of her close friendship of thirty years with mr jowett then too occasion is found for an endeavor to portray miss nightingale as the mother chief for so they called her of the nurses it is only by access to her enormous correspondence in this sort that the range and extent of her personal influence can be measured her ideal of the nursing vocation stands out very clearly from the famous quote, nurses battle which occupied much of her later years she found an opportunity during the same period to start an important experiment in rural hygiene at the same time she was preaching indefatigably the need of health missionaries in indian villages and then came the end to the time of labor there succeeds in every life said ruskin quote, the time of death which in happy lives is very short but always a time End quote in the case of miss nightingale's the time was long she lived for many years after the power to labor was gone two so much by way of preface in explanation of the significance of miss nightingale's life and work but this book endeavors to depict a character as well as to record a career there has been much discussion in our days as in others of the proper scope and method of biography and various models are held up in one sense or another to practitioners in this difficult art the questions are propounded whether biography should describe a person's life or his character his work or how he did it if the person did anything worthy of record a biography should surely describe alike the life and the character the work and the methods the biographer may fail in his attempt but in the case of miss nightingale the attempt is peculiarly necessary because all that she did and the manner in which she did it were as it has seemed to me characteristic of a strongly marked personality behind it this book is however a biography and not a history it is not a history of the crimean war nor of nursing nor of indian administration something on all these matters will be found in it but only so much of detail as was necessary to place miss nightingale's work in its true light and to exhibit her characteristic methods so also many other persons will pass across the stage persons drawn from a great many different classes occupations walks in life but the book does not aim at giving a detailed picture of miss nightingale's circle her relations her friends her acquaintances her correspondence only concern us here in so far as their dealings with her affected her work or illustrate her character here again to revert to what has been said above it will be found i think that this book possesses a certain significance as correcting or supplementing a popular legend a preacher in an obituary sermon upon miss nightingale said that all her work was done by force of simple goodness assuredly miss nightingale was a good woman and there was also a certain simplicity about her but there was much else a man of affairs who in the course of a long and varied life had come in contact with many of the acutest intellects and greatest administrators of the time said of miss nightingale that hers was the clearest brain he had ever known in man or woman strength of head was quite as marked in her as goodness of heart and she had at least as much of adroitness as of simplicity her character was in fact curiously many-sided 
a remarkable variety of interests motives methods will be found coming into play in the course of this record the florence nightingale who will be shown in it by her acts her methods her sayings her ways of looking at things and people is a very different person from santa philomena miss nightingale has been given a place among the saints in the popular calendar of many nations and she deserves the canonization but not entirely for the popular reasons her character as i have endeavoured to depict it was stronger more spacious and as i have felt more lovable than the lady of the lamp End of section one introduction Part One, Chapter One of The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One, by Edward Tyus Cook. Part One, Aspiration, eighteen twenty to eighteen fifty four. I go to prove my soul. I see my way as birds their trackless way. I shall arrive. What time, what circuit first, I ask not. But unless God send his hail, or blinding fireballs, sleet or stifling snow, in some time, his good time, I shall arrive. He guides me and the bird. In his good time. Browning, Paracelsus Chapter One, Childhood and Education, eighteen twenty to eighteen thirty nine, Part One. One. I found her in her chamber reading, Phaedon Platonus in Greek, and that with as much pleasure as some gentleman would read a merry tale in Boccace. Roger Ascham. To the tender sentiment and popular adoration that gathered around the subject of this memoir something perhaps was added by the beauty of a name which linked together the city of the flowers and the music of the birds her surname suggested to longfellow the title of the poem which has carried home to the hearts of thousands in two continents the lesson of her life the popularity of florence in the middle ages a masculine name as a christian name for english girls is noted by the historian of that subject as due to association with the heroine of the crimea both of her names were the result of circumstance. Her father came from the old Derbyshire family of Shore of Tapton, and changed his name in 1815 from William Edward Shore to William Edward Nightingale on succeeding to the property of his mother's uncle, Peter Nightingale of Lee, in the same county. Mr. William Nightingale was fond of travel, and the close of the French War, shortly before his marriage, 1818, had thrown the continent open to the Grand Tour. Mr. and Mrs. Nightingale's only children, two daughters, were born during a sojourn in Italy. The elder was born at Naples in 1819, and was named, firstly, Frances, after her mother, and secondly, after the old Greek settlement on the site of her birthplace, Parthenope. She afterwards became the second wife of Sir Harry Verney. The younger daughter, the subject of this memoir, was also named after her birthplace. She was born at Florence on May 12, 1820, in the Villa Columbiaia, near the Porta Romana, as a memorial tablet now affixed to the house records. And there, on the 4th of July, she was baptized by Dr. Trevor, prebendary of Chester. The place names became, in familiar intercourse, Partha, or Pop, and Flo. The surprises of sainthood, said a speaker at a congress on eugenics, are no less remarkable than those of genius. St. Francis of Assisi, St. Catherine of Siena and Florence Nightingale could no more have been predicted from their ancestry than Napoleon, Beethoven, Michelangelo, or Shakespeare. But the peculiarities of tissue on which some physical characteristics are held to depend can, at any rate, be inherited. Florence Nightingale's mother was one of the eleven children of William Smith of Parndon Hall, Essex, of whom Sir James Stephen said, when he had nearly completed fourscore years, he could still gratefully acknowledge that he had no remembrance of any bodily pain or illness, and that of the very numerous family of which he was the head, every member still lived to support and gladden his old age. 
This statement is not absolutely correct, for one child did not long survive its birth, but of the other sons and daughters of William Smith, none died at an earlier age than sixty-nine, two lived to be more than seventy-five, six to be more than eighty, and one to be more than ninety. This last was Frances, Mrs. Nightingale, who lived to be ninety-two. On the father's side there was longevity also. Mr. Nightingale himself lived to be eighty. His mother lived to be ninety-five. He had an aunt who lived to be ninety, and your uncle, wrote his father, young at eighty-two, enters into politics of the present moment with the ardor of twenty-two. Of the children of Mr. and Mrs. William Nightingale, Parthenope lived to be seventy-five, and Florence, though, or, in part, perhaps because, she lived for fifty-three years the life of an invalid, attained the age of ninety. Florence Nightingale, whether saint or not, was certainly conscious of a call, but there was nothing in her descent or inheritance which encouraged her parents to allow it to become readily effectual. Because she was a woman, her early life was one long struggle for liberation from circumstance and social prepossessions. Yet there were features in her mental equipment and intellectual outlook which may well have been inherited and which certainly owed much to environment. Sir James Stephen adds to the remarks quoted above that if William Smith had gone mourning all his days, he could scarcely have acquired a more tender pity for the miserable or have labored more habitually for their relief. In politics he was a follower of Fox. He was a friend of Wilberforce, with whom he cooperated in the House of Commons in the abolitionist and other humanitarian movements. Of Wilberforce, as of Thomas Clarkson, he possessed the almost brotherly love and of all their fellow laborers there was none who was more devoted to their cause, or whom they more entirely trusted. In religion a Unitarian, he was a stout defender of liberty of thought and conscience, a persistent opponent of religious tests and disabilities. The liberal opinions, alike in church and state, which were thus traditional in the family of Florence Nightingale's mother, were shared by that of her father. Her grandfather Shore, in a letter to his son in 1818, referred to one of the finest pieces of eloquence, either in ancient or modern times, given by Sir Samuel Romilly in the Court of Chancery on a motion respecting the right of Jews to the benefit of a charity in Bedford. It does honor to the man and to human nature. Florence Nightingale's father was also a Unitarian, and in politics he was a Whig. How I hate Tories, he wrote to his wife, and in another letter after the election of 1835, in which the hated ones had gained ground, he explained that they were mighty only by beer, brandy, and money. The Whigs, as is well known, were not at all lacking in the latter equipment for political success, and Mr. Nightingale was a frequent subscriber to electoral funds on the Whig side. He was an ardent supporter of parliamentary reform. He held that Bentham has taught great moral truth more effectually than all the Christian divines. At a later time he was a follower of Lord Palmerston, of whom he was also a neighbor in the country. One of the earliest notices which I find of Florence Nightingale's interest in politics is in a letter from her father describing a meeting at Romsey to which he had taken her. Florence, he says, approved very much Palmerston's exposition of his foreign policy. Something else Florence Nightingale owed to, or shared with, her father. He, like some other members of his family, was of a reflective temperament, interested in speculative problems. There is a letter written by him to his wife from his father's sick room, September 1822, which shows the bent of his thoughts. I sit by his bedside and look at him as one would at a sleeping man, the idea of death only now and then flashing across my mind. I have been studying Madame de Stael on the feeling of conviction, which exists more or less in different people and different nations, on the subject of soul as independent of external ideas. My imagination is a dull one, for certainly it required study with me to feel the full force of conviction that soul does and must exist quite separately from, though influenced by, external circumstances. You will say, I know, with a firm belief in scripture and religion, leave all philosophical speculation to the wild imaginations of the Germans. Nothing can change your reliance on religion. The perversity of my nature refers me to experience and analogies, 
though I begin to think that the study of the creation displayed before our faculties will exalt me into a conception of divinity completely pervading the whole, but particularly that part of man which enables him to feel the difference between right and wrong independently of the ideas which he derives from external circumstances. Florence Nightingale's mother accepted the religious standpoint of the day without question. Unitarianism was dropped by her and by her elder daughter. By Florence it was, as we shall hear, transcended. The mother's essential bent was practical, though the scope of it was somewhat limited. The mind of her daughter Florence found room in equal measure for practice and for contemplation. She inherited her mother's organizing capacity, though she turned it to directions of her own. It was from her father that she inherited the taste for speculative inquiry, which absorbed a large part of her life. 2. From the worldly circumstances of her parents, Florence came to draw conclusions little sympathetic, in some respects, with existing usages and conventions. She accepted, indeed, the position of worldly wealth into which she was born without any fundamental questioning. In later years a young friend, on being urged to visit the villagers around one of Mrs. Nightingale's country homes, explained that she did not like the relation. She could not bring herself to go from a big comfortable house to instruct poor people on how to live. Miss Nightingale laughed and said, You surely don't call Lee Hurst a big house. It had only about fifteen bedrooms. She took for granted the position into which she was born, but she thought that wealth should only be used as a means of work. The easy, comfortable, not very strenuous conditions of her home life as a girl fixed the nature of her early years, but her soul did not become rooted in them. They sowed seeds which grew, as the years passed, not into acquiescence, but into revolt. Mr. Nightingale had inherited his great-uncle's property when nine years old. It accumulated for him, and a lead mine added greatly to its value. By the time of his marriage he was blessed, or as his younger daughter came to think, afflicted, by the possession of a considerable fortune. Whether it were indeed a blessing or an affliction, it involved him in much uncertainty of mind. He and his wife returned from the continent with their infant daughters in 1821, and the question became urgent, where to live? The landed property which he had inherited from his great uncle was a comparatively small estate at and around Lee Hill in Derbyshire. To this property he added largely. The hall, the old residence of his great uncle, was discarded, it is now used as a farmhouse, and Mr. Nightingale built a new house called Lee Hurst. The charm of its situation and prospect is described in a letter by Mrs. Gaskell. High as Lee Hurst is, one seems on a pinnacle with the clouds careening round one. Down below is a garden with stone terraces and flights of steps, the plains of these terraces being perfectly gorgeous with masses of hollyhocks, dahlias, nasturtiums, geraniums, etc. Then a sloping meadow losing itself into a steep wooded descent, such tints over the wood, to the river Derwent, the rocks on the other side of which form the first distance and are of a red color streaked with misty purple. Beyond this, interlacing hills forming three ranges of distance, the first, deep brown with decaying heather, the next, in some purple shadow, and the last, catching some pale, watery sunlight. I am left alone, continued Mrs. Gaskell, established high up, in two rooms, opening one out of the other, the old nurseries. The inner one, in which Mrs. Gaskell slept, was, when Parthenope grew up, her bedroom. It is curious how simple it is. The old carpet doesn't cover the floor, no easy chair, no sofa, a little curtainless bed, a small glass. In the outer room, the former day nursery, Miss Florence's room, when she is at home, everything is equally simple. Now, of course, the bed is reconverted into a sofa, two small tables, a few bookshelves, a drab carpet only partially covering the clean boards, and stone-colored walls, as cold in coloring as need be, but with one low window on one side trellised over with Virginian creeper as gorgeous as can be, and the opposite one, by which I am writing, looking over such a country. The sound of the Derwent was often in Florence's ears. When she was in the hospital at Scutari, any fretting in the straits recalled it to her. How I like, she said on a stormy night, to hear that ceaseless roar. It puts me in mind of the dear Derwent. 
How often I have listened to it from the nursery window. Lee Hurst became one of Florence Nightingale's earliest homes in England, but it was not the earliest of all. The house was not built when the family returned from the continent, and Mr. Nightingale took Kinsham Court at Pristine in Herefordshire. The place, it seems, was more picturesque than habitable, and negotiations for the purchase of it, with a view to improvements, fell through. Mr. Nightingale liked Derbyshire and was fond of his new house, but the rich, as well as the poor, have their perplexities. The difficulty is, wrote Mr. Nightingale to his wife, where is the country that is habitable for twelve successive months? And, again, how would you like Leicester? For my part, I think that, provided I could get about two thousand acres, and a house in some neighboring county where sporting and scenery were in tolerable abundance, and the visit to Lee Hurst were annually confined to July, August, September, and October, then all would be well. While Mrs. Nightingale stayed at Kinsham, or took the children for a change of air to the seaside, or Tunbridge Wells, Mr. Nightingale divided his time between the management of his property in Derbyshire and the search for a second home elsewhere. Ultimately, he found what he wanted at Embley Park in the parish of Wellow, near Romsey. This estate was bought in 1825, and Kinsham was given up. Embley is on the edge of the new forest, and the rich growth of its woods and gardens is much favored by sun and moisture. Old oaks and beeches, thickets of flowering laurel and rhododendron, and a profusion of flowers and scents contrast with the bare, breezy hills of Derbyshire. Its new owners had here the variety they wished for, and a full scope for their taste. The most praised of its beauties is a long road almost shut in by masses of rhododendron. One of the occasional pleasures of Miss Nightingale's later life in London was a drive in the park, in rhododendron time, to remind her of Embley. 3. From her fifth year onwards, Florence Nightingale had, then, for her homes, Lee Hurst in the summer months, and Embley during the rest of the year. The family usually spent a portion of the season in London. The sisters led, it will be thus seen, a life mainly in the country, and Florence as a child became fond of flowers, birds, and beasts. A neatly printed manuscript book is preserved in which she made a catalogue of her collection of flowers, describing each with analytical accuracy and noting the particular spot at which it was picked. Her childish letters contain many references to animal companions. She made particular friends with the nuthatch. She had a pet pig, a pet donkey, a pet pony. She was fond of riding and fond of dogs. A small pet animal, she said many years afterwards, is often an excellent companion for the sick, for long chronic cases especially. The more I see of men, wrote a cynic, the more I love dogs. Florence Nightingale, in the same piece from which I have just quoted, drew a like moral from her experience of some nurses. An invalid, she said, in giving an account of his nursing by a nurse and a dog, infinitely preferred that of the dog. Above all, he said, it did not talk. There were no babies in the Nightingale family after the arrival of Florence herself, but most of her mother's many brothers and sisters married and had families, and as Mr. and Mrs. Nightingale's houses were often visited by these relations, there was seldom wanting a succession of babies, and in them, and their christenings, and teethings, and illnesses, and lessons, Florence took that interest which is often strong in little girls. Sometimes a baby died, and her letters showed that Florence was as much interested in a death as in a birth. She rejoiced in The Little Angels in Heaven. One of her favorite poems at this period was The Better Land, of Mrs. Hemans, which she copied out for a cousin as so very beautiful. The earliest letter which I have seen, written when she was ten, strikes mingled notes. She is staying with Uncle Octavius Smith at Thames Bank, a house which then adjoined his distillery at Millbank, and writes to her sister, who is on a visit with the maid to another set of cousins. Give my love to Clemence, and tell her, if you please, that I am not in the room where she established me, but in a very small one, instead of the beautiful view of the Thames, a most dismal one of the black distillery, and whenever I open my window, the nasty smell rushes in like a torrent. But I like it pretty well notwithstanding. There is a hole through the wall close to my door, which communicates with the bathroom, which is the next room where Freddy sleeps, and he talks to me by there. 
Tell her also, if you please, that I have washed myself all over and feet in warm water since I came every night. I went up to the distillery to the very tip-top by ladders with Uncle Ock and Fred Saturday night. We walked along a great pipe. We have had a good deal of boating, which I like very much. We see three steamboats pass by every day, the Diana, the Fly, and the Endeavor. My love to all of them except Miss W. Give my love particularly to Hillary. Your effect and only sister. Dear Pop, I think of you. Let us love one another more than we have done. Mama wishes it particularly. It is the will of God, and it will comfort us in our trials through life. Goodbye. Was Miss W. an unsympathetic governess? Whoever she was, the exception in her disfavor shows an unregenerate impulse which contrasts naively with the following good resolve towards her sister. To a year earlier belongs a little notebook entitled Journey of Flow, Embley. It begins with the reminder, The Lord is with thee wherever thou art, and then an entry records, Sunday, I obliged to sit still by Miss Christie till I had the spirit of obedience. As a child, and throughout all the earlier part of her life, Florence was much given to dreaming, and in some introspective speculations written in 1851, she recalled the pleasures of naughtiness. When I was a child and was naughty, it always put an end to my dreaming for the time. I never could tell why. Was it because naughtiness was a more interesting state than the little motives which make man's peaceful, civilized state an occupied imagination for the time? To Miss Christie, her first governess, Florence became greatly attached, and the death of the lady a few years later threw her into deep grief. She was a sensitive and somewhat morbid child, and though she presently developed a lively sense of humor, to which she had the capacity of giving trenchant expression, it was the humor of intellect rather than the outcome of a joyous disposition. Her early letters contain little note of childish fun. They are for the most part grave and introspective. She was self-absorbed and had the shyness which attends upon that habit. My greatest ambition, she wrote in some private reminiscences of her early life, was not to be remarked. I was always in mortal fear of doing something unlike other people, and I said, if I were sure that nobody would remark me, I should be quite happy. I had a morbid terror of not using my knives and forks like other people when I should come out. I was afraid of speaking to children because I was sure I should not please them. Meanwhile, she was perhaps at times, even as a child, a little difficult at home. Ask Flo, wrote her father to his wife in 1832, if she has lost her intellect. If not, why does she grumble at troubles which she cannot remedy by grumbling? End of chapter 1, part 1part one chapter one continued of the life of florence nightingale volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by marianne the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyes cook part one chapter one childhood and education continued four the appeal to his daughter's intellect was characteristic of Mr. Nightingale. He was himself a well-informed man, educated at Edinburgh and Trinity, Cambridge, and, like some others of the Unitarian circle, he held views much in advance of the average opinion of his time about the intellectual education of women. The home education of his daughters was largely supervised by himself. It included a range of subjects far outside the curriculum current in young ladies' seminaries, and perhaps, like Hannah More's father, he was sometimes frightened at his own success. Letters and notebooks show, it is true, that his daughters were duly instructed in the accomplishments deemed appropriate to young ladies. We hear of them learning to use the globes, writing books of elegant extracts, working footstools, and doing fancy work. They studied music, grammar, composition, modern languages. We used to read Tasso and Aristo, and Alfieri with my father, Florence said. He was a good and always interested Italian scholar, never pedantic, never tiresome grammarian, but he spoke Italian like an Italian, and I took care of the verbs. Mr. Nightingale added constitutional history, Latin, Greek, and mathematics. 
By the time Florence was sixteen, he was reading Homer with his daughters. Miss Nightingale used to say that at Greek her sister was the quicker scholar. Their father set them appointed tasks to prepare. Parthenope would trust largely to improvisation or lucky shots. Florence was more laborious, and sometimes would get up at four in the morning to prepare the lesson. Her knowledge of Latin was of some practical use in later years. In conversations with abbots and monks whom she met during her travels, she sometimes found in Latin their only common tongue. Among Florence's papers were preserved many sheets in her father's handwriting, containing the heads of admirable outlines of the political history of England and of some foreign states. Her own notebooks show that in her teens she had mastered the elements of Latin and Greek. She analyzed Tusculan disputations. She translated portions of the Phaedo, the Crito, and the Apology. She had studied Roman, Greek, Italian, and Turkish history. She had analyzed Dugald Stewart's Philosophy of the Human Mind. Her father was in the habit, too, of suggesting themes on which his daughters were to write compositions. It was the system of the college essay. Florence has now taken to mathematics, wrote her sister in 1840, and, like everything she undertakes, she is deep in them and working very hard. The direction in which Florence Nightingale was to exercise the faculties thus trained was as yet hidden in the future. But to her father's guidance she was indebted for the mental grasp and power of intellectual concentration which were to distinguish her work in life. It is a natural temptation of biographers to give formal unity to their subject by representing the child as in all things the father of the man. To date, the vocation of their hero or heroine very early in life, to magnify some childish incident as prophetic of what is to come thereafter. Material is available for such treatment in the case of Florence Nightingale. It has been recorded that she used to nurse and bandage the dolls which her elder sister damaged. Every book about the heroine of the Crimea contains, too, a tale of first aid to the wounded, which Florence administered to Cap, the shepherd's collie, whom she found with a broken leg on the downs near Emberley. I wonder, wrote her old pastor to her in 1858, whether you remember how, twenty-two years ago, you and I together averted the intended hanging of poor old Shepherd Smithers' dog, Cap. How many times I have told this story since. I well recount the pleasure which the saving of the life of a poor dog then gave to your young mind. I was delighted to witness it. It was, to me, not indeed an omen of what you were about to do and be, for of that I never dreamed, but it was an index of that kind and benevolent disposition, of that First Corinthians chapter 13 charity, which has been at the root of it. And it is certainly interesting and curious, if nothing more, that the very earliest piece in the handwriting of Florence Nightingale, which has been preserved, should be a medical prescription. It is contained in a tiny book, about the size of a postage stamp, which the little girl stitched together, and in which the instruction is written, in very childish letters, sixteen grains for an old woman, eleven for a young woman, and seven for a child. But these things are, after all, but trifles. Florence Nightingale is not the only girl who has been fond of nursing sick dolls or mending them when broken. Other children have tended wounded animals and had their pill boxes and simples. Much, too, has been written about Florence's kindness as a child to her poor neighbors. Her mother, both at Lee Hurst and Embley, sometimes occupied herself in good works. She and her husband were particularly interested in a cheap school which they supported at their Derbyshire home. Large sums of money have been paid, wrote Mr. Nightingale to his wife in 1832, to your schoolmistress for many praiseworthy purposes, who works con amore in looking after the whole population, young and old. Florence took her place beside her mother in visiting poor neighbors, in arranging school treats, in giving village entertainments. But thousands of other squires' daughters, before and after her, have done the like. And Florence herself, as many entries in her diary show, was not conscious of doing much, but reproachful of herself for doing little. The constant burden of her self-examination, both at this time and for many years to come, was that she was forever dreaming and never doing. She was dreaming because for a long time she did not clearly feel or see what her work in life was to be, and then for yet another period of time because, when she knew what she was called to do, she could not compass the means to do it. Her faculties were not brought outwards, but were left, by the conditions of her life, 
to devour themselves inwardly. The discovery of her true vocation belongs, then, to a later period of our story, and it was not the result of childish fancy or the accomplishment of early incident, it was the fruit of long and earnest study. What did come to Florence Nightingale early in life, perhaps, as one entry in her autobiographical notes suggests, as early as her sixth year, was the sense of a call, of some appointed mission in life, or self-dedication to the service of God. I remember her, wrote Fanny Allen in 1857 to her niece, Elizabeth Wedgwood, as a little girl of three or four, then the girl of sixteen of high promise. When I look back on every time I saw her after her sixteenth year, I see that she was ripening constantly for her work, and that her mind was dwelling on the painful differences of man and man in this life, and on the traps that a luxurious life laid for the affluent. A conversation on this subject between the father and daughter made me laugh at the time. The contrast was so striking. But now, as I remember it, it was the divine spirit breathing in her. In an autobiographical fragment written in 1867, Florence mentions as one of the crises of her inner life that God called her to his service on February 7, 1837, at Embley, and there are later notes which still fix that day as the dawn of her true life. But as yet she knew not whither the Spirit was to lead. For three months, indeed, as she notes in another passage of retrospect, she worked very hard among the poor people under a strong feeling of religion. 5. Presently, however, a new direction was given to her thoughts and interests. She was now seventeen, her sister eighteen. Their home education had been far advanced, and might seem to require only such finishing as masters and society in France and Italy could supply. Mr. Nightingale had, moreover, decided to carry out extensive alterations to Embley. With his wife and daughters, he crossed from Southampton to Arve on September 8, 1837, and they did not return to England until April 6, 1839. Those were days of leisurely travel, such as Ruskin describes, in which distance could not be vanquished without toil, but in which that toil was rewarded, partly by the power of deliberate survey of the countries through which the journey lay, and partly by the happiness of the evening hours, when from the top of the last hill he had surmounted, the traveller beheld the quiet village where he was to rest, scattered among the meadows beside its valley stream, or, from the long-hoped-for turn in the dusty perspective of the causeway, saw, for the first time, the towers of some famed city, faint as the rays of sunset, hours of peaceful and thoughtful pleasure, for which the rush of the arrival in the railway station is, perhaps not always, or to all men, an equivalent. There were many such hours during the journeys which the Nightingales took with a Berturino through France and Italy, and Florence, writing at a later date, when all her life was fixed on doing, noted that on this tour there was too much time for dreaming. Yet it is clear from her diaries that she entered heartily and with a wider range of interest than some English travelers show, into the life of foreign society and sightseeing. A love of statistical method which became one of her most marked characteristics may already be seen in an itinerary which she compiled, noting in its several columns the number of leagues from place to place, with the day and hour both of arrival and of departure. They went leisurely through France, visiting, besides many other places, Chartres, Blois, Tours, Nantes, Bordeaux, Biarritz, Carcassonne, Nîmes, Avignon, and Toulon, and then going by the Riviera to Nice. There they stayed for nearly a month, December 1837 to January 1838. A month was next spent at Genoa, and two months were given to Florence. The late spring and summer were devoted to travel in the cities of northern Italy, among the lakes, and in Switzerland. They spent the month of September in Geneva, and reached Paris on October 8, 1838. Miss Nightingale preserved her diary of the greater part of the tour, and it shows her keenly interested alike in scenery and in works of art. It contains also what records of sentimental pilgrimages often lack, an admixture of notes and statistics upon the laws, the land systems, the social conditions, and benevolent institutions of the several states or cantons. Her interest in the politics of the day was keen wherever she went, and the society of many refugees into which she was thrown at Geneva gave her a particularly ardent sympathy with the cause of Italian freedom. 
The diary contains many biographical notes upon Italian patriots, whose adventures she heard related by their own lips. A stirring day, she wrote on September 12, 1838, the most stirring which we have ever lived. It was the day on which news reached Geneva that the Emperor of Austria had declared an amnesty in Italy. The Nightingales attended an evening party at which the Italian refugees assembled, and the imperial decree was read out amidst loud jubilation, which, however, was afterwards abated when it turned out that the general amnesty contained many conditions and some exceptions. The Nightingales had the entree to all the learned society of Geneva. Florence records an evening spent with Monsieur de Candolle, the famous botanist, and the diary gives many glimpses of Sismondi, the historian, who was then living in his native city. He escorted the Nightingale party up the Salève. They made that not very formidable ascent first on donkeys and then in a sledge covered with straw and drawn by four oxen. Florence was present on another occasion when all the company gathered round Sismondi, who, sitting on a table, gave us a lecture on Florentine history. The conscientious Florence made a full note in her diary of the great man's discourse. All Sismondi's political economy, she also noted, seemed to be founded on the overflowing kindness of his heart. He gives to old beggars on principle, to young from habit. At Pescia he had three hundred beggars at his door on one morning. He feeds the mice in his room while he is writing his histories. Presently there was a new excitement in Geneva. What a stirring time we live in, Florence wrote on September 18th. One day to decide the fate of the Italians, tomorrow to decide the fate of Switzerland. Tomorrow was the day fixed for the meeting of the Council Representatif, which was to take into consideration the demand of Louis-Philippe for the expulsion of Louis-Napoleon, the future emperor. Many pages of Miss Nightingale's diary are given up to this affair. She analyzed all the pros and cons, and recorded day by day the course of the debate. Sismondi thought that the refugee ought to be surrendered, on principle because he was a pretender, in expediency because Geneva would be unable to withstand a French assault. He spoke for an hour in this sense. The Genevois radicals, on the other hand, while entertaining no great love for the pretender, thought that, cost what it might, the sacred right of asylum should be maintained. And so the debate continued. The French government began to move troops from Lyon, the Genevois, to throw up fortifications. Whereupon Mr. Nightingale, like many other English visitors, thought it time to take his family across the frontier. Miss Nightingale's diary written en route to Paris shows her excitement to obtain news of the crisis. When she learnt that it had been solved by Louis Napoleon being given a passport for England, she did not see that Louis Philippe had gained very much. The pretender would be nearer, and not less dangerous, in London than in Geneva, a very just prediction. Not every girl of eighteen, when taking her first tour abroad, shows so lively an interest in political affairs. Politics and social observations mingle in the diary with artistic and architectural notes. The city which seems to have most appealed to her imagination was not Florence, though she said that she would not have missed it for anything, and, curiously, her sojourn in her birthplace was the occasion of a characteristic incident. An English lady, who afterwards became Princess Ruth Kostritz, was staying in the same lodgings and fell ill, and Florence Nightingale volunteered to nurse her. But the city which she most admired was Genoa la Superba. She notes, indeed, the excessive indolence of the nobles and excessive poverty of the people, but the palaces realized an Arabian Nights story for her. Mr. and Mrs. Nightingale had many friends, and brought many introductions. In the various towns where they stayed they mixed in the best society, and their daughters were thrown into a lively round of picnics, concerts, soirees, dancing. Balls and masks began at midnight, burning ever to midday, when they made up fresh adventures for the morrow. There were court balls at which grand dukes were exceedingly polite to Florence Nightingale and her sister. They went to an evening court at Florence and found everyone most courteous and agreeable. There was a ball at the casino in Genoa, at which, writes Florence in her diary, my partner and I made an embrulement, and a military officer came up with a very angry face to challenge me for having refused him and then not dancing. But the music was not all to the tune of a toccata of Galuppi's. What gave Florence the greatest pleasure on this tour was the Italian opera. 
In those days, the reigning singers were Grisi, La Blanche, Rubini, and Tamburini. Florence Nightingale heard them all. Her Italian diary is nowhere so elaborate as in descriptions of the operas and in notes on the performers. She kept a separate book in which she wrote tabulated details of all the performances. I should like to go every night, she said in her diary, and for some time after her return from the continent she was, as she wrote to Miss Clark, music mad. She took music lessons at Florence and in London studied under German and Italian masters. She played and sang. It was as yet uncertain whether the call, to what as yet also unknown, might not be drowned in the tastes, interests, and pursuits which fill the life of other young ladies in her position. 6. The fascination of social life must have been brought vividly before her during the winter, 1838-39, to which they spent in Paris, in apartments in the Place Vendôme, number 22. She was now introduced into the brilliant circle of the last of the salons. Mary Clark, afterwards Madame Mole, was by descent half Irish, half Scottish, by education and residence almost wholly French. A charming mixture, said Ampère of her, of French vivacity and English originality. Full at once of esprit and of espiegalerie, well-read and artistic, yet wholly devoid of pedantry, without regular beauty of feature, but alert and piquant, Mary Clark had gathered round her what Tickner, in 1837, had found the most intellectual circle in Paris. For seven years, she and her mother lived in apartments in the Abbe à Bue, adjoining those of Madame Reclamier, and Mary was a daily visitor to the famous Salon, during the reign of Chateaubriand, whose closing years she did much to brighten and amuse. At the time when the Nightingales arrived in Paris, Mrs. and Miss Clark had left the Abbé Abel and established themselves in those apartments in the Rue de Bach, which for nearly forty years were a haunt of all that was brilliant in the intellectual life of Paris. Mary Clark took most affectionately to the Nightingale family, who, with some of their connections, remained for long years among her closest friends. She used to pay a yearly visit to Mr. and Mrs. Nightingale, either at Embley or at Lee Hurst, generally staying three weeks or a month, and to her many of Florence's most interesting letters were, as we shall find, addressed. To her other and more superficial qualities, Mary Clark added great warmth of lasting affection for her intimate friends, and her sympathetic kindness to the Nightingale Circle was unfailing. The attraction of Paris to Florence lay principally in its hospitals and nursing sisterhoods, but partly also in that it was the home of Clarkie, as they called her and it was the same with other members of the family. There is a letter from Lady Verney to Clarke which describes how some one asked Mr. Nightingale, Are you going to Paris? Oh, no, he replied. Madame Mole is ill. Then does Paris mean Madame Mole? Yes, certainly, he replied gravely. During the winter of 1838-39, to Miss Clark, writes Lady Verney, was exceedingly kind to Florence and me, two young girls full of all kinds of interests, which she took the greatest pains to help. She made us acquainted with all her friends, many and notable, among them Madame Recamier. I now know, better than then, what her influence must have been thus to introduce an English family, two of them girls who, if French, would not have appeared in society, into that jealously guarded sanctuary, the most exclusive aristocratic and literary salon in Paris. We were asked, even, to the reading by Chateaubriand, at the Abbe Abou of his Memoirs de Autretum, which he could not wait to put forth, as he had intended when writing them until after his death, desiring, it was said, to discount the praises which he expected but hardly received. This hearing was a favor eagerly sought for by the cream of the cream of Paris society at that time. In Miss Clark's own apartments, the Nightingales met many distinguished men. The intimates who were always there, and who assisted their hostess in making the tea, were Messieurs Ferriel and Mole. Claude Ferriel, versed in medieval and provincial lore, a man exceedingly handsome, who had captivated Madame de Stael and other ladies besides Mary Clark in his friendships, and Julius Mole, one of the first Orientalists in Europe, a more ardent lover whom, after a probation of eighteen years, Miss Clark married in 1847. Monsieur Mole was once asked by Queen Victoria why, loving Germany so much, he had given up his native country for France. Ma foi, madame, he replied. 
j'ai ta amoureux. With M. Moll, no less than with his wife, Florence Nightingale was on terms of affectionate friendship. Among the frequent visitors whom she and her sister met at Miss Clark's were Madame Tastou, the poetess, Elie de Beaumont, the geologist, Roulin, the traveller naturalist, Cousin, Minier, Guzot, Tocqueville, Barthélemy, Saint-Hilaire, and Thiers. The last named was one of Miss Clark's earliest admirers, and many years later, after the Franco-German War, when Thiers was at the head of affairs, Lady Verney heard M. Mole say to his wife, Madame, why did you not marry M. Thiers instead of me, for now you would have been Queen of France? In such circles as that which gathered around Miss Clark, Florence Nightingale was well qualified to hold her own, and even to play a brilliant part. Her life of gaiety on the Riviera, and in Italy, must have rubbed away much of the shyness from which she had suffered. If not beautiful, she was elegant and distinguished. She was both widely and deeply read. She had many and varied interests. She had powers of expression in which clearness was not unmixed with a note of humorous subacidity. These are social advantages, and she was not without the inclination to use them. She chose in the end another path, a path which was beset by many obstacles of circumstance. But there were obstacles in herself also, and one of the last temptations to be overcome before she was free to interpret her call and act upon it was, as she wrote in many a page of confession and self-examination, the desire to shine in society. End of chapter 1《ハートワン》Chapter Two of the Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One, by Edward Tyus Cook. Part One, Chapter Two, Home Life. 1839 through 1845. Quote, Her passionate ideal nature demanded an epic life. What were many colored romances of chivalry and the social conquests of a brilliant girl to her? Her flame quickly burned up that light fuel and fed from within, soared after some illimitable satisfaction, some object which would never justify weariness, which would reconcile self-despair with the rapturous consciousness of life beyond self. George Eliot, Middlemarch The home life to which Florence Nightingale returned in April 1839 was rich in possibilities of social pleasure and might have seemed to promise every happiness she was well fitted by nature and by education to be an ornament of any country house to shine in any cultivated society become the wife as many of her best friends hoped and believed of some good and clever man but florence as she passed from childhood to womanhood came to form other plans her life as she ultimately shaped it her example, which circumstances were destined to render far shining, have been potent factors in opening new avenues for women in the modern world. Thousands of women in these days are, in consequence of Florence Nightingale's career, born free. But it was at a great price, and after long and weary struggles, that she herself attained such freedom. During the years with which, in this part, we shall be concerned, she lived in some sort the life of a caged bird. The cage, however, was pleasantly gilded. Florence was not always insensible of the gilding. There were times when she was tempted to chafe no longer at its bars, and to accept a restricted life within the conventional lines. I do not propose to detail, as might be done from her letters, diaries, and other materials, the precise succession of her goings and comings, her visits, and her home pursuits. She herself gives an excellent reason in one of her diaries. Our movements are so regular, she said. One year was very like another. The setting of Florence Nightingale's life during this period was such as many women have enjoyed, and many others have envied. The lines of the Nightingale family were laid in pleasant places. Their summer months were spent, as in preceding years, at Leah Hurst. 
a portion of the season was spent in london and the rest of the year at embley on their return from the continent in eighteen thirty nine the nightingales spent some weeks in london when the two girls were presented at court and a letter to miss clark shows florence absorbed in music but not so completely as to conquer a lively interest in the politics of the bedchamber plot. Quote, Carlton Hotel, Regent Street, June 1, 1839. We are enjoying ourselves much, for the Nicholsons, our cousins, came up to town the day after we did, and are living in the same hotel with us in Regent Street, the best situation in London, I think, but some people call it too noisy as marianne nicholson is as music mad as i am we are reveling in music all day long schultz who is a splendid player and crivelli her singing master give us lessons and the unfortunate piano has been strummed out of tune in a week not having even its natural rest at nights as there are other masters as well we went to pauline garcia's debut at the opera in othello she was exceedingly nervous and trembled all over but her great improvement towards the end promised well her lower notes are very fine indeed and two shakes she made low down though too much like instrumental to be agreeable were very extraordinary her voice however is excessively unequal and sometimes her singing is quite commonplace she makes too much of her execution which is very uneven it is very easy to say that she will be another malibran but if they were side by side the difference would be seen so say wiser judges than we even grissy is quite superior to her in desdemona although p garcia's voice is the most powerful but then p garcia was excessively frightened we have heard her sing a duet with persiani in which both were perfect and i heard dollar for the first time at the same concert i was nowise disappointed although i had heard so much of him at paris his execution is extraordinary but i think one would soon grow tired of it for both his music and his style are very inferior to thalberg's have you heard batta on the violoncello at paris his playing approaches more nearly to the human voice than anything i ever heard we are going to hear charming persiani tonight in the lucia de lammermoor tamburini the most good-natured of mortals has volunteered to come and sing two or three hours with my cousin marianne every season whenever she thinks herself sufficiently advanced we are going to hear him at a private concert on monday now there has been enough and too much of musical news but political news is scarce london was in a perfect whirlwind of excitement for the few days that the melbourne ministry was out but that is stale already our little queen who was sadly unpopular when we first came to england recovered much of her former favour with the whig party after the firmness she showed in this affair she was cheered and called forward at the opera which has not been done for months and again returning from chapel and the birthday drawing-room was overflowing whereas at the first two she gave this season there were hardly forty people the story of this last fracas is that on tuesday the day of lord melbourne's resignation the queen dined upstairs with her mother baroness lazen and lady f hastings which she had never done since her accession and it is supposed that the amende honorable was then made to lady flora and that in this partie carré was also arranged the course which was to be pursued with sir robert peel the poor little queen was seen in tears by several people who told us in the course of the three days and struggled for her ladies as you see manfully however matters may turn out now it is said that she has taken so tremendous a dislike to sir r peel in this affair that she will never send for him again since that the house has been adjourned for a fortnight and only met last monday when the speaker was elected abercrombie going up to the house of peers we are rejoicing in the election of charles lefevre by a majority of eighteen rather less than was expected however spring rice arriving half an hour too late to vote which has made rather a commotion charles lefevre is a great friend of ours and a very agreeable man which is his chief qualification for the chair 
Macaulay is not likely to come into the ministry. Lord Melbourne says that it is impossible to get on with a man who talks so fast. So he is now writing history and saying that it is the only thing worth doing, except, however, standing for Edinburgh in Abercrombie's room against Crawford. Macaulay has made an admirable speech in favor of ballot there. The Queen is vibrating between popularity and unpopularity, and it is not yet known which way the scale will turn between the two parties. She was very much applauded, and Lord Melbourne, too, at Ascot yesterday. He is likely to keep the upper hand, as the Tories have not such a man as Lord John Russell in all their party, and the nine obstreperous radicals have had a sop and give in their adhesion for the present. Papa is shocked to hear that Monsieur Grisat has declared himself so anti-English. We always talk of you and all that you did for us at Paris. I heard yesterday that Gonfalonieri was coming to London in a month. Is he at Paris now? I have just been reading the account of Monsieur Mignette's Elogie of Talleyrand. I hope you were there, for it must have been very interesting. But did not he make rather an extraordinary defense of Talleyrand's political tergiversation, and of his conduct while the Allies were at Paris? Extraordinary to our ideas of political integrity. We met Ubiquity Young and Mr. Babel yesterday at dinner at the East Struts, who told all sorts of droll stories about Lord Brougham, who seems to have fairly lost his wits. He had Lord Duncannon to dine with him the other day, which is new, he having formally stipulated when he went out to dinner that he should see none of his former colleagues. He sends his carriage to stand before Lord Denham's house for hours while he goes and walks in the park, or even while he is out of town, to give the idea that they are very intimate. End quote. In another letter to Miss Clark, September the 18th, some further gossip is given. Miss Nightingale was on her way back to London from Leah Hurst, and had broken the journey at Nottingham. Quote, the next day we went up to town by rail in six and a half hours, notwithstanding that the engine was twice out of order and stopped us. We had a very agreeable company on the road, a neighbor of ours and acuary to the Queen, who was full of her virtues and condescensions. How much pleasanter it is traveling by these public conveyances than in one's own stupid carriage. He said that Lord Melbourne called the Queen's favorite terrier a frightful little beast, and often contradicted her flat, all which she takes in good part, and lets him go to sleep after dinner, taking care that he shall not be waked. She reads all the newspapers and all the vilifying abuse which the Tories give her, and makes up her mind that a Queen must be abused, and hates them cordially. End quote. 2. The Nightingales had taken up their residence at Embley in September 1839, and remained there, in accordance with their want, till the early summer following. The charm of the place is vividly described in a letter from Florence's sister to her cousin, Miss Hilary Bonham Carter. Quote, My love, it is so beautiful in this world— so very beautiful, you really cannot fancy anything so near approaching to Eden or Fairyland, or Il Paradiso Terrestre, as depicted in the twenty-fifth canto, stanza forty-something, so very, very lovely that we cannot resist a very strong desire that you should come down and see it. My dear, I assure you we are worth seeing. I never, though blessed with many fair visions, both in my sleeping and my waking hours, conceived anything so exquisite as to-day lying among the flowers, such smells and such sounds hovering round me, Flo reading and talking so that my immortal profited too, and she comforted me when I said I must have much of the beast in me to be so very happy in the sunshine and the flowers, by suggesting that God gave us his blessings to enjoy them. So I am comforted, and set to work to enjoy with all my might, and succeed à merveille. Still, the garden is big. There are many clumps of rhododendrons and azaleas, and showers of rosebuds, and I cannot be all round them at once, so we want you to come and help, not so much for your pleasure as to relieve the weight of responsibility, you see. My love, I am writing perched on a chair on the grass, nightingales all round, blue sky above, 
such long shadows sleeping on the lawn and june smells about me will you not come the rhododendrons are early this year and will be much past in another ten days will you not come if you ask learned men they will tell you june at embley is a poetry ready made and the first thing i shall do when i get to heaven you'd better set about getting there miss pop directly you're a very long way off at these presents where i expect to have the gift of language is to celebrate the pomps and beauties of the garden in this wicked world than which i never wish for a better End quote. florence and her sister loved each other but their characters were widely different as we shall hear and their love at this time was not that of perfect sympathy but rather of wistful admiration on the one side and half pitying fondness on the other parthenope looked upon florence as upon some strange being in another world whose happiness she passionately longed to see and whose rejection of it she could but dimly understand florence on her side regarded her elder sister's contentment in the beauties of art and nature and in the world as she found it with the tender pity which one may feel for a happy child Quote, it would be an ill return for all her affection wrote florence to one of her aunts to drag down my white swan from her cool fresh blue sea of art into our baby chicken yard of struggling scratting life how cruel it would be as she is rocked to rest there on her dreamy waves for anybody to waken her End quote. the difference in temperament between the sisters comes out very clearly in their several descriptions of embley florence was sensible of its beauties but they came to her with thoughts of a better world beyond or with echoes from the still sad music of humanity in the world that now is quote, i should have so liked you to see embley in the summer she wrote for everything is such a blaze of beauty i had such a lovely walk yesterday before breakfast the voice of the birds is like the angels calling me with their songs and the fleecy clouds look like the white walls of our home nothing makes my heart thrill like the voice of the birds but the living chorus so seldom finds a second voice in the starved and earthly soul which like the withered arm cannot stretch forth its hand till christ bids it End quote. A very different note, it will be observed, from that which Parthenope and Pippa heard from the lark on the wing. And so, too, with regard to the house at Embley. Mr. Nightingale had found it a plain, substantial building of the Georgian period. He enlarged it into an ornate mansion in the Elizabethan style. His wife and elder daughter were much occupied in the interest of furnishing it appropriately, and Mr. Nightingale was greatly pleased with his alterations do you know said florence as she walked with an american friend on the lawn in the front of the drawing-room what i always think when i look at that row of windows i think how it should turn into a hospital and just how i should place the beds three embley was now a large house with accommodation enough to receive at one time as florence recorded in a letter five able-bodied married females with their husbands and belongings the large number of mr nightingale's brothers and sisters some of whom had many sons and daughters made the family circle of the nightingales a very wide one between four of the families the intercourse was particularly close the nightingales the nicholsons the bonham carters and the samuel smiths one of mrs nightingale's sisters married mr george thomas nelson of waverley abbey near farnham surrey among their children marianne was as a girl a great friend of her cousin florence in eighteen fifty one miss nicholson married captain afterwards sir douglas galton who some few years later became closely and helpfully connected with miss nightingale's work to mr nicholson's sister aunt hannah florence was greatly attached another of mr nightingale's sisters married mr john bonham carter of ditcham near petersfield for many years m p for portsmouth his eldest daughter joanna hillary was a particular friend of florence nightingale who said that of all her contemporaries within her circle her cousin hillary was the most gifted one of the sons mr henry bonham carter was and is secretary of the nightingale fund and miss nightingale appointed him one of her executors 
between the nightingales and the samuel smiths the relation was double mrs nightingale's brother mr samuel smith of combehurst surrey married mary shore sister of mr nightingale moreover their son mr william shore smith was the heir after his mother to the entailed land at embley and lee hurst in default of a son to mr nightingale the eldest child of mr and mrs samuel smith blanche married arthur hugh clogg a poet who as we shall hear was closely associated with miss nightingale there were many other relations but without being troubled to go into further details which might tax severely even the authoress of the pillars of the house the reader will perceive that florence nightingale was well provided with uncles aunts and cousins the fact is of some significance in understanding the circumstances of her life at this time and the nature of her struggle for independence emancipated or revolting daughters are sometimes pardoned or condoned if they can aver that they have few home ties to mrs nightingale it may seem that in the domestic intercourse within so large a family circle any comfortable daughter might find abundance of outlet and interest and so in one respect at least her daughter florence did the maternal instinct in her for which she was not in her own person to find fruition went out in almost passionate fullness to the young cousin william shore smith mentioned above he was her boy she used to say from the day on which he was put as a baby into her arms when she was eleven years old up to the time of his going up to cambridge he spent a portion of his holidays in every year at leahurst or embley Florence's letters at such times were full of him. She was successively his nurse, playfellow, and tutor. The son of my heart, she called him, quote, while he is with me all that is mine is his, my head and hand and time, end quote. It generally happens in any large family circle that there is one woman to whom all its members instinctively turn when a trouble comes or help is needed. Florence was the one in the Nightingale circle who filled this role of sister of mercy or emergency man, taking charge of one household when an aunt was away, or being dispatched to another when illness was prevalent. In 1845 she spent some time with her father's mother, who was threatened with paralysis, and whom she nursed into partial recovery i am very glad sometimes she wrote from her grandmother's sick-room to her cousin hilary to walk in the valley of the shadow of death as i do here there is something in the stillness and silence of it which levels all earthly troubles god tempers our wings in the waters of that valley and i have not been so happy or so thankful for a long time and yet it is curious in the last years of life that we should go downhill in order to climb up the other side that in the struggle of the spiritual with the material part of the universe the material should get the better and the soul just at the moment of becoming spiritualized forever should seem to become more materialized she made a similar reflection a little later in the same year 1845 when tending her old nurse gail in her last illness the old lady's spirit she wrote was in her pillowcases and one night when she thought she was dying and i was sitting up with her she said quote, now miss florence mind you have two new cases made for this bed for i think whoever sleeps here next year will find them comfortable End quote the deathbed of the nurse of the queen of nurses deserves some note the last words of mrs gale as reported in other letters were quote, don't wake the cook hannah go to your work and miss florence be careful in going down those stairs End quote. if the spirit of this old servant was materialized at the moment of passing the materializing took the form at any rate of faithful service and of consideration to others florence's sympathy with those in distress is shown in the letter of condolence which she wrote to miss clark upon the death of monsieur fariel embley july eighteen forty four i cannot help writing one word my dear miss clark after having just received your note 
though i know i cannot say anything which can be of any comfort for there are few sorrows i do believe like your sorrow and few people so necessary to another's happiness of every instant as he was to yours how sorry i am dear miss clark that you will not think of coming to us here oh do not say that you will not cloud young people's spirits do you think young people are so afraid of sorrow or that if they have lively spirits which i often doubt they think these are worth anything except in so far as they can be put at the service of sorrow not to relieve it which i believe can very seldom be done but to sympathize with it i am sure this is the only thing worth living for and i do so believe that every tear one sheds waters some good thing into life dear miss clark i wish we had you here or at least could see you and pour out something of what our hearts are full of that clever man of thebes one cadmus need never have existed for any good that that cold pen and ink of his ever did in the way of expressing one's self the iron pen seems to make the words iron but words are what always takes the dust off the butterfly's wings what nights we have had this last month though when one thinks that there are hundreds and thousands of people suffering in the same way and when one sees in every cottage some trouble which defies sympathy and there is all the world putting on its shoes and stockings every morning all the same and the wandering earth going its inexorable treadmill through those cold-hearted stars in the eternal silence as if nothing were the matter death seems less dreary than life at that rate but i did not mean to say that for who would know the peace of night if it were not for the troubles of the day the welcome the thrice prayed for the most fair the best beloved night when one feels what at other times one only repeats to oneself that the coffin of every hope is the cradle of a good experience and that nobody suffers in vain it is odd what want of faith one has for one's friends we know what soft lots we would have made for them if we could and that we should believe ourselves so infinitely more good-natured than god that we cannot trust their lots with him End quote. it must not be supposed however that florence was in request among the family circle only at times of sad emergency she sometimes took her place no less effectually on festive occasions waverley abbey the house of uncle nicholson aforesaid was the scene of family reunions at christmas time and in letters to miss clark from both mrs nightingale and her daughter parth there is a lively account of private theatricals there in eighteen forty one the merchant of venice was chosen and macready volunteered some assistance parth's artistic gifts were requisitioned and she was scene painter milliner and cap and fur maker the powers of command and organization which florence was afterwards to exhibit in another field seem to have been divined by her cousins for she was unanimously appointed stage manager miss joanna horner who was one of the party remembers that the usual little jealousies about parts and costumes used to disappear in presence of florence flo very blooming reported mrs nightingale the actors were not very obstinate and were tolerably good-tempered wrote parth but it was hard work for flo there was a captain elliot fresh from china who could by no means be brought to obey he was antonio and would burst out laughing in the midst of his most pathetic bits to the horror of shylock who was very earnest and hard-working the lady-in-chief in later years in the crimea had a rather peremptory way with obstructive military gentlemen on this occasion however she was perhaps satisfied with the assurance given at a well-known pantomime rehearsal that it would quote, be all right on the night end quote. but it was not quote, your flame uncle adams continues the letter to miss clark was very fine in lancelot but oh desperation forgot his duke's part in the most flagrant way though flo had been putting it into him with a sledgehammer all the week End quote. in the intervals of rehearsing the girls and their cousins danced and sang and took large walks sixteen together after the performance dancing was kept up till five in the morning next day continues lady verney we were debating whether sing a song of sixpence went on with a bag or a pocket full of rye and warming on this interesting subject we young ones dragged in all the old people sought recruits high and low and had a regular election scene 
uncle adams made a husting speech giving both parties hope of his vote and then the boys slunk out after counting and came in with large outcries to be counted a second time with many other corrupt practices much used at such times then we bribed a little boy to go and make disturbances in the other faction but you will be happy to hear the pockets had it by a large majority and we beat the base bag eats out of the field after the hallowing was over and the alarming rushings and screamings we had made mr croff a bohemian who had listened and desisted came to mamma and said this does give me the great idea of the liberty of your land your young people are brought up so to understand it in your domestic life if we were to make such a noise we would have the police in with swords and cutlasses to divide us End quote. End of part one chapter two home life part one chapter two of the life of florence nightingale volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyus cook part one chapter two home life continued four the nightingales had as many friends without as within the family circle their two homes brought them in touch with county society alike in derbyshire and in hampshire and acquaintanceships made in london were often ripened in the country or vice versa in derbyshire their friends included the struts and richard monckton milnes who afterwards took a cordial interest in the nightingale fund in london florence and her sister went out a great deal and saw all that was interesting to well-educated young persons a letter from florence to one of her aunts shows her occupied in politics in literature in astronomy with something perhaps of the note of a blue yet with her mind already set on a purpose in life Quote, Miss F. Nightingale to Miss Julia Smith, June twentieth, eighteen forty three. A cold east wind, forty one days of rain in the last month, as our newspaper informs us, to prove that forty three is worse than any preceding year. Do rest, the world very pleasant, people looking up in the prospect of peels, giving them free trade and all radical measures in the course of one or two years. Carlyle's new past and present a beautiful book there are bits about work which how i should like to read with you quote, blessed is he who has found his work let him ask no other blessedness he has a work a life purpose he has found it and will follow it End quote. sir j graham is going to be obliged to give up his factory's education bill for this year oh ye bigoted dissenters but i am going to hold my tongue and not meddle with politics or talk about things which i don't understand for i tremble already in anticipation and proceed at once to facts the two things we have done in london this year the most striking things are seeing buffet in claremont the blind painter you have seen him so i need not decant on his entire difference from anybody else and going under mr bethune to st james south's at kensington where we were from ten o'clock till three o'clock the next morning mr bethune is certainly the most good-natured man in ancient or modern history you will fancy the first going out upon the lawn on that most beautiful of nights with the immense fellow slung in his frame like a great steam-engine and working as easily and the mountains of the moon striking out like bright points in the sky and the little stars resolving themselves into double and even quadruple stars those dialogues of galileo are so beautiful mr bethune lent them to us to read in the real old first edition at embley the nightingale saw something of the palmerstons and the ashburtons with Miss Louisa Stuart Mackenzie, who afterwards became the second wife of the second Lord Ashburton, Florence formed a friendship which was one of the solaces and supports of her life at this time. Other friends who played a yet larger part in her life were Mr. and Mrs. Bracebridge of Atherston, near Coventry. 
florence sketches the character of some of her friends in a letter to her cousin hilary april eighteen forty six quote mrs keith miss dutton and louisa mackenzie may be shortly described as the respective representatives of the soul the mind and the heart the first has one's whole worship the second one's greatest admiration and the third one's most lively interest mrs bracebridge may be described as all three the human trinity in one and never do i see her without feeling that she is eyes to the blind and feet to the lame many a plan which disappointment has thinned off into a phantom in my mind takes form and shape and fair reality when touched by her ethereal spear for there is an ethereal spear for good as well as for evil end quote. Dr. Richard Dawes, Dean of Hereford, who was an educational reformer, and Dr. Fowler of Salisbury, who anticipated the open-air treatment and was otherwise a man of marked originality, were among those whose friendship she valued. If Florence Nightingale was to find her home life empty and unprofitable, it was not for lack of congenial friends. She saw much, too, of general society, and Embley was often the scene of entertaining. We get a glimpse of its parties from an invitation which Mr. Nightingale sent to Miss Clark, October 1843, to bring her friend Leopold von Rank with her on a visit. Quote, Pray send him a sly line, to the effect that he will find notabilities here on the 24th, to wit, the Speaker, Charles Lefebvre, the ex-foreign secretary, Palmerston, the Catholic Weld, future owner of Lulworth and nephew of the cardinal of that ilk, and mayhap a queen's equerry or two a baron of the exchequer rolf an inspector or rather engineering architect of the new prisons and a couple of baronets he should think well on this yours quizzically but faithfully w e n papa is quizzing the baronets added florence who are not wise ones provided you come i care for nobody no not i and shall be quite satisfied as Monsieur de Something said to the stale, quote, Nous irons à nous deux de l'esprit pour quarante, vous pour quatre et moi pour zéro. End quote. There were return invitations to great houses, and occasionally Florence retails their gossip or her own reflections for the benefit of cousins or aunts. Quote, to Miss Hilary Bonhomme Carter, eighteen forty five or early forty-six what is the secret of lady joycelyn's sublime placidity i never saw anything so lovely as she is and she has lived four and twenty years of more excitement i suppose than ever fell to anybody's lot but an actress all the young peerage having proposed to her what gives her such a fullness of life now and makes her find enough in herself it is not that she talks to lord palmerston or lord joycelyn for she never does, and though she is very fond of her baby, she told me herself she did not care to play with it. Perhaps she will say it is want of earnestness, but good gracious, my dear, if earnestness breaks one's heart, who is fulfilling most the creation's end? She who is breaking her heart, or this woman who has kept her serenity in the midst of excitement, and her simplicity in unbounded admiration? the palmerstons are certainly the most good-natured people under the stars to their guests we have been since to sir william heathcote's to meet the ashburtons i wish you had been there for the sake of the pictures and also for the sake of the artistical dinner which even i became aware was such a dinner and such plate as has seldom blessed my housekeeping eyes the palmerstons too have had down all their pictures from london such a rembrandt Pilate washing his hands. Lord Ashburton does not look much like a settler of a boundary question. She is an American, and we swore eternal friendship upon Boston, I having, you know, much curious information to give her upon that city and its inhabitants. She has a raspberry tart of diamonds upon her forehead worth seeing then mesmerism and when we parted we had got up so high into vestiges that i could not get down again and was obliged to go off as an angel 
the ashburtons were the only people asked to meet the queen of strathfield say of her society it was the most entire crash ever heard of and the not asking the palmerstons considered almost a personal insult but they say the old duke now cares for nothing but flattery and asks nobody but masters of hands he almost ill-treated the speaker after dinner they all stood at ease about the drawing-room and behaved like so many soldiers on parade the queen did her very best to enliven the gloom but was at last overpowered by numbers gagged and her hands tied the only amusement was seeing albert taught to miss at billiards End quote. five florence's remark that she would only provide the zero of esprit to miss clark's quatre is by no means to be taken literally she was attractive and she attracted both men and women she talked well and often laid herself out to interest her companions and sometimes confounded them with learning in eighteen forty four julia ward howard was in england with her husband dr howe and they visited the nightingales at embley florence writes mrs howe in her reminiscences quote, was rather elegant than beautiful she was tall and graceful of figure her countenance mobile and expressive her conversation most interesting End quote. a reminiscence of a later date records an encounter with sir henry de la beche the pioneer of the geological map of england warrington smythe and sir henry dined at mr nightingale's and florence sat between them Quote, she began by drawing sir henry out on geology and charmed him by the boldness and breadth of her views which were not common then she accidentally proceeded into regions of latin and greek and then our geologist had to get out of it she was fresh from egypt and began talking with w smythe about the inscriptions etc where he thought he could do pretty well but when she began quoting lepsius which she had been studying in the original he was in the same case as sir henry when the ladies left the room sir henry said to smythe a capital young lady that if she hadn't floored me with her latin and greek i have been dowagering out with papa wrote florence to miss clark march eighteen forty three in the big coach to a formal dinner party where however mr gerald noel and i were very thick he inquiring tenderly after you and your whereabouts here inserted is a drawing of florence nightingale as a girl about eighteen forty five from a drawing by miss hilary bonham carter of miss nightingale's personal appearance in early womanhood there are pen pictures by very competent hands lady lovelace in her verses entitled a portrait taken from life emphasizes a certain spiritual aloofness in her friend Quote, i saw her pass and pause to think she moves as one on whom to gaze with calm and holy thoughts that link the soul to god in prayer and praise she walks as if on heaven's brink unscathed through life's entangled maze i heard her soft and silver voice take part in songs of harmony well framed to gladden and rejoice whilst her ethereal melody still kept my soul in wavering choice twixt smiles and tears of ecstasy i deem her fair yes very fair yet some there are who pass her by unmoved by all the graces there her face doth raise no burning sigh nor hath her slender form the glare which strikes and rivets every eye her grave but large and lucid eye unites a boundless depth of feeling with truth's own bright transparency her singleness of heart revealing but still her spirit's history from light and curious gaze concealing End quote. mrs gaskell's picture in prose gives some lighter touches quote, she is tall very straight and willowy in figure thick and shortish rich brown hair very delicate complexion gray eyes which are generally pensive and drooping but when they choose can be the merriest eyes i ever saw and perfect teeth making her smile the sweetest i ever saw put a long piece of soft net and tie it round this beautifully shaped head so as to form a soft white framework for the full oval of her face for she had a toothache and so wore this little piece of drapery and dress her up in black silk high up to the long white round throat 
and with a black shawl on and you may get near an idea of her perfect grace and lovely appearance she is so like a saint End quote she dressed becomingly but had a saint's carelessness in such things somewhat to her elder sister's despair make flo wear her white silk frock to-night she wrote on one occasion to her mother many years later when stores and comforts were being sent out to the east under cover to the lady-in-chief lady verney insinuated one little gown for flo and who will not love her for it when in eighteen forty nine she started to winter in the east her mother says i quote again from mrs gaskell they equipped her en princess and when she came back she had little besides the clothes she had on she had given away her linen etc right and left to those who wanted it End quote. six those who have social gifts often find sufficient happiness in their exercise but florence though she sometimes enjoyed the intercourse of intellectual society reproached herself all the while for doing so she felt increasingly that she had other gifts which were more properly hers and that the life of society was a distraction into the wrong path she found even the london season more congenial than the life of the hospitable country house people talk of london gaieties she wrote to miss nicholson aunt hannah but there you can at least have your mornings to yourself to me the country is the place of row since we came home in september how long do you think we can have been alone not one fortnight a country house is the real place for dissipation sometimes i think that everybody is hard upon me that to be forever expected to be looking merry and saying something lively is more than can be asked mornings noons and nights End quote. when she was alone with her parents and her sister she hardly found the life at home more satisfying this was partly as she confessed in many a page of self-examination the result of her own shortcomings ask me she wrote to aunt hannah to do something for your sake something difficult and you will see that i shall do it regularly which is for me the most difficult thing of all End quote. let those who reproach themselves for a desultoriness seemingly incurable take heart again from the example of florence nightingale no self-reproach recurs more often in her private outpourings at this time than that of irregularity and even sloth she found it difficult to rise early in the morning she prayed and wrestled to be delivered from desultory thoughts from idle dreaming from scrappiness in unselfish work she wrestled and she won when her capacities had found full scope in congenial work nothing was more fixed and noteworthy in her life and work than regularity precision method persistence but in part the failings with which she reproached herself were the fault of her circumstances the fact of the two country homes militated against steady work in either her parents were not indeed careless or thoughtless beyond others in their station but rather the reverse mr nightingale was a careful landlord and zealous in country business and his wife took some interest as i have already said in village schools and charities but to florence's parents these things were rather graces rightly incidental to their station than the main business of life florence's more eager temperament and larger capacity craved for greater consistency in the energies of life she was expected to play the part of lady bountiful one day and to be equally ready to play that of lady graceful the next a friend who visited at leah hurst recalls how florence would often be missing in the evening and on search being made she would be found in the village sitting by the bedside of some sick person and saying she could not sit down to a grand seven o'clock dinner while this was going on but by the time she had schooled herself to any regularity of work at leah hurst the hour had come for moving to embley by the time she had settled down to work amongst her poor at embley the hour of the london season had struck i should be very glad she wrote to her aunt from embley if i could have been left here when they went to london as there is so much to be done but as that would not be heard of london is really my place to rest the companionship which florence had at home was sometimes wearisome to her the sisters as we have already seen were not in full sympathy the parents were not unintellectual persons but again much the reverse 
Mrs. Nightingale was a woman of bright intelligence and of much social charm. Mr. Nightingale was a highly intellectual man, sensitive, too, and refined. He shot and hunted, but he was not ardently devoted to either sport, and was interested in many things, perhaps in too many, and yet not enough in any. Florence Nightingale, in her later years, used sometimes to describe with a twinkle of affectionate humor of a morning in her home life as a girl mamma we may suppose was busy with housekeeping cares papa was very fond of reading aloud and in order to interest his daughters would take them through the whole of the times with many a comment no doubt by the way now for parth miss nightingale used to say quote, the morning's reading did not matter she went on with her drawing but for me who had no such cover the thing was boring to desperation to be read aloud to she wrote is the most miserable exercise of the human intellect or rather is it any exercise at all it is like lying on one's back with one's hands tied and having liquid poured down one's throat worse than that because suffocation would immediately ensue and put a stop to this operation but no suffocation would stop the other as the younger daughter of a busily efficient mother, Florence was not often entrusted with household duties, but on one occasion, at any rate, she was left in command, and that during the important season of jam-making. "'My reign is now over,' she wrote to her cousin Hilary, who was an art student, December 1845. Quote, angels and ministers of grace defend me from another though i cannot but view my fifty-six pots with the proud satisfaction of an artist my head a little on one side inspecting the happy effect of my works with more feeling of the beautiful than parth ever had in hers and even housekeeping brought obstinate questionings with it to florence she describes a bout of it on another occasion in a letter to madame moll july eighteen forty seven Quote, I am up to my chin in linen and glass, and I am very fond of housekeeping. In this too highly educated, too little active age, it, at least, is a practical application of our theories to something, and yet in the middle of my lists, my green lists, brown lists, red lists, of all my instruments of the ornamental and culinary accomplishments, which I cannot even divine the use of, I cannot help asking in my head, can reasonable people want all this? is all that china linen glass necessary to make man a progressive animal is it even good political economy query for good read atheistical political economy to invent once in order to supply employment or ought not in these times all expenditure to be reproductive and a proper stupid answer you'll get says the best versailles service so go and do your accounts there is one of us cracked End quote. 7. Florence was an affectionate and dutiful daughter. She obeyed and yielded for many years. She strove hard to think that her duty lay at home, and that the trivial round and common task would furnish all that she had any right, before God or man, to ask. But as the sense of a vocation elsewhere strengthened and deepened in her mind, she may well have thought that, as her elder sister was contented to stay at home, a life of activity outside might for the other daughter not be inconsistent with affection for her parents. She had, indeed, intellectual interests of her own. She read a great deal in English, French, German, in devotional works, in poetry, history, philosophy, and what she read she marked and inwardly digested. A copy, unfortunately not complete, is preserved of the first edition of Browning's Paracelsus, which she annotated with remarks, paraphrases, and illustrative cases as she read. The first scene of the poem, Paracelsus Aspires, contains many a passage which aroused a sympathetic echo in her heart. A keynote is struck early. Pursuing an aim not to be found in life, is her comment, is its true misery. Then she kept commonplace books, in which, under heads alphabetically arranged, such as Age of Reason, Bigotry, Creeds, Death, education and so forth she copied out passages which struck her she was accumulating stores of information and reflection in some remarks upon la cordiere in one of her notebooks i find this passage copied out quote, 
i desire for a considerable time only to lead a life of obscurity and toil for the purpose of allowing whatever i may have received of god to ripen and turning it some day to the glory of his name nowadays people are too much in a hurry both to produce and consume themselves it is only in retirement in silence in meditation that are formed the men who are called to exercise an influence on society for her own part as her powers of reflection were strengthened so did her sense of a vocation become more insistent with every year in some autobiographical notes miss nightingale records may seventh eighteen fifty two as the date at which she was conscious of quote, a call from god to be a savior end quote but the thought of devoting herself to be a nurse came much earlier mrs julia ward howe in the reminiscences quoted above describes how during the visit of herself and her husband to embley in eighteen forty four florence had taken dr howe aside and asked him this question if i should determine to study nursing and to devote my life to that profession do you think it would be a dreadful thing dr howe it will be remembered was of wide repute as a philanthropist and miss nightingale thought much of his opinion it was favourable to her wish not a dreadful thing at all he replied i think it would be a very good thing my idea of heaven she wrote a little time afterwards is when my dear aunt hannah and i and my boy shore and all of us shall be together nursing the sick people who are left behind and giving each other sympathies besides and our saviour in the midst of us giving us strength but meanwhile she hoped to realize some little peace of the heaven on earth she pursued other inquiries laid her plans kept her own counsel and then made a first bid for freedom the nature of her plans the nipping of them in the bud by maternal frost and her following dejection are told in a letter to her cousin hilary december eleventh eighteen forty five quote, well my dearest i am not yet come to the great thing i wanted to say i have always found that there was so much truth in the suggestion that you must dig for hidden treasures in silence or you will not find it and so i dug after my poor little plan in silence even from you it was to go to be a nurse at salisbury hospital for these few months to learn the prax and then to come home and make such wondrous intimacies at west wellow under the shelter of a rhubarb powder and a dressed leg let alone that no one could ever say to me again your health will not stand this or that i saw a poor woman die before my eyes this summer because there was no one but fools to sit up with her who poisoned her as much as if they had given her arsenic and then i had such a fine plan for those dreaded latter days which i have never dreaded if i should outlive my immediate ties of taking a small house in west wellow well i did not like much talking about it but i thought something like a protestant sisterhood without vows for women of educated feelings might be established but there have been difficulties about my very first step which terrified mamma i do not mean the physically revolting parts of a hospital but things about the surgeons and nurses which you may guess even mrs fowler threw cold water upon it and nothing will be done this year at all events and i do not believe ever and no advantage that i see comes of my living on excepting that one becomes less and less of a young lady every year which is only a negative one you will laugh dear at the whole plan i dare say but no one but the mother of it knows how precious an infant idea becomes nor how the soul dies between the destruction of one and the taking up of another i shall never do anything and am worse than dust and nothing i wonder if our saviour were to walk the earth again and i were to go to him and ask whether he would send me back to live this life again which crushes me into vanity and deceit oh for some strong thing to sweep this loathsome life into the past End quote. and so ended for the time the dash of the caged bird for liberty end of part one chapter two part one chapter three of the life of florence nightingale volume one this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. 
The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1, by Edward Tyus Cook. Chapter 3. The Spiritual Life. Though the outward man may perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. St. Paul The failure of her life plan left Florence in a great state of dejection. The day of personal hopes and fears, she wrote, is over for me. Now I dread and desire no more. This was but a passing mood, and very soon, as we shall hear in the next chapter, she resumed, with increased determination, her struggle for freedom and self-expression in a life of action. But for the moment, and at many recurring moments in later years, the dejection was intense. It was not merely the disappointment of an eager mind denied its appropriate energy. It was the exceeding bitter cry of an intensely religious soul, tempted in its perplexity to ask, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In some autobiographical notes, Miss Nightingale recorded under the year 1843, an illness and an acquaintance I made with a woman to whom all unseen things seemed real, and eternal things near, awakened me from dreaming. The woman to whom she referred was, it may safely be conjectured, Miss Hannah Nicholson. They met once or twice a year, when Miss Nicholson visited Embley, or Miss Nightingale stayed with Miss Nicholson's brother at Waverley. At other times they exchanged a voluminous correspondence, and this was almost entirely devoted to religious experiences and speculations. Aunt Hannah had inexhaustible sympathy with her self-torturing young friend. She did not chide or discourage Florence, but the burden of her message was the claim of the spiritual life, the message of Paul to the Corinthians. Your whole life, wrote Florence, in one of the many bursts of affectionate gratitude to Miss Nicholson, seems to be love, and you always find words in your heart which, without the pretension of enlightening, yet are like a clearing up to me. You always seem to rest on the heart of the divine teacher and to participate in his mysteries. Your letters, she said on another occasion, stay by me and warm me when the dreams of life come one after another, clouding and covering the realities of the unseen. To this sympathetic, and in some limited respects, kindred soul, Florence poured out unreservedly the experiences of her spiritual life, and also, sometimes, though with more conscious art of literary expression, to Miss Clark in Paris. 2. A few letters selected from a great number will serve to trace the course of her religious thoughts. They resumed, it will be seen, the spiritual experiences and convictions of the saints who have served mankind. The Reality of the Unseen World is the subject of a letter to Miss Clark, August 1846, in which, after a page of family news, she continues, but I think you must be tired of all this, for I fancy that you live much more in the supernatural than in the natural world. I always believe in Homer, and in St. Paul's Cloud of Witnesses, and in the old Italian pictures, which have a first story, where the unseen live all premier, with a two-pair back, where the pair eternal's shadow is half seen peeping out, and a ground floor where poor mortals live but still have a connection with the establishment above stairs. I like those books, where the invisible communicates freely with the visible kingdom, not that they ever come up to one's idea, which is always so much brighter than the execution, for the word is only the shadow cast by the light of the thought, but they are suggestive. I always believe in a multitude of spirits inhabiting the same house with ourselves. We are only the entresol, quite the most insignificant of its lodgers, and too busy with our pursuit of daily bread, too much confined with hard work, and too full of struggle with the material world, to visit the glorious beings immediately about us. Whom we shall see, when the present candle of our earthly reason is put out, which blinds us just as the candle-end, left burning after one is in bed, long prevents us from seeing the world without, lit up by the full moon. It trembles and flickers and sinks into its socket, and then we catch a bright stripe of moonlight shining on the floor. But it flares up again, and the silvery stream is gone, as if it could not be, as if it had not been. And we see nothing but the candle, and hardly imagine any other light, till at last it goes quite out, and the flood of moonlight rushes into the room, 
and every pane of the casement window and every ivy leaf without are stamped as it were upon the floor and a whole world revealed to us which that flickering candle was the means of concealing from us this is what jesus christ meant i suppose when he said that he must go away in order to be with his friends in his spirit that he would be much nearer to them after death than in the flesh in the flesh we were separated from our friends by their going into the next room only a door a partition divided us but what can separate two souls often i fancy that we can perceive the presence of a good spirit communicating thoughts to us are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister unto us when jesus christ warns us not to despise any one because that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of his father perhaps he thought that our beloved ones who are gone might be these our angels who must therefore have communion with men it is here where a cold and false life of conventionalism and prejudices and frivolity is often all that reaches our outward senses that we are sometimes baffled in seeing into the life which lies beneath it is here amidst the tempers and little vexations which are the shadows that dim the brightest intercourse it is here that we fail sometimes in having intimate communion with souls and we stop short at the dead coverings but between the soul which is free and our soul what barrier what restraint can there be human sympathy is indeed necessary to our happiness of every moment and the absence of it makes an awful void in our life every room becomes a grave and every book we used to read together a monument to the one we love but some one says that we need an idée marvelle to preserve us from the busy devils which imagination here is always conjuring up this idée marvelle i think is the idea of the loving presence of spirits those dear ones are safe and yet with us still for truly do i believe that these senses of ours are what veil from us not discover to us the world around which is sometimes revealed to us in dreams or in moments of excitement as at the point of death either our own or a friend's or by mesmerism or by faith faith is the real eye and ear of the soul and as it would be impossible to describe the harmony and melody of music to one who is born deaf or to make a blind man perceive the beauty of the effects of color so without faith the spiritual world is as much a hidden one to the soul as the art of painting to the blind man on a dark night the moon when at last she rises reveals to us just at our feet a world of objects of the presence of which we were not aware before we see the river sparkling in the moonbeams close beside us and the tall shadows sleeping quietly on the grass and the sharp relief of the architectural cornices and the strong outline of the lights and shades so well defined that we can scarcely believe that a moment ago and we did not see them what shall we say if one day the moon rises upon our spiritual world and we see close at hand ready to hold the most intimate communion with us those spirits with whom we had loved and mourned as lost to us we are like the blind man by the wayside and ought to sit and cry lord that we may receive our sight and when we do receive it we shall perhaps find that we require no transporting into another world to become aware of the immediate presence of an infinite spirit and of other lesser ones whom we thought gone what we require is sight not change of place i believe the struggle which absorbed florence's mind and heart was to establish some harmony between her dealings in the world of sense and her communion with the unseen world she reproached herself for impatience for selfishness for lack of confidence in the good time of god happy are they who have no more occasion than she to deem themselves unprofitable servants but the condition of attainment to comparative sinlessness is i suppose the conviction of sin and this was intensely present to florence nightingale i have read over your letters many times again and again since i have been here she wrote from tapton her grandmother's shore house in eighteen forty five ah my dear aunt hannah you are like the white swan on your cool fresh blue lake rocked to peace and rest by the sweet winds of your faith and love and you cannot be dragged down into our busy chicken yard of struggling scratting life you do not know what it is when one has sinned with such aggravation as i have no one has had such advantages and i have sinned with all these 
and after having been made to know what sin was and what my obligations were. No one has so grieved the Holy Spirit. I have sinned against my conviction, and, as it were, standing before God's judgment seat. In many of Miss Nightingale's religious outpourings, both in letters and in private diaries, there is a note which borders on the morbid, but the danger point is averted, sometimes by practical good sense, and sometimes by a saving sense of humor. The letter, just given, was soon followed by another, from Embley, October 1845, containing this account of a scene at the bedside of her favorite little cousin. One night, when I was reading to Shore the verse about the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil, and we were agreeing that the temptations of the flesh were like a great deal of play and no work, and lying long bed, and the temptations of the world liking to be praised and admired, and to be a general favorite, and so on, more than anything else, and we were both very much affected, he said before I left him, Now I may lie in bed tomorrow, and you won't call me at six, will you? And I, too, went away to dream about a great many things which I had much better not think about. Oh, how I did laugh at the results of all our feelings. To think and to be are two such different things. To bring thought and action into harmony, to make the presence of the unseen a guide through the path of this present world, that is the problem of the practically religious life. To Florence Nightingale, communion with the unseen meant something deeper, richer, fuller, more positive than the fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning, but not the end, of wisdom, for perfect love casteth out fear. It was for the love of God as an active principle in her mind, constraining all her deeds, that she strove. When she was conscious of falling away from this grace, she knew the pains of hell, here and now, as the state of a soul in estrangement from the eternal goodness. To Miss Nicholson, Embley, Christmas Eve, undated. Think of me tomorrow at the sacrament. I have not taken it since I last took it with you, except once with a poor woman on her deathbed. Time has sped wearily with me since then, Aunt Hannah. If, when the plough goes over the soul, there were always the hand of the sower there to scatter the seed after it, who would regret? But how often the seed time has passed. It is too late. The harrow has gone over. The time of harvest has come, and the harvest is not. Give me your thoughts to-morrow, my dear Aunt Hannah. I want them sadly, and take me with you to the throne of grace. Bless me, too, as poor Esau said. I have so felt with him, and cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, Bless me, even me also, O my father. But he never has yet, and I have not deserved that he should. To Miss Nicholson, May 1846 The sorrows of hell compassed me about. We learn to know that these are beforehand when we cannot command our thoughts to pray, when all our omissions give themselves form and life, and shut us up within a wall over which there is no looking, no return, when they hold us down with a resistless power, and we are hemmed in with our remembrances, like a cell compassing us about. What can the future hell be other than this? The unspeakable presence may be joy and peace unspeakable, but it may be a horror a dweller on our threshold, a spirit of fear to the stricken conscience. Jesus Christ prayed on the cross not for life or safety, but only for the light of his countenance. Why hast thou forsaken me? And all sorrows disappear before that one. Let those who have felt it say if it is not so, and if there is any sorrow like unto that sorrow. How willingly would we exchange it for pain, which we almost welcome as proof of his care and attention, Grief in itself is no evil, and making the unseen, the eternal, and the infinite present to our consciousness is rather a good. But when all one's imaginations are wandering out of one's reach, then one realizes the future state of punishment even in this world. Pray that he will not leave my soul in hell. How little can be done under the spirit of fear. It is the very sentence pronounced upon the serpent. Upon thy belly shalt thou go all the days of thy life. Oh, if any one thinks that, in the repentance of fear, this is the time for the soul to open to the infinite goodness, to the spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind, in the heart's death to live and love. Let him try how hard it is to collect oneself out of distraction. Let him feel the woes of saying, tomorrow, 
when God has said, Today, and then when he has found how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem all the uses of the world, let him try with a dead heart to live unto God, to love with all his strength, when all energy to love is gone. The state of perfect love, expressing itself in perfect rightness of thought and deed, may be unattainable on earth, but nothing lower than the search for this ideal can satisfy the yearnings of a soul such as was Florence Nightingale's. She had the hunger for righteousness, the crown of righteousness, she wrote to Miss Nicholson, May 1846. That word always strikes me more than anything in the Bible. Strange that not happiness, not rest, not forgiveness, not glory, should have been the thought of that glorious man's mind, when, at the eve of the last and greatest of his labors, all desires so swallowed up in the one great craving after righteousness that, at the end of all his struggles, it was mightier within him than ever, mightier even than the desire for peace. How can people tell one to dwell within a good conscience when the chief of all the apostles so panted after righteousness that he considered it the last best gift, unattainable on earth, to be bestowed in heaven? To do all for the love of God was the ideal which she sought to attain. The foundations of all must be the love of God. That the sufferings of Christ's life were intense, who doubts? But the happiness must also have been intense. Only think of the happiness of working, and working successfully, too, with no doubts as to his path, and with no alloy of vanity, or love of display or glory, but with the ecstasy of single-heartedness. All that I do is always poisoned by the fear that I am not doing it in simplicity and godly sincerity. This was one of the constant dreads throughout her life. When she had become famous and was praised and courted by the popular breath, she shrank with an abhorrence which some may have considered almost morbid, and which was certainly foreign to the fashion of the world, from any avoidable publicity. This was no pose or affectation. It was part of her religion. It was a counsel dictated by her earnest striving to disassociate her work for God from any taint of worldliness. 3. The world which came to owe much to the life and example of Florence Nightingale owes something to Miss Nicholson, whose gentle sympathy brought to her young friend much strength and peace. But the world may also be glad, I think, that Miss Nightingale's religious thought worked itself out in the end on lines of her own. Florence Nightingale has been enrolled by the popular voice among the saints, but there are saints and saints, saints contemplative or mystic, and saints active and ministering. In all ages of the world there have been godly women whose passion of religious spirit has led them to lives of professional pieties rather than of practical service, who have spent in ecstasies of pity or in tortures of self-abasement at the foot of the cross, powers which might have gone to redeem and save the world. Florence Nightingale had, as we have sufficiently seen, a profound sense of personal religion. She felt, as all the saints must feel, that a religious life means a state of soul, but she attained also to the conviction, which became ever stronger within her, that a state of soul can only be approved by its fruits, and that thus the service of God is the service of man. To Miss Nicholson, Embley, September 4, 1846. I am almost heartbroken to leave Lee Hurst. There are so many duties there which lie near at hand, and I could be well content to do them there all the days of my life. I have left so many poor friends there whom I shall never see again, and so much might have been done for them. I feel my sympathies are with ignorance and poverty. The things which interest me interest them. We are alike in expecting little from life, much from God. We are taken up with the same objects. My imagination is so filled with the misery of this world that the only thing in which to labor brings any return seems to me helping and sympathizing there and all that poets sing of the glories of this world appears to me untrue. All the people I see are eaten up with care or poverty or disease. I know that it was God who created the good, and man the evil, which was not the will of God, but the necessary consequence of his leaving free will to man. I know that misery is the alphabet of fire, in which history, with its warning hand, writes in flaming letters the consequences of evil, the kingdom of man, and that without its glaring light we should never see the path back into the kingdom of God, or heed the directing guideposts. But the judgments of nature, the law of God, 
as she goes her mighty solemn inflexible march sweeps sometimes so fearfully over man that though it is the triumph not the defeat of god's truth and of his laws that falsehood against them must work misery and misery is perhaps here the strongest proof that his loving hand is present yet all our powers hopes and fears must it seems to me be engrossed by doing his work for its relief life is no holiday game nor is it a clever book nor is it a school of instruction nor a valley of tears but it is a hard fight a struggle a wrestling with the principle of evil hand to hand foot to foot every inch of the way must be disputed the night is given us to take breath to pray to drink deep at the fountain of power the day to use the strength which has been given us to go forth to work with it till the evening the kingdom of god is coming and thy kingdom come does not mean only my salvation come to find out what we can do she wrote as an annotation in browning's periclesis one's individual place as well as the general end is man's task to serve man for god's sake not man's will prevent failure from being disappointment florence nightingale sought then to save her soul by serving others it was by this same test of practical service that she came to try and to weigh the various forms of religious doctrine her father was as i have said a unitarian and several other members of her family circle were of the same persuasion but she and some others of that circle conformed in practice to the services of the english church and so in some degree miss nightingale continued to conform to the end of her life though as we shall find later she departed widely from the doctrines of the church as ordinarily received did not care about going to church and framed a creed of her own but she always had a tolerant mind for any faith that issued in good works and an impatience with any that did not it is for this reason that she seemed to be all things to all men in religious matters her mission to the crimea involved as we shall learn some religious bickerings protestants thought her too indulgent to roman catholics and catholics were sore that she did not go further with them but her real attitude is perfectly clear and was entirely consistent if she looked with a favoring eye on roman catholics it was on account not of their dogmas but of their deeds two letters to madame mole ten years apart in date suggest what was always miss nightingale's point of view lee hurst september eighteen forty one we are very anxious to hear dearest miss clark how you are going on and how mrs clark is some day when you are able to write we are just returning from the leeds consecration and a more curious and interesting sight i never saw imagine a procession of four hundred clergymen all in their white robes with scarves of blue and black and fur and even scarlet so that i thought some of them were cardinals headed up by the archbishop of york the bishop of ripon etc and most curious of all the bishop of new jersey to whom dr hook who is you know perhaps the puseyite vicar of leeds had written to ask him to come over from america expressly to preach the consecration sermon imagine all this procession entering the church repeating the twenty-fourth psalm and then filling the space before the altar and the transept and all responding aloud through the service so that the roll and echo of their responses through the transept without being able to see them was the most striking thing i ever heard it was quite a gathering place for the puseites from all parts of england papa heard them debating whether they should have lighted candles before the altar but they decided no because the bishop of ripon would not like it however they had them in the evening and the next morning when he was gone and dr hook had the regular catholic jerk in making the genuflection every time he approaches the altar the church is a most magnificent one and every one has contributed their best to it with a true catholic spirit one gave the beautiful painted window another the corregio for the altarpiece the queen dowager the altar cloth another the bells etc etc dr hook gives a service every morning and evening at half past seven and the sacrament every sunday and the aisle is all occupied by open seats during the consecration i wish to have been a clergyman but when mrs gaskell whom i was with she is a good tory and half a puseite and withal the most general favorite and generally lenient person in england when she and i came down afterwards for the sacrament i could not help looking in the faces of the clergymen for the impression i expected to see as they walked down the aisle and wandered about 
this immense crowd, after the sacrament, and, oh, I was woefully disappointed. They looked so stupid, and I could not help thinking, if you had been Catholics, you would all have been on your knees during the service, without minding your fine gowns and the cold stones. Embley, February 7th, 1851 I suppose you know how the two churches have been convulsing themselves in England in a manner discreditable to themselves and ridiculous to others. The Anglican Church screamed and struggled as if they were taking away something of hers. The Catholic Church sang and shouted as if she had conquered England. Neither the one nor the other has happened. Only a good many people, in our church, found out they were Catholics and went to Rome, and a good many other people found out they were Protestants, which they never knew before, and left the Puseite pen, which has now lost half its sheep. At Oxford, the Puseite volcano is extinct. You know what a row there will be this session in Parliament about it. The most moderate wish for a concordant, but even these say that we must strip the Roman Catholic bishops of the new titles. Many think the present government will go out upon it, because they won't do enough to satisfy the awakened prejudices of dear John Bull. I used to think it was a mere selfish quarrel between red stockings and lawn sleeves, but not a bit of it. It's a real popular feeling. One would think that all our religion was political by the way we talk, and so I believe it is. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, you hear our clergy talking of nothing but bishops versus vicars general. Never a word of different plans of education, prisons, penitentiaries, and so on. One would think we were born ready-made as to education, but that art made a church. I feel little zeal in pulling down one church or building up another, in making bishops or unmaking them. If they would but make us, our faith would spring up of itself, and then we shouldn't want either Anglican Church or Roman Catholic Church to make it for us. But, bless my soul, people are just as ignorant now of any law in the human mind as they were in Socrates' time. We have learned the physical laws since then, but mental laws. Why, people don't even acknowledge their existence. They talk of grace and divine influence. Why, if it's an arbitrary gift from God, how unkind of him not to give it before. And if it comes by certain laws, why don't we find them out? But people in England think it quite profane to talk of finding them out, and they pray that it may please thee to have mercy upon all men. When I should knock you down, if you were to say to me, that it should please you to have mercy upon your boy. I never had any training, and training to be called training, as we train the fingers to play scales and shakes. I doubt whether anybody ever gets from other people, because they don't know how to give it according to any certain laws. I wish everybody would write, as far as they can, a short account of God's dealings with them, like the old Puritans, and then perhaps we should find out at last what are God's ways in his goings-on and what are not. Arthur Stanley, afterwards the dean, once asked her to use her influence in preventing a friend of his and of hers from taking the step, supposed to be imminent, of joining the Roman communion. In a long reply which Miss Nightingale wrote with great care, November 26, 1852, she promised to do what she could, but explained that this might not be much. She herself remained in the Anglican communion because she was born there, and because the Roman church offered some things which she personally did not want. She feared that their friend might consider that such arguments, as she could urge against the Roman Church, applied equally against the Anglican. And, on the other hand, she had never concealed her opinion that the Roman Communion offered advantages to women which the Church of England, at that time, did not. The Catholic orders, she wrote, offered me work, training for that work, sympathy and help in it, such as I had in vain sought in the Church of England. The Church of England has for men bishoprics, archbishoprics, and a little work, good men make a great deal for themselves. For women, she has what? I had no taste for theological discoveries. I would have given her my head, my heart, my hand. She would not have them. She did not know what to do with them. She told me to go back and do crochet in my mother's drawing room, or, if I were tired of that, to marry and look well at the head of my husband's table. You may go to the Sunday school if you like it, she said, but she gave me no training even for that. She gave me neither work to do for her, nor education for it. The latter part of the second letter to Miss Clark shows Miss Nightingale's interest in speculations about the basis of moral law. But so far as the rivalry of churches was concerned, 
it was by works that she tried them. In all the dens of disgrace and disease, she wrote in one of her notebooks, the only clergy who deserve the name of pastors are the Roman Catholic. The rest, of all denominations, Church of England, Church of Scotland, dissenters, are only theology or tea-mongers. It will never do, she said once to a friend, unless we have a church of which the terms of membership shall be works, not doctrines. She was interested, however, in doctrines also. If she was resolved to dedicate her life to the service of man, she was no less convinced that such service could only be rendered at the best and highest, in the light and with the sanction of service to God. Herein may be found an underlying unity and harmony through the many and diverse interests of her life. We shall see that she who opened new careers and standards of practical benevolence in the modern world spent also years of thought upon the less manageable task, if not of providing the world with a new religion, at any rate of giving to old doctrines a new application and, as she hoped, a more acceptable sanction. End of chapter 3「Part One, Chapter Four of the Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One by Edward Tyus Cook. Disappointment, 1846 to 1847. There are private martyrs as well as burnt or drowned ones. Society, of course, does not know them, and family cannot, because our position to one another in our families is and must be like that of the moon to the earth. The moon revolves round her, moves with her, never leaves her. Yet the earth never sees but one side of her. The other side remains forever unknown. Florence Nightingale in a Notebook of 1847-49 to 49. A poet of our time has counted disappointment's dry and bitter root among the ingredients of the right mother milk to the tough hearts that pioneer their kind. If it indeed be so, Florence Nightingale was well nurtured. The spiritual experiences and speculations recorded in the last chapter worked round to a justification, as we have seen, of her chosen plan of life. Religion thus brought no consolation for the failure of her scheme to escape in December 1845. My misery and vacuity afterwards, she wrote in an autobiographical retrospect, were indescribable. All my plans have been wrecked, she wrote at the time, and my hopes destroyed and yet without any visible, any material change. She faced the new year and its life on the old lines in a mood of depression which, with some happier intervals, was to grow deeper and more intense during the next few years. She did not, however, abandon her ideal. We shall see in subsequent chapters that neither foreign travel distracted her from it, nor did opportunities for another kind of life allure her from the chosen path. The way was dark before her. The goal might never be reached, she often thought, in this present sphere, but she felt increasingly that only in a life of nursing or other service to the afflicted could her being find its end and scope. The longer I live, she wrote in her diary, June 22, 1846, the more I feel as if all my being was gradually drawing to one point and if I could be permitted to return and accomplish that in another being, if I may not in this, I should need no other heaven. I could give up the hope of meeting and living with those I have loved, and nobody knows how I love, and been separated from here, if it would please God to give me, with a nearer consciousness of his presence, the task of doing this in the real life. Meanwhile, she pursued her inquiries, now that the fruits of Florence Nightingale's pioneer work have been gathered, and that nursing is one of the recognized occupations for gentlewomen. It is not altogether easy to realize the difficulties which stood in her way. The objections were moral and social, rooted to large measure in conventional ideas. 
gentle women it was felt would be exposed if not to danger and temptations at least to undesirable and unfitting conditions it was as if i had wanted to be a kitchen maid she said in later years nothing is more tenacious than a social prejudice but the prejudice was in part founded on very intelligible reasons and in part was justified by the level of the nursing profession at the time these are considerations to which full weight must be allowed both in justice to those who opposed miss nightingale's plans and in order to understand her own courage and persistence the idea was widely prevalent at the time that for certain cases in hospital practice a modest woman was from the nature of things unsuited to act as a nurse mr nightingale who desired to do what was right by his daughter made many inquiries and consulted many friends there is a letter to him from a brighton doctor arguing against the prevalent belief and maintaining stoutly that women of a proper age and character are not unfit for such cases age habit and office give the mind a different turn but the whole of this letter shows a degree of broad-mindedness with regard to the education and sphere of women which was in advance of the average opinion at the time and in any case whether women were fit or unfit by nature it was certain that many perhaps most of the women actually engaged in nursing were unfit by character and that a refined gentlewoman who joined the profession might thus find herself in unpleasant surroundings we shall have to consider this matter more fully in a subsequent chapter here it will suffice to say that though there were better managed hospitals and worse managed yet there was a strong body of evidence to show that hospital nurses had opportunities which they freely used for putting the bottle to their lips when so disposed and that other evils were more or less prevalent also reports from paris and its famous schools of medicine and surgery were no better one who had been through it said that life at the maternité was very coarse in the clinique obstétricale at the école de médecin the élèves have the reputation of being pretty generally the students mistresses the difficulties in the way of a refined woman who sought to obtain access to the best training were very great dr elizabeth blackwell a pioneer among woman doctors in america told miss nightingale of a young girl who had planned as the only feasible way of studying surgery in paris to don male attire pantaloons will be accepted as a token she is in earnest while a petticoat is always a flag for intrigue she has a deep voice and i think will pass muster exceedingly well among a set of young students but i shall be quite sorry for her to sacrifice a mass of beautiful dark auburn hair what a strange age we live in what singular sacrifices and extraordinary actions are required of us in the service of truth an age of reform is a stirring exciting one but it is not the most beautiful the more she heard of the worst the more was florence nightingale resolved to make things better but the more her parents heard the greater and the more natural was their repugnance somebody must do the rough pioneer work of the world but one can understand how the parents of an attractive daughter for whom their own life at home seemed to them to open many possibilities of comfortable happiness came to desire that in this case the somebody should be somebody else miss nightingale herself was so much impressed by the difficulties and dangers in the way of women nurses that she was inclined at first to the idea that the admission of gentle women into the calling could best be secured either in special hospitals connected with some religious institution or in general hospitals under cover of some religious bond i think wrote monckton milne to his wife that florence always much distrusted the sisterhood matter and such was the case her inner thought was that no vow was needed other than the nurse's own fitness for the calling and devotion to it but she was engaged in the crusade of a pioneer and had to consider what was practically expedient and immediately feasible as well as what was theoretically reasonable 
Dr. Blackwell was of the same opinion. She did not like religious orders in themselves. They only become beautiful, she said, as an expedient, a temporary condition, an antidote to present evils. Miss Nightingale was therefore intensely interested in the institution for deaconesses, with this hospital, school, and penitentiary, which a Protestant minister, Pastor Theodore Fleidner, had established some years before at Kaiserswerth. Her family were great friends with the Bunsens, and the Baron had sent Florence one of Pastor Fleidner's annual reports. Her interest in it was twofold. It was the kind of institution to which Protestant mothers might not object to send their daughters. It was also in some sort a school of nursing, where whatever wider scope might afterwards be attainable, gentle women could serve an apprenticeship to the calling. Flo, wrote her sister to a friend in 1848, is exceedingly full of the hospital institutions of Germany, which she thinks so much better than ours. Do you know anything of the great establishment at Kaiserswerth, where the schools, the reform place for the wicked, and a great hospital are all under the guidance of the deaconesses? Two years before June 1846, Florence herself had written to Miss Hilary Bonham Carter, begging her to ask Mrs. Jameson about the German lady she knew who, not being a Catholic, could not take upon herself the vows of a sister of charity, but who obtained permission from the physician of the hospital of her town to attend the sick there and perform all the duties which the Sieur do at Dublin and the Hotel Dieu, and who had been there fifteen years when Mrs. Jameson knew her. I do not want to know her name if it is a secret, but only if she has extended it further into anything like a Protestant sisterhood. If she had any plans of that sort which should embrace women of an educated class, and not, as in England, merely women who would be servants if they were not nurses. How she disposed of the difficulties of surgeons making love to her, and of living with the women of indifferent character who generally make the nurses of hospitals, as it appears she was quite a young woman when she began, and these are the difficulties which vows remove, which one sees nothing else can. Perhaps it was as a result of these inquiries that Florence Nightingale became acquainted, through Baron von Bunsen, with the institution at Kaiserswerth, though as appears from a letter given below, Madame Mole had also sent her some information about it, it is certain that by the autumn of 1846 she was in possession of its reports and that the place had become the home of her heart. During these years she was also quietly pursuing studies on medical and sanitary subjects. Section 2 With such thoughts in her mind, the routine of home life became more than ever empty and distasteful. Here are two typical extracts from her diary of 1846. Lee Hurst, July 7. What is my business in this world, and what have I done this last fortnight? I have read The Daughter at Home to Father and two chapters of Macintosh, a volume of Sybil to Mama. Learnt seven tunes by heart, written various letters, written with Papa, paid eight visits, done company, and that is all. Emily, October 7. What have I done the last three months? Oh, happy, happy six weeks at the Hearst, where, from July 15 to September 1, I had found my business in this world. My heart was filled. My soul was at home. I wanted no other heaven. May God be thanked, as he never yet has been thanked for that glimpse of what it is to live. Now, for the last five weeks, my business has been much harder. They don't know how weary this way of life is to me, this table d'hote of people. When I want a frischung, I read a little of the Jahres Berichte über die Diakonisse Anstalt in Geisworth. There is my home. There are my brothers and sisters all at work. There my heart is, and there I trust one day will be my body, whether in this state or in the next in Germany or in England, I do not care. The happy six weeks at Lee Hurst were a time, as appears from the letter to Miss Nicholson already given, page 53, when she found opportunity to do much sick visiting. One's days pass away, she added in the same letter, like a shadow. 
and leave not a trace behind how we spend hours that are sacred in things that are profane which we choose to call necessities and then say we cannot to our father's business at embley the opportunities for work among the poor were less favorable the distances were greater florence interested herself so far as she was able in the school at wellow and amongst her papers of eighteen forty six there is an able discussion of the defects of elementary education as she had there observed them but the distractions were many there was a constant round of company at home and as has been said before the migration of the family between london leehurst and embley were fatal to concentration of effort section three the year eighteen forty seven was one of much social movement in miss nightingale's life in the spring she was in london doing the exhibitions and hearing jenny lind but it really requires a new language to define her then she went with her parents to the meeting of the british association at oxford where adams and le verrier the twin discoverers of neptune were the lines of the day she wrote many lively accounts of the meeting to her friends from which a passage or two may be given here we are in the midst of loveliness and learning for never anything so beautiful as this place is looking now my dearest have i seen abroad or at home with its flowering acacias in the midst of its streets of palaces i saunter about the churchyards and gardens by myself before breakfast and wish i were a college man i wish you could see the astronomical section de verrier and de adams sitting on either side of the president like a pair of turtle doves cooing at their joint star and holding it between them we work hard chaplet eight to that glorious service at new college such an anthem yesterday morning and that quiet cloister where no one goes i brought home a white rose to-day to dry in remembrance sections from eleven to three then colleges or blenheim till dinner-time then lecture at eight in the radcliffe library and philosophical tea and muffins at somebody's afterwards the fowlers hamilton grays barlows and selves are the muffins wheatstone hallam chevalier mockton milne and some of the great guns occasionally are the philosophy and so forth and so forth with particulars of church every two hours on sunday and a luncheon with buckland and his famous menagerie at christ church when florence petted a little bear and her father drew her away but mr milne mesmerized it and one thing more she adds mr hallam's discovery that gladstone is the b six 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 in the revelations came to him one day by inspiration in the athenaeum after he had tried pusey and newman and found that they wouldn't do miss nightingale paid many visits during the same year with her father they went for instance to lord sherborne whose daughter mrs plunkett became a great friend of hers and they spent a couple of days with lord lovelace lady lovelace byron's daughter conceived a great admiration for florence nightingale which found expression in the verses already quoted it was in this year that miss clark married her old admirer mr mole florence's letter of congratulations was not without significance upon the state of her own feelings as will be seen in a later chapter embley october thirteenth eighteen forty seven dearest friend to think that you are now a two months wife and i have never written to tell you that your piece of news gave me more joy than i ever felt in all my life except once no not even excepting that once because that was a game of blind man's bluff and in your case you knew even as you were known i had the news on a sunday from dear jew and it was indeed a sunday joy and i kept it wholly though not like the city which was to be in cotton to be looked at only on sundays as has often been said we must all take sappho's leap one way or other before we attain to her repose though some take it to death and some to marriage and some again to a new life even in this world which of them to the better part god only knows popular prejudice gives it in favour of marriage should we not look upon marriage less as an absolute blessing than as a remove into another and higher class of this great schoolroom a promotion for it is a promotion which creates new duties before which the coward sometimes shrinks and gives new lessons of more advanced knowledge with more advanced powers to meet them and a much clearer power of vision to read them in your new development of life i take dearest friend a right fervent interest 
and bless you with a right heartfelt and earnest love. We are only just returned to Embley, after having passed through London on our way from Derbyshire. News have I none excepting financial, for no one could talk of anything in London excepting the horrid quantity of failures in the city by which all England has suffered more or less. Why didn't I write before? Because I thought you would rather be let alone at first and that you were on your travels. And now for my confessions, I utterly abjure, I entirely renounce and abhor all that I may have said about Mr. Robert Mole, not because he is now your brother-in-law, but because I was so moved and touched by the letters which he wrote after your marriage to Mama. So anxious they were to know more about you, so absorbed in the subject, to so eager to prove to us that his brother was such a man, he was quite sure to make you happy. And I have not said half enough either upon that score, not anything that I feel how to marry is no impersonal verb upon which I am to congratulate you, but depends entirely upon the accusative case which it governs, upon which I do wish you heartfelt and trusting joy. In single life, the stage of the present and the outward world is so filled with phantoms, the phantoms not unreal, though intangible, of vague remorse, tears dwelling on the threshold of everything we undertake alone, dissatisfaction with what is and restless yearnings for what is not, cravings after a world of wonders, which is, but is like the chariot and horses of fire, which Elisha's frightened servant could not see till his eyes were opened. The stage of actual life gets so filled with these that we are almost pushed off the boards and are conscious of only just holding on to the footlights by our chins. Yet even in that very inconvenient position, love still precedes joy as in St. Paul's list. For love laying to sleep these phantoms by assuring us of a love so great that we may lay aside all care for our own happiness, not because it is of no consequence to us, whether we are happy or not, as Carlyle says, but because it is of so much consequence to another, gives that leisure frame to our mind which opens it at once to joy. But how impertinently I ramble on. You see a penitent before you. Don't say, I see an impudent scoundrel before me. But when thou seest, and what's more, when thou readest, forgive. You will not let another year pass without our seeing you. Mr. Mole gives us hopes in this letter to Jude, that you won't, that you will come to England next year for many months, then, dearest friend, we will have a long talk out. If not, we really must come to Paris, and then I shall see you, and see the deaconesses, too, whom you so kindly wrote to me about, but of whom I have never heard half enough. The Brace Bridges are at home. She rejoices as much as we did over your event. Partha is going at the end of November, to do officiating verger to a friend of ours on a like event. Her prospects are likewise so satisfactory that I can rejoice and sympathize under any form she may choose to marry in. Otherwise, I think that the day will come when it will surprise us as much to see people dressing up for a marriage as it would to see them put on a fine coat for the sacrament. Why should the sacrament or oath of marriage be less sacred than any other? The letter goes on to speak of a visit recently paid to Mrs. Archer Clive, well known in her day as the authoress of Poems by V and of Paul Farrell, a sensational novel of some force, a lady whose powers of heart and mind were housed in an infirm body. Miss Nightingale admired her talents and her character and valued her friendship. But new friendships and varied interests did not bring satisfaction to Miss Nightingale. She was still constantly bent on pursuing a vocation of her own, her parents caught eagerly at an opportunity which offered itself at the end of this year, 1847, for giving, as they hoped, a new turn to her thoughts. End of Disappointment Part 1, Chapter 5 of the Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1 by Edward Tyus Cook. Chapter 5, A Winter in Rome and After, 1847-1848. 
eighteen forty seven to eighteen forty nine six months of rome and happiness florence nightingale eighteen forty eight it was an event of some importance in the nightingale family when florence set out with mr and mrs bracebridge in the autumn of eighteen forty seven to spend the winter at rome the attraction to her was the society of Mrs. Bracebridge, the friend of whom she spoke as her ethereal. Moreover, the mental unrest from which Florence constantly suffered at home was beginning to tell upon her health. All that I want to do in life, she wrote to her cousin Hilary, in explaining the motive of the tour, depends upon my health, which I am told a winter in Rome will establish forever. She took the foreign tour as a tonic to enable her the better to fulfill her vocation, by her parents and her sister the tour was regarded as a tonic which might divert her from it they hoped that foreign travel would distract her thoughts and dispel what they perhaps considered morbid fancies she would enjoy pleasant companionship she would see famous and beautiful things she might return converted to the more comfortable belief that her duty lay in accepting life as she found it the point of view comes out clearly enough in a letter from her sister to miss bonham carter embley october eighteen forty seven it is a very great pleasure to think of her with such a companion one who she says lives always with the best part of her one who has all the sense and discretion and the warm-hearted sympathy and the quick enjoyment and the taste and the affection which will most give her happiness who will value her and take care of her and do her all the good mentally and bodily one can fancy Yes, dear, God is very good to provide such a pleasant time, and it will rest her mind, I think, entirely from wearing thoughts that all men have at home when their duties weigh much on their consciences, while she will feel she is wasting nothing, for Mrs. Bracebridge has not been at all well, and Flo will feel herself a comfort and a help to her, I hope, for I know she is a great one. Though it is but for so short a time, yet it seems to me a great event, the solemn first launching her into life and my heart is very full of many feelings but yet the joy is greatest by an incalculable deal for one does not see how harm can come to her yet when one loves a great deal one cannot but be a little anxious it is so pretty to see papa wandering over the big map of rome remembering every corner and mamma over Peronese, and both over all the fair things that dwell there as though they had just left them and florence herself did find comfort and pleasure in the tour but it was destined not to divert but to strengthen her purpose as also to lay a train of circumstances which was to lead her to the crimea florence and her companions reached paris on october twenty seventh took ship at marseilles for civita vecchia and stayed in rome in the via st bastinello number no. eight from the beginning of november till march twenty nine eighteen forty eight florence entered heartily into all the pursuits and occupations of elegant tourists in rome she studied the ruins explored the catacombs copied inscriptions visited the churches and galleries spent a morning in gibson's studio and another in overbeck's collected plants in the Colosseum, rode in the campagna and bought brooches mosaics and roman pearls her father had drawn out a program of famous sights and pretty walks and drives, and the methodical Florence duly ticked them off on the list. She read her own thoughts and aspirations into many of the works of art. She greatly admired the Apollo Belvedere, seeing in it the type of triumphant free will. We can never lose the recollection of our poor selves while we still do things with difficulty, while we are still uncertain whether we shall succeed or not. The triumph of success may be great and delightful, but the divine life, eternal life, is when to will is to do, when the will is the same thing as the act, and therefore the act is unconscious. Of the Jupiter of the capital, again she says, Jupiter is that perfect grace in power where the divine will, pure from exertion, speaks, and it is done but what chiefly interested her what really impressed her mind and stimulated her imagination was the genius of michelangelo to her sister december seventeenth eighteen forty seven o oh, my dearest i have had such a day my red dominical my golden letter the fifteenth of december is its name 
and of all my days in rome this has been the most happy and glorious think of a day alone in the sistine chapel with sigma selina mrs bracebridge quite alone without custode without visitors looking up into that heaven of angels and prophets i did not think that i was looking at pictures but straight into heaven itself and that the faults of the representation and the blackening of the colours were the dimness of my own earthly vision which would only allow me to see obscurely indistinctly what was there in all its glory to be known even as i was known if mortal eyes and understandings were cleared from the mists which we have wilfully thrown around them there is daniel opening his windows and praying to the god of his fathers three times a day in defiance of fear you see that young and noble head like an eagle's disdaining danger those glorious eyes undazzled by all the honours of babylon then comes isaiah but he is so divine that there is nothing but his own fifty-third chapter will describe him he is the isaiah the grossa umbacanta of the comfort ye comfort ye my people i was rather startled at first by finding him so young which was not my idea of him at all while the others are old but m angelo knew him better it is the perpetual youth of inspiration the vigour and freshness ever new ever living of that eternal spring of thought which is typed under that youthful face genius has no age while mind zechariah has no youth next to isaiah comes the delphic sibyl the most beautiful the most inspired of all the sibyls here but the distinction which m angelo has drawn even between her and the prophets is so interesting there is a security of inspiration about isaiah he is listening and he is speaking that which we hear we declare unto you there is an anxiety an effort to hear even about the delphian she is not quite sure there is an uncertainty a wistfulness in her eyes she expects to be rewarded rather in another stage than this for her struggle to gain the prize of her high calling to reach to the unknown that isaiah knows already there is no uncertainty as to her feeling of being called to hear the voice but she fears that her earthly ears are heavy and gross and corrupt the meaning of the heavenly words i cannot tell you how affecting this anxious look of her far-reaching eyes is to the poor mortals standing on the pavement below while the prophets ride secure on the storm of inspiration i feel these things to be part of the word of god of the latter to heaven the word of god is all by which he reveals his thought all by which he makes a manifestation of himself to men it is not to be narrowed and confined to one book or one nation and no one can have seen the sistine without feeling that he has been very near to god that he will understand some of his words better for ever after and that michelangelo one of the greatest of the sons of men when one looks at the dome of st peter's on the one hand and the prophets and martyrs on the other has received as much of the breath of god and has done as much to communicate it to men as any seer of old he has performed that wonderful miracle of giving form to the breath of god wonderful whether it is done by words colours or hard stones the thoughts and emotions which have been suggested by the contemplation of the vault of the sistine chapel are countless none are more enthusiastic than those which it inspired in florence nightingale and few have been so discriminating it is at once the privilege and a mark of consummate works of art to be capable of as many meanings as they may find of competent spectators each man brings to the study of them the insight of which he is capable and each perchance finds in them some image of himself or of his own experience there are few moments most probably florence nightingale went on to say which we shall carry with us through the gate of death few recollections which will stand the eternal light she felt as she came out of the sistine chapel that her first sight of michael angelo's stupendous work would be one of those few for her we may surmise that the wistful uncertainty which she found in the face of the delphic sibyl had especially appealed to her in its truth to life as she had experienced it conscious as she was of a call from god 
conscious also as she could not but have been of great powers and yet doubtful whether on this side of the gate of death it would be given to her to interpret the divine voice aright she retained to the end of her life the same reverential feeling for michael angelo she had photographs and engravings of the sistine ceiling hanging in her rooms and she sent some framed and inscribed photographs of the symbolical figures on the medici tombs to hang at embley on the little private staircase where her father fell and died those at her home were bequeathed specifically in her will the afternoon of the day on which the revelation of the sistine chapel came to her was spent by florence and her friend in walking up monte mario to enjoy the famous view from the villa Molini, not then as now included within a fort we spent an exquisite half-hour she wrote mooning or rather sunning about the whole campagna and city lying at our feet the sea on one side like a golden laver below the declining sun the windings of the tiber and the hills of lucretilis on the other with frascati tivoli tusculum on their cypress sides for in that clear atmosphere you could see the very cypresses of messina's villa at tivoli with long stripes of violet and pomegranate coloured light sweeping over the plain like waves one stone pine upon the edge of our Molini hill and rome the fallen babylon like a dead city beneath no sound of multitudes ascending but the only life these great crimson lights and shadows for here the shadow of a red light is violet like the carnation coloured wings of angels themselves invisible flapping over the plain and leaving this place behind them we rushed down as fast as we could for the sun was setting and we reached st peter's just as the doors were going to close we had the great church all to ourselves the tomb of st peter wreathed with lights it felt like the times when a christian knight watched by his arms before some great enterprise at the holy sepulchre and one shadowy white angel we could see through the windows over the great door and do you know he quite made us startle as he stood there in the gloaming of course it was the marble statue on the façade and there were workmen still laughing and talking at the extreme end and their sounds as they were repeated under the long vaults were like the gibbering of devils and their lanthorns as they wavered along close to the ground were like corpse lights i thought of saint anthony and holy knights and their temptations and at last the sacristan took us out of that vast solemn dome through a tomb and we glided into the silvery moonlight and walked home over ponte sant'angelo where i made a little invocation to saint michael to help me to thank for why the protestants should shut themselves out in solitary pride from the communion of saints in heaven and in earth i never could understand and so ended this glorious day the obsession of rome which sooner or later comes upon every intelligent visitor to the eternal city dated in the case of florence nightingale from this golden letter day she surmounted the sense of confusion which sometimes oppresses the traveller i do not feel she wrote though pagan in the morning jew in the afternoon and christian in the evening anything but a unity of interest in all these representations to know god we must study him as much in the pagan and jewish dispensations as in the christian though that is the last and most perfect manifestation and this gives unity to the whole one continuous thread of interest to all these pearls section two the politics of modern italy interested her no less than the ruins of ancient rome or the monuments of medieval art she had met many italian refugees both at geneva and in the salon of madame mole in paris and was a whole-hearted enthusiast in the cause of italian freedom her present visit to rome synchronized with that curious and short-lived episode in the struggle during which pio nono was playing the ineffectual tragedy of liberal catholicism all rome seemed seized with sympathy for the cities beyond the papal states which were fighting for liberty and within the states themselves pio nono's offerings of mild benevolence suffice to call forth floods of ecstatic demonstrative italian humanity torchlight processions and crowds kneeling at his feet 
Miss Nightingale saw the Roman nobles, Prince Corsini, Prince Gaetano, and others presiding at patriotic altars, which had been set up in the public squares for the receipt of gifts in money and in jewelry. She heard the famous Father Gavazzi preach the crusade in the Colosseum. She cheered as the tricolor of Italy was hoisted on the capital. I certainly was born, she wrote to her cousin Hilary, to be a tag rag and bob tail, for when I hear of a popular demonstration, I am nothing better than a ragamuffin. She heard the rumble of a distant drum and rushed up for mr bracebridge and he and she broke their own windows because they were not illuminated stayed to see the torchlight procession of patriots singing the hymn to pianono and were rewarded by the crowd crying god save the queen as they passed the english milord and his companion very touching she said though royalty was the very last thing i was thinking of for at this time as she often avowed in her letters, her sympathies were republican. When this memorable year began with all its revolutions, she wrote later to Madame Mole after disillusion had come, I thought that it was the kingdom of heaven coming under the fate of a republic. But alas, things have shown that more of us must slowly ripen to angels here before the regime of the angels, that is, the kingdom of heaven, will begin for the moment everything seemed radiant she recorded with pleasure in february that a deputation of romans had gone up to the pope to express their complete confidence in him in her notebooks she collected particulars of his life and character and when in march he granted what can only be called a sort of a constitution she wrote to madame mole my dear santo padre seems doing very well he has given up his temporal power no man took it from him he laid it down of himself i think that he will reign in history as the only prince who ever did and that his character is nearer christ's than any i ever heard of history will hardly confirm this saying but if miss nightingale's words seem ill-balanced in the light of subsequent events let it be remembered that as mr trevelyan says the cult of pianono was for some months the religion of italy and of liberals and exiles all over the world even garibaldi in montevideo and mazzini in london shared the enthusiasm of the hour a year later when the roman republic had been declared and the pope had fled and the french troops besieged rome on his behalf miss nightingale had only pity for pianono her anger she reserved for the french cannibals for the one republic that was devouring another i must exhale my rage and indignation she wrote in a diary june thirty eighteen forty nine before i have lost all notions of absolute right and wrong it makes my heart bleed that the french nation the nation above all others capable of an ideal of aspiring after the abstract right should have lent itself to such a brutal crime against its own brother one may say its own offspring for the roman republic sprang from the french it is purest cannibalism this breaks my heart when i think of that afternoon at villa Melini now occupied by a french general of rome bathed in her crimson and purple shadows lying at our feet and saint michael spreading his wings over all the angel of regeneration as we thought him then my eyes fill with tears but he will be the angel of regeneration yet the french she said might reduce the city and occupy it but the heroic defence of the republic will have raised the romans in the moral scale and in their own esteem they would never sink back to what they had been sooner or later rome would be free she was especially indignant at the talk which she heard on all sides in cultivated society at home about the vandalism of the romans in exposing their precious monuments of art to assault she loved those monuments as we have seen but if the defence of rome against the french required it she would have been ready to see them all levelled to the ground they must carry out their defence to the last she cried i should like to see them fight the streets inch by inch till the last man dies at his barricade till st peter's is level with the ground till the vatican is blown into the air then would this be the last of such brutal not housebreakings but city breakings then and not till then would europe do justice to france as a thief and a murderer and a similar crime be rendered impossible for all ages if i were in rome i should be the first to fire the sistine turning my head aside and michelangelo would cry well done as he saw his work destroyed 
it was not only in relation to the restraints of conventional domesticity that florence nightingale was a rebel section three during her own stay in rome however there was something which interested her more than roman politics or roman monuments it was the philanthropic work of a convent school every visitor to rome knows the trinita de monti the flight of steps between the church and the piazza di spagna is celebrated alike for its own beauty and for the flower girls and women in peasant costume who frequent it the church itself contains many fine works of art and the choral service is one of the attractions of ecclesiastical rome the neighborhood is rich in artistic and literary associations florence nightingale had sympathetic eyes and ears for all these things but what attracted her most was the convent attached to the church with its school for girls and in another part of the city its orphanage she was broad-minded as we have seen in an earlier chapter in relation to church creeds it was by works not faith or at any rate by faith issuing in works that she weighed the churches it was characteristic of the thoroughness of her mental character that during this sojourn in rome she made a methodical study of roman doctrine and ritual among her papers and notebooks belonging to this time there are careful analyses of the theory of indulgence of the real presence of the rosary and so forth she made too a careful collation of the latin breviary with the english prayer book she summed up her comparative study of the churches in this generalization the great merit of the catholic church its assertion of the truth that god still inspires mankind as much as ever its great fault its limiting this inspiration to itself the great merit of protestantism its proclamation of freedom of conscience within the limits of the scriptures its great fault its erection of the bible into a master of the soul her deep sense of the self-responsibility of every human soul kept her free from any inclination to roman doctrine but she was profoundly impressed by the practical beneficence of roman sisterhoods an example of such beneficence she found in the school and orphanage of the dame du sacre coeur she had picked up a poor girl called philichetta sensi and procured her admission as a free boarder paying for her care and education for many years she formed a warm attachment to the lady superior the madre saint colomba she studied the organization rules and methods of the large school and for ten days she went into retreat in the convent her intercourse with the madre saint colomba of whose talk and spiritual experiences she made full and detailed notes made a very deep impression on her mind she studied rules and organization but as in all her studies she was seeking a motive as well as and indeed more than a method many years later a friend wrote to her it seems to me that the greatest want among nurses is devotion i use the word in a very wide sense meaning that state of mind in which the current of desire is flowing towards one high end this does not presuppose knowledge but it very soon attains it this was a profound conviction of her own often expressed as we shall hear in her addresses and letters of exhortation in later years what she set herself to study at the trinita de monti was the secret of devotion she made notes of the lady superior's exhortations of the spiritual exercises which were enjoined upon novices of the forms and discipline of self-examination she sought to extract the secret and to apply it to the inculcation of the highest kind of service to man as the service of god for many years the thought in her mind was to be the foundation of some distinctive order or sisterhood and though in the end she came to be glad that she had not done this she never abandoned the high ideal which was behind her thought nor though in some ways and in some cases she came to be disillusioned about nursing sisterhoods did she ever cease to speak with admiration of what she had seen and learnt in some of them she thought more often and with more affectionate remembrance about the spirit of the best catholic sisterhoods than of kaiserworth or indeed of anything else in her professional experience in such studies upon the trinita de monti in the winter of eighteen forty seven to forty eight she was taken as she said in a note of self-examination out of all interests that fostered her vanity 
it was her happiest new year the most entire and unbroken freedom from dreaming i ever had she wrote at a later time oh how happy i was and so again looking back after twenty years she wrote i never enjoyed any time in my life so much as my time at rome section four another incident of miss nightingale's sojourn in rome was destined though she knew it not at the time to have a far-reaching influence upon her career among the english visitors who spent the winter of eighteen forty seven to forty eight in rome were mr and mrs sidney herbert mr herbert had already been secretary at war under peel a post to which he was afterwards to return under aberdeen the resignation of peel's cabinet in eighteen forty six released mr herbert from official work later in the year he married a lady with whom he had been long acquainted elizabeth Acourt, daughter of general charles ash Acourt, and in the following year he and his wife set out for a long continental tour mr and mrs bracebridge were friends of the herberts and thus florence nightingale made their acquaintance in rome in her retrospect she specially recalled the beginning there of her friendship with sidney herbert under the dear bracebridge's wing compatriots who meet in this way in any foreign resort are apt to see a good deal of each other and from this winter dates the beginning of a friendship which was to be a governing factor in the life of florence nightingale sidney herbert when they met in galleries or at soirees or rode together in the campagna must have been struck by miss nightingale's marked abilities and for mrs herbert she formed an affectionate attachment she noted the great kindness the desire of love the magnanimous generosity of her new friend mr and mrs herbert saw much of archdeacon manning the future cardinal who was also spending the winter in rome and miss nightingale was on friendly terms with him this also was an acquaintance which had some influence on her future career sidney herbert aided by the ready sympathy of his wife was devoting much thought now liberated from official duties to schemes of benevolence among the poor on his estates he felt strongly the disadvantage at which the poor were placed in being compelled after illness and perhaps after undergoing painful operations to return in the earliest stage of convalescence without rest or change to their accustomed labor he was full of a scheme for a convalescent home and cottage hospital such as is now no rarity but was then almost unknown and it can be imagined with what zest miss nightingale shared his thoughts one of the first things which she records in her diary after return from the continent is an expedition with mrs sidney herbert to set up her convalescent home at charmouth but this was only a passing incident and return to the habitual home life after the distraction of foreign travel left her no more contented than before on her return to london in the early summer of eighteen forty eight she sent her friends occasionally the talk of the town to madame mole july twenty sixth eighteen forty eight in london there have been the usual amount of charity balls charity concerts charity bazaars whereby people bamboozle their consciences and shut their eyes nevertheless there does not seem the slightest prospect of a revolution here why it would be hard to say as england is surely the country where luxury has reached its height and poverty its depth perhaps it is our poor law perhaps the strength of our middle class perhaps a greater degree of sympathy between the rich and poor which is the conservative principle lord ashley had a chartist deputation with him the other day who stayed to tea and talked with him for five hours that a man should ride in a carriage and have twenty thousand a year is contrary to the laws of nature said their leader and slapped his leg i could show you if you would go with me to-night said lord ashley people who would say to you that a man should go in broadcloth and wear a shirt-pin pointing to the chartist's shirt is contrary to the laws of nature the chartist was silent and it was the only thing i said says lord ashley after arguing with them for five hours which made the least impression her acquaintance with lord ashley afterwards lord shaftesbury brought her in touch with ragged school work but societies grew more and more distasteful to miss nightingale she explained the reasons in a letter to her aunt hannah why could she not smile and be gay while yet biding her time and not forsaking her ultimate ideals 
It was, she said, because she hated God to hear her laugh, as if she had not repented of her sin. There is something obviously morbid in such words, and they might be multiplied indefinitely, if there were good reason for doing so, from her letters, diaries, and notebooks. The sins of which she most often convicted herself were hypocrisy and vanity. She prayed to be delivered from the desire of producing an effect. That was the vanity, and it was hypocrisy because she was playing a part, responding to friend's conception of her, though all the while her heart was really set on other things and her true life was being lived elsewhere. The morbidness was a symptom of a mind at war with its surroundings. Then again the kind aunt reminded her in the spirit of George Herbert that anything and everything may be done to the glory of God. But Miss Nightingale at this time was deep in the study of political economy, and can it be to the glory of God, she asked, when there is so much misery among the poor, which we might be curing instead of living in luxury? Section 5. In the autumn of 1848, an opportunity occurred which promised the realization of the dearest wish of her heart. But once more she was doomed to disappointment. Her mother and sister had been advised to go to Carlsbad for the cure. Monsieur and Madame Mole were to be at Frankfurt, and they were all to meet in that city. Frankfurt is near to Kaiserswerth, and Florence was to be allowed to go there. But at the very moment, disturbances broke out in Frankfurt, and the whole plan was abandoned. I'm not going to consign to paper for your benefit, she wrote to Madame Mole, October 1848, all the cursings and swearings which relieved my disappointed feelings, for, oh, what a plan of plans I had made out for myself. All that I most wanted to do at Kaiserswerth, Brussels and company, lay for the first time within reach of my mouth, and the right plum has dropped. Florence accompanied her mother to the curate Malvern instead, where, with many prayers for humility under the will of God, she lived for several weeks, upon the dry and bitter fruit of disappointment. During the winter of 1848-49, Miss Nightingale saw something of Monsieur Guizot and his family. The minister had escaped to London after the fall of Louis-Philippe and was living in a modest house in Brompton. He found in Miss Nightingale a brave and sympathetic soul for whom great thoughts and great devotions had a serious attraction. During the next year, she found some congenial work in London. She inspected hospitals. She worked in ragged schools. She spoke of her little thieves at Westminster as her greatest joy in London. But these unconventional attractions of the London season set her all the more against the life of country houses. Ought not one's externals, she wrote in her diary, July the 2nd, 1849, to be as nearly as possible an incarnation of what life really is? Life is not a green pasture and a still water as our homes make it. Life is to some a forty days fasting, moral or physical, in the wilderness. To some it is a fainting under the carrying of the crop. To some it is a crucifixion. To all a struggle for truth, for safety. Life is seen in a much truer form in London than in the country. In an English country place, everything that is painful is so carefully removed out of sight, behind those fine trees to a village three miles off. In London, at all events, if you open your eyes, you cannot help seeing in the next street that life is not as it has been made to you. You cannot get out of a carriage at a party without seeing what is in the faces making the lane on either side and without feeling tempted to rush back and say, those are my brothers and sisters. She longed to rush back, to be able to go out freely into the slums to comfort some old woman who was dying unattended or rescue some child who was going astray untaught. But the proprieties prevented. It would never do, she was told, for a young woman in her station in life to go out in London without a servant. In the autumn of 1849, the distraction of another foreign tour was offered. Her parents and her sister hoped once more that Florence would return a different and a more comfortable woman. Those with whom we are cast into the nearest intimacy sometimes understand us least. End of A Winter in Rome and After 1847 to 1849
Part One, Chapter Six of The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One, by Edward Tyus Cook. Foreign Travel, Egypt and Greece. 1849 to 1850. When o'er the world we range, tis but our climate, not our mind, we change. Horace. In the autumn of 1849, Mr. and Mrs. Bracebridge, who were to spend some months in the East, again proposed that Miss Nightingale should travel with them, and again the offer was gladly accepted. Her sister was delighted. The expedition to Rome had not done what was hoped, but here was a second chance. The sister reported to her friends that Flo had taken tea with the Bunsons to receive the dernier mot on Egyptology, and that she was going out laden with learned books. Perhaps Florence would become absorbed in such studies and adopt a life of gracefully learned leisure. The literary temptation did, it is true, assail Florence but she put it behind her. The party started in October, bound for Egypt, where the winter was to be spent. Thence they were to proceed to Athens, where Mr. Bracebridge had property. The return journey in the summer of 1850 was to be made through Germany, and Kaiserswerth was to be visited. Florence, we may surmise, looked forward most to the last stage in the journey. On November 18th, the travelers landed at Alexandria. On the 27th, they reached Cairo. On December 4th, they started in a dahabia for the Nile voyage. The boat was christened in honor of Florence's sister. My work, she wrote, is making the pennant, blue bunting with swallow tail, a Latin red cross upon it, and parthenope in white tape. It has taken all my tape and a vast amount of stitches, but it will be the finest pennant on the river and my petticoats will joyfully acknowledge the tribute to sisterly affection, for sisterly affection in tape in Lower Egypt, let me observe, is worth having. They went up the river as far as Ipsambul, Abu Simbel, a little below Wadi Halfi. On the return journey they spent several days at Thebes. The letters which Florence sent home show that Egypt appealed strongly to her imagination, what struck her most was the solemnity of the country. Nothing ever laughs or plays. Everything is grown up and grown old. The letters are full, too, of Egyptology, for she had made tables of dynasties, copied plans of temples, and analyzed the leading ideas in Egyptian mythology as expounded by the best writers of the time. Abu Simbel, January seventeenth, 1850 I passed through other halls, till at last I found myself in a chamber in the rock, where sat, in the silence of an eternal night, four figures against the further end. I could see nothing more, yet I did not feel afraid as I did at Karnak, though I was quite alone in these subterranean halls, for the sublime expression of that judge of the dead had looked down on me, the incarnation of the goodness of the deity, as Osiris is, and I thought how beautiful the idea which placed him in the foremost hall, and then led the worshipper gradually on to the more awful attributes of the deity. For here, as I could dimly see through the darkness, set the creative power of the mind, Neph, the intellect, Amun, the concealed god, Phthah, the creator of the visible world, and Ra, the sustainer. Ra, the son to whom the temple is dedicated, I turned to go out and saw at the further end the golden sand glittering in the sunshine outside the top of the door, and the long sand hill sloping down from it to the feet of the innermost Osirides, which are left quite free. All but their pedestals looked like the waves of time gradually flowing in and covering up these imperishable genii, who have seen three thousand years pass over their heads and heed them not in the holiest place there where no sound ever reaches it is if you felt the sensible progress of time 
not by the tick of a clock as we measure time but by some spiritual pulse which marks to you its onward march not by its second nor its minute nor its hour hand but by its century hand i thought of the worshippers of three thousand years ago how they by this time have reached the goal of spiritual ambition have brought all their thoughts to serve god or the ideal of goodness how we stand there with the same goal before us only as distant as the star which a little later i saw rising exactly over that same sand hill in the centre of the top of the doorway but as sure and fixed how to them all other thoughts are now as nothing and the ideal we all pursue of happiness is one not because they have not probably sufferings like ours but because they no longer suggest any other thought but of doing god's will which is happiness i thought too three thousand years hence we might perhaps have attained and others would stand here and still those old gods would be sitting in the eternal twilight thebes february tenth eighteen hundred fifty the valley of the kings seems though within a mile of thebes as if one had arrived at the mountains of kaf beyond which are only creatures unknown to any but god so deep are the ravines so high and blue the sky so absolutely solitary and unearthly so utterly uninhabitable the place one look at that valley would give you more idea of the supernatural the gate of hades than all the descriptions sacred or profane what a moment it is the entering that valley where in those rocky caverns the vastness and the gloomy darkness of which are equally awful the kings of the earth lie each in his huge sarcophagus with the bodies of his chiefs each in their chamber about him and where about this time they are to return to find their bodies and resume their abode on earth if purified by their three thousand years of probation in a higher and better state if degraded in a lower i thought i met them at every turn in those long subterraneous galleries saw their shades rising from their shattered sarcophagi and advancing once more towards the light of day which shone like a star so distant and so faint at the end of that opening the dead were stirred up the chief ones of the earth while these pharaohs are perhaps now here again in the body their three thousand years having just elapsed to some of them that is if they have philosophized sincerely or together with philosophy have loved beautiful forms and if i were a pharaoh now i would choose the arab form and come back to help these poor people and i am going to-morrow to a tomb of rameses b c eleven hundred fifty to meet him and tell him so it was no wonder that miss nightingale pitied the poor people for the egypt in which she travelled was as mehemet ali the lion of the levant had left it she saw girls sold in the open slave market at from two pounds to nine pounds a head she heard how justice was sold to the highest bidder and everybody she noted seems to bastinado everybody else every man she noted further is a conscript for the army and mothers put out their children's right eye to save them from conscription till mehemet ali who was too clever for them had a one-eyed regiment who carried the musket on the left shoulder miss nightingale was fond of escaping from the dahabia in order to wander about the desert poking my own nose as she wrote home into all the villages and seeing for herself how these poor people lived they call me the wild ass of the wilderness snuffing up the wind because i am so fond of getting away egyptian impressions stayed long in her memory and they recurred to her thirty years later in connection with her indian studies as on her earlier visit to rome so now in egypt she utilized all such opportunities as came in her way for studying the work of religious sisterhoods at alexandria she passed her days she wrote much to my satisfaction as i had travelled with two sisters of st vincent de paul from paris to auxerre who gave me an introduction to the sisters here and i have spent a great deal of time with them in their beautiful schools 
and misericorde there are only nineteen of them but they seem to do the work of ninety roman numeral two in april eighteen hundred fifty miss nightingale went with her friends to athens their house was in eucharist street and florence slept in the library which opens on to a terrace looking upon the back of the acropolis she had little taste for the topographical research and nice distinctions between different masters of sculpture which absorb the interest of many modern travellers and students she was interested in broader speculations the soul of a people as expressed in their art was the object to which she directed her observation and around which she loved to let her imagination play in her notebooks and letters she discusses the spiritual conceptions embodied in the worship of the several greek gods she traces the symbols of greek mythology to their sources in greek scenery she pictures the genius of aeschylus her favorite tragedian preferred by her even to shakespeare or of sophocles developing in relation to local conditions and surroundings of the statues the pensive beauty of the sepulchral bas-reliefs most arrested her attention and in architecture she loved most the doric for its severity its simplicity its perfection of proportion its image of the ideal republic only a republican could have conceived it and it is sin for any other government to imitate it look at each column man i mean rearing its noble head yet none has a separate base each man stands upon the common base of his country look at the simplicity of the fluting of the capital no man thinks of his own adornment but only of the glory of the whole the fluting does not look like its ornament but its drapery i do love the old doric as if it was a person then comes the ionic light and elegant and airy it is true like the attic wit but somewhat luscious to the taste it soon palls the fluting is too laboured too semicircular like the people sitting in a semicircle to hear the wit of aristophanes it does not look as if it belonged to the column and that ridge between the flutes what is it doing there it looks like the interval while the next interlocutor is thinking of a repartee then that rich beating round the bass, like one of Euripides's choruses, which have nothing to do with the piece. Give me the Ionic to amuse me, but the Doric to interest me. The Corinthian is like the worship of Dionysus, like the illustration of nature by art, a bad conjunction, I think, which in any other hands would become art run mad, but modified by the exquisite artistic perceptions of the Greeks is exquisitely beautiful but it is not architecture the doric the ionic and the corinthian are the ethical the poetical and the aesthetic views of life but look at the workmanship of these things how mathematically exact it is the very poetry of number it was characteristic of the philosophical bent of her mind that she sought to refer the charm of the scenery to some general law athens june eighth i have been taking some lovely rides with mr hill on hymettus along the daphne road and to Cara. how lovely the scenery is would be difficult to describe and why it is so lovely i begin to think that it is the proportion and that there must be proportion in the things of nature as of art i am talking nonsense i believe but nobody minds me you know in the valleys of switzerland the height is too great for the width and it looks like a bottle in the valleys of egypt the width is too great for the height and it looks like a tray for this reason clouds are provided in switzerland and scotland the height would become intolerably out of proportion unless it were covered in at the top for this reason clear sky is in egypt or you would feel in a shelf but here where the clear sky is meant they say to be perpetual though I cannot say I have seen much of it since I came, the proportion observed has been perfect. The exact curve is always there, the exact slope which you want, and if a line were to change its place, you feel the effect would be spoilt. You feel towards it as to an architectural building. I believe that in this lies the great peculiarity of the Athenian views. 
otherwise for coloring i must declare i have seen nothing like the evenings of the campagna of the parthenon by moonlight she wrote that it was impossible that earth or heaven could produce anything more beautiful in other letters she dwells on the beauty of the view from lycabetus and the glory of the sunset from hymettus one day upon the acropolis she found some boys with a baby owl that had just fallen from its nest in the parthenon she bought it from them and kept it it used to travel in her pocket and live at embley roman numeral three public affairs in greece interested her also she had arrived in greek waters at the height of the pacifico crisis there had been a rupture between england and greece which threatened also the relations between england and france and which convulsed political parties at westminster over the claims of mr finlay the historian of modern greece and don pacifico a native of gibraltar lord palmerston had ordered the mediterranean fleet to the Piraeus to enforce the British claims, and Miss Nightingale was sitting beside Mr. Wise, the British minister at Athens, at dinner on board HMS Howe, when the submission of the Greek government was brought to him. Her home letters throw much light on the ins and outs of this affair, which, however, is now only remembered as the occasion of Lord Palmerston's vindication in the House of Commons, with its famous peroration about civis romanus sum miss nightingale now as earlier was a strong palmerstonian the friends of broadlands she wrote to her parents need never have been less uneasy for his reputation and if parliamentary success be a sufficient test she was entirely right she found herself again in the thick of political discussion on leaving greek waters her party sailed from athens on june seventeenth and went to Trieste by Corfu, that fairy island, she wrote, where every flower grows twice as big as it does anywhere else, and where no frost can touch the olive and the pomegranate. She and her parents were acquainted with Sir Henry Ward, then Lord High Commissioner of the Ionian Islands. Sir Henry, who had been an active liberal at home, had felt himself obliged to adopt sternly repressive measures in the islands. Miss Nightingale was opposed to his policy, as also to the British occupation. He invited her and her friends to the palace. She went to proffer excuses. He came out, said that I had often called him tyrant, and took me in his arms like a father, and stood over me in the character of tyrant, he said, till I had written a letter compelling them all to come, which he then sealed and I sent so the whole posse comitatus of us spent the day there they sending the carriage for us and i really glad to have seen what is my idea of eastern luxury the tyrant placed his accuser next to him at dinner deplored his false position and so forth and they made some sort of peace though not perhaps till miss nightingale had sought to bring him to a conviction of sin for his executions and arbitrary arrests for she was armed as her letters show now as ever with all the facts and figures marshalled in blue book precision roman numeral four her mind was interested in all these things but her heart was elsewhere wherever thou art said a famous statesman it is with the poor that thou shouldst live it was so with florence nightingale's inmost thoughts her greatest pleasure in athens was found in the society of the american missionaries mr and mrs hill who conducted a school and orphanage of mrs hill she wrote from heaven she comes in heaven she lives in charge of the mission school was a greek refugee from crete elizabeth kantaksaki and with her too florence nightingale formed a warm friendship elizabeth had lived an adventurous life before she found security at athens her father had fallen by a turkish bullet her mother had made a heroic escape from a turkish captor and the first years of the child's life were spent in the fastnesses of mount ida alas wrote miss nightingale how worthless my life seems to me by the side of these women a mood of great dejection appears in her diary of this time 
to which an attack of low fever no doubt contributed she could not find satisfaction in the interests of foreign travel she was tortured by unsatisfied longings which could find outlet only in a world of dreams an entry in her diary for june seventh is in these words grotto of the eumenides will this fury go on increasing till by degrees my mind is more and more taken off the outer world with all its claims and i am no longer able to command my attention at all miss nightingale and her friends landed at trieste at the end of june and thence made their way to dresden and berlin the pictures which most impressed her were raphael's sistine madonna and the reading magdalen then attributed to correggio a year later her mother and sister were at dresden and she enjoined them above all things to see the magdalen the queen of pictures how i feel that picture now she wrote to them august twenty sixth eighteen hundred fifty one dark wood behind sharp stones in front nothing to look back upon nothing to look forward to clinging to the present as she does to the book which beams bright light upon me oh what a history that picture contains in its little canvas and how well it hangs near that glorious sistine virgin all that woman might be all that she will be near what she is for it is not a magdalen in the common sense of the word or rather it is in the common sense of what woman commonly is not what we mean by a magdalen at dresden miss nightingale was still in much dejection i have never felt so bad she wrote july seventh the habit of living not in the present but in a future of dreams is gradually spreading over my whole existence it is rapidly approaching the state of madness when dreams become realities and now when the goal of kaiserswerth was near she felt almost unmanned almost inclined to turn back and follow another path it seemed to me now july tenth as if quiet with somebody to look for my coming back was all i wanted but this was only a moment of passing weakness at berlin her spirits revived for her vital interests were satisfied and she spent some days in inspecting the hospitals and other benevolent institutions on july thirty first she reached kaiserswerth i could hardly believe i was there she wrote in her diary with the feeling with which a pilgrim first looks on the Kidron, I saw the Rhine, dearer to me than the Nile. She stayed a fortnight with the pastor and his wife and the deaconesses, studying their institutions. Left Kaiserswerth, says the diary, August 13th, feeling so brave as if nothing could ever vex me again. She rejoined her friends at Dusseldorf. They stayed at Ghent actually for me to finish my M.S., august seventeenth finished my m s they read it mr bracebridge corrected it and sent it off august nineteenth next day they returned to england the manuscript was of the pamphlet describing the institution of kaiserswerth on the rhine which was issued anonymously soon after miss nightingale's return some notice of the pamphlet will be found in a later chapter in connection with her longer sojourn at kaiserswerth in eighteen hundred fifty one it was printed by the inmates of the ragged school at westminster in which she was interested she described in it the work of the deaconesses and ended with an appeal to english women to go and do likewise the fire burnt within her and she returned home more than ever resolved to consecrate her life to the service of the sick and sorrowful roman numeral five foreign travel it will thus be seen had worked no such cure had created no such diversion as her family desired their hope even their expectation was not unreasonable florence nightingale was a woman of learning and her foreign travels had stimulated her alike to research and to imaginative thought at home too during all the years of restless and unsatisfied yearning for some other life she had been a diligent reader and student she had a real gift for literary expression as her letters may already have indicated and as her later writings were to prove more decisively she had moreover the instinct for self-expression she was a constant letter-writer and note-taker 
she communed with herself not only in speechless thought but in written memoranda had another impulse not been stronger within her she might easily have become a literary woman of some distinction but though she was fond of writing for her own satisfaction she had a profound distrust of it as a substitute for action like one of george eliot's heroines she did not want to deck herself with knowledge to wear it loose from the nerves and blood that fed her action you ask me she had written to miss clark in eighteen hundred forty four why i do not write something i think what is not of the first class had better not exist at all and besides i had so much rather live than write writing is only a supplement for living would you have one go away and give utterance to one's feelings in a poem to appear price two guineas in the belle assemblée i think one's feelings waste themselves in words they ought all to be distilled into actions and into actions which bring results do you think a babe would ever learn to walk if it were to talk about its living in such strange times i must learn to use my legs and so on or do you think anybody ever did anything who did not go to it with a directness of purpose which prevented him from frittering away his impressions in words she was of ibsen's persuasion what is life a fighting in heart and in brain with trolls poetry that means writing doomsday accounts of our souls she held in great suspicion and dislike what she called the artist-like way of looking upon life it reduces all religions she said and most inward and spiritual feelings into a sort of magic lantern with which to make play for the amusement of the company her mother used to praise her beautiful letters was proud of the european reputation she had won among learned men and wanted to know why she could not be happy in cultivating at home the gifts which god had given her to florence nightingale these things were not gifts to be cultivated but rather temptations to be subdued she read with some attention in eighteen hundred forty six a book called passages from the life of a daughter at home a religious work containing counsels of submission for women dissatisfied with their home life piling up miscellaneous instruction for oneself she wrote in one place in the margin the most unsatisfactory of all pursuits she strove to say to god as she wrote in another place behold the handmaid of the lord not behold the handmaid of correspondence or of music or of metaphysics that power of always writing a good letter whenever one likes she said in one of her pages of self-examination is a great temptation a temptation if such it be to which it must be confessed she continually succumbed but she wished to win no repute from her fall in eighteen hundred fifty four her sister printed the beautiful letters from egypt and issued a few copies for private circulation florence was not pleased but acquiesced and corrected the proofs any dreams then which she may have harbored of literary distinction she had put resolutely away from her o oh god she had written in her diary at cairo thou puttest into my heart this great desire to devote myself to the sick and sorrowful i offer it to thee do with it what is for thy service but there was still one other temptation to be subdued end of section nine part one section seven of the life of florence nightingale volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyus cook the single life the craving for sympathy which exists between two who are to form one indivisible and perfect whole is in most cases between man and woman in some between man and god this the roman catholics have understood and expressed under the simile christ the bridegroom the nun married to him 
the monk married to the church or as saint francis to poverty or as saint ignatius loyola to the divine mistress of his thoughts the virgin this sort of tie between man and god seems alone able to fill the want of the other the permanent exclusive tie between the one man and the one woman florence nightingale's suggestions for thought i had three paths among which to choose wrote miss nightingale in a diary of eighteen fifty i might have been a literary woman or a married woman or a hospital sister we have seen how she turned away from the first path why did she reject the second our dear flo wrote mrs bracebridge to miss clark in eighteen forty four has just recovered from a severe cold but i hear nothing of what i long for that is some noble-hearted true man one who can love her as she deserves to be loved prepared to take her to a house of her own and three years later another friend fanny allen in describing a visit to embley said of florence what a wife she would make for a man worthy of her but i am not sure i yet know the mate fit for her the two nightingale girls she surmised would experience a difficulty in finding any one they would like well enough to forsake such a home in the case of florence the position was ill understood by outsiders to her the home was not a happy garden which she would be very reluctant to forsake but rather a gilded cage from which she eagerly sought a way of escape to us who have the means of knowing her in most thoughts and feelings the question thus presents itself in another light than that in which it appeared to her friends at the time she craved for a larger fuller life than she could find at home why could she not or why did she not seek it in marriage it is love that sometimes frees the imprisoned spirit that enables it to find and to express itself that miss nightingale remained single was not the result of lack of opportunity to marry the reason is to be found elsewhere in feelings thoughts and ideals in reasoned convictions and aspirations which if i can present them aright will illuminate her character and her career in eighteen seventy three miss nightingale like the rest of the world was reading middlemarch and a paper which she wrote in that year contained some notice of george eliot's heroine a novel of genius has appeared its writer once put before the world in a work of fiction too certainly the most living probably the most historically truthful presentment of the great idealist savonarola of florence this author now can find no better outlet for the heroine also an idealist because she cannot be a saint teresa or an antigone than to marry an elderly sort of literary impostor and quick after him his relation a baby sort of itinerant cluricon see irish fairies or inferior fawn see hawthorne's matchless transformation yet close at hand in actual life was a woman an idealist too and if we mistake not a connection of the authors who has managed to make her ideal very real indeed by taking charge of blocks of buildings in porous london while making herself the rent collector she found work for those who could not find work for themselves she organized a system of visitors she brought sympathy and education to bear from individual to individual so that one might be tempted to say were there one such woman with power to direct the flow of volunteer help nearly everywhere running to waste in every street of london's east end almost might the east end be persuaded to become christian could not the heroine the sweet sad enthusiast have been set to some such work as this indeed it is past telling the mischief that is done in thus putting down youthful ideals there are not too many to begin with there are few indeed to end with even without such a gratuitous impulse as this to end them in this passage as in much that florence nightingale wrote there is an autobiographical note she did not marry because she held fast to an ideal an ideal nearer to that of octavia hill than to that of dorothea brooke section two for two or three years florence nightingale was in much trouble of mind from an attachment which one of her cousins had formed for her in no case would she have thought it right to marry him 
accident or relationship she wrote some years later throw people together in their childhood and acquaintance has grown up naturally and unconsciously accordingly in novels it is generally cousins who marry and now it seems the only natural thing the only possible way of making an intimacy and yet we know that intermarriage between relations is in direct contravention of the laws of nature for the well-being of the race it was supposed by some of the family circle at the time that this was the only objection to an engagement but there were others florence was in no mood then or afterwards to marry for the sake of marrying marriage she had written to miss clark page sixty six was not an absolute blessing and though she liked her cousin she was in no sense in love with him she felt relief intense and unmixed as she recorded in her private meditations when she learnt that the young man had at last forgotten her but though this episode left her heart whole it had a great and painful influence upon her mind cleanse all my love from the desire of creating an interest in another's heart is the burden of many of her meditations among other attachments of which florence nightingale was the object there was one which had a deeper effect and called for a more difficult and searching choice in life she was asked in marriage by one who continued for some years to press his suit it was a proposal which seemed to those about her to promise every happiness the match would by all have been deemed suitable and by many might have been called brilliant and florence herself was strongly drawn to her admirer she had not come to this state of mind in hasty inclination she was on her guard against any such temptation many years before in a letter to her brother jonathan as she called miss hilary bonham carter she had written it strikes me that in all the most unworldly poetry both prose and verse la passion qu'on appelle l'inclination is treated in a very extraordinary way when one finds a comparative stranger becoming all of a sudden more essential to one than one's family via flattery in general of one sort or another one is content with saying to oneself oh that's love instead of saying how unjust and how blind this feeling is i wonder whether if people were to examine for as socrates says the life unexamined is not a living life they would not find that whatever it may ripen to afterwards this feeling at first is generally begun by vanity or jealousy or self-love and that what is very much to be guarded against instead of submitted to is the stranger's admiration and i suppose everybody has been susceptible at one time of their lives having more effect upon one than one's own families in this case however the stranger's admiration had stood the test she felt drawn to him not by vanity or self-love but because she admired his talents and because the more she saw of him the greater pleasure did she find in his society she leaned more and more upon his sympathy yet when the proposal first came she refused it and when it was renewed she persisted then it may be said she cannot have been in love with him and in one sense that is i suppose quite true for love as the poets tell us does not reason and florence nightingale reasoned deeply over her case but it is certain that she felt at least as much affection as suffices to make half the marriages in the world she turned away from a path to which she was strongly drawn in order to pursue her ideal in one of the many pages of autobiographical notes which she preserved in relation to this episode in her life miss nightingale thus explained her refusal to marry i have an intellectual nature which requires satisfaction and that would find it in him i have a passional nature which requires satisfaction and that would find it in him i have a moral and active nature which requires satisfaction and that would not find it in his life i can hardly find satisfaction for any of my natures sometimes i think that i will satisfy my passional nature at all events because that will at least secure me from the evil of dreaming but would it i could be satisfied to spend a life with him combining our different powers in some great object i could not satisfy this nature 
by spending a life with him in making society and arranging domestic things to be nailed to a continuation and exaggeration of my present life without hope of another would be intolerable to me voluntarily to put it out of my power ever to be able to seize the chance of forming for myself a true and rich life would seem to me like suicide florence nightingale was no vestal ascetic a true and perfect marriage was she thought the perfect state marrying a man of high and good purpose and following out that purpose with him is the happiest lot the highest the only true love is when two persons a man and a woman who have an attraction for one another unite together in some true purpose for mankind and god the thought of god in instituting marriage was that these two when the right two are united shall throw themselves fearlessly into the universe and do its work secure of companionship and sympathy miss nightingale recognized also that for many women marriage even though it may fall short of this ideal state is the proper lot in life but she held on the other hand that there are some women who may be marked out for single life i don't agree at all she wrote in eighteen forty six that a woman has no reason if she does not care for any one else for not marrying a good man who asks her and i don't think providence does either i think he has as clearly marked out some to be single women as he has others to be wives and has organized them accordingly for their vocation i think some have every reason for not marrying and that for these it is much better to educate the children who are already in the world and can't be got out of it than to bring more into it the primitive church clearly thought so too and provided accordingly and though no doubt the primitive church was in many matters an old woman yet i think the experience of ages has proved her right in this and again ours is a system of christianity without the cross the single life was the life of christ has heaven bestowed everlasting souls on men and sent them upon earth for no better purpose than to marry and be given in marriage true there is in this world much more waiting to be done but is it the man leading a secular life who will do it he is apt to see nothing beyond himself and the fair creature he has chosen for his bride and as with men so with women there are women of intellectual or actively moral natures for whom marriage unless it realizes the perfect ideal means the sacrifice of their higher capacities to the satisfaction of their lower death she wrote again in a notebook of eighteen forty six is often the gateway to the garden where we shall no longer hunger and thirst after real satisfaction marriage on the contrary is often an initiation into the meaning of that inexorable word never which does not deprive us it is true of what at their festivals the idle and inconsiderate call life but which brings in reality the end of our lives and the chill of death with it in her own case miss nightingale was conscious of capacities within her for high purposes for mankind and for god she could not feel sure that the marriage which was offered to her would enable her to employ those capacities to their best and fullest power and so she sacrificed her passional nature to her moral ideal i am thirty she wrote on her birthday in her diary of eighteen fifty the age at which christ began his mission now no more childish things no more vain things no more love no more marriage now lord let me only think of thy will and amongst her sayings in another book i find this strong passions to teach the secrets of the human heart and a strong will to hold them in subjection these are the keys of the kingdom in this world and the next florence nightingale turned away from marriage in order that she might remain entirely free to fulfil her vocation section three it was not a sacrifice which cost her little if as some may hold she was not in love yet she confessed to herself many of a lover's pangs 
and there were moments when as she met her admirer again or as she thought of him she was half inclined to repent of her choice of the single life and the sacrifice moreover was of an immediate satisfaction to an ideal which after all she might never be able to realize the legends of the saints tell of many virgins and martyrs who have crucified the flesh and sacrificed worldly happiness for the love of christ but when the sacrifice was made the love which seemed to them far better was already theirs in the years of saint agnes the divine voice had sounded with sweet assurance and she had tasted of the milk and honey of his lips saint dorothea was already espoused in a garden where celestial fruits and roses that never fade surrounded her and to florence nightingale also happiness was to be given filling all her life for some years so that she sought no better heaven but at the time when she made her choice and renounced all else to follow her ideal the way before her was still dark and uncertain she was conscious of a call but she had no assurance of appointed work to have entered into a marriage which gave no sure promise of her ideal would have been she felt the suicide of a soul yet when she was called to choose between the two paths her present life was starvation perhaps it was the price which she had paid for her ideal that led to what in later years some considered a certain hardness in her when once a woman had devoted her life to the work of nursing miss nightingale had little sympathy with any turning back she seemed sometimes in such cases to regard marriage as the unpardonable sin but another and a loftier train of thought was prompted by her experience at the end of one of her meditations upon marriage and her refusal of it i find these significant words i must strive after a better life for woman she did not mean a better life than marriage she meant also a life that should make the conditions of marriage better in the world in which she lived daughters she wrote can only have a choice among those people whom their parents like and who like their parents well enough to come to their house one may doubt whether in the mid-victorian or in any age young men paid calls only because they liked the parents but unquestionably restriction in the employments of women involves also limitation in the opportunities for choice in marriage and at the same time the lack of interest and variety in the lives of girls at home makes many of them inclined to marriage as a mere means of escape by throwing open new spheres of usefulness to women miss nightingale hoped at one and the same time to improve the lot of those who were marked out to be wives and to find satisfaction for those marked out for the single life end of the single life part one chapter eight of the life of florence nightingale volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyus cook apprenticeship at kaiserswerth eighteen fifty one the only happiness a brave man ever troubled himself with asking much about was happiness enough to get his work done it is after all the one unhappiness of a man that he cannot work that he cannot get his destiny as a man fulfilled carlyle foreign travel had as we have seen in no way changed florence nightingale's resolve to devote herself to a life of nursing she had turned away deliberately from marriage and was bent upon finding a new field of usefulness for unmarried women but ways and means of doing this were not yet apparent she had no independent fortune of her own she returned to a family circle which understood her cravings no better than before the call of domestic duties was the same as before there were aunts and a grandmother to be visited company at home to be entertained a sister to be humoured a father and mother to be pleased but she could not please them because she herself could find no pleasure in their life she did not say to herself that she was better than they still less did she thank god that she was not as they were 
but she felt with piteous keenness the gulf that separated her alike from her parents and from her sister she loved her father and admired his good impulses and amiable character but she perceived that his contentment in a life of busy idleness made him constitutionally unable to enter fully into her state of mind she loved her mother and considered that she was within her range a woman of genius she has the genius of order she wrote in a character sketch of her mother the genius to organize a parish to form society she has obtained by her own exertions the best society in england what pained the daughter was the inability to please the mother when i feel her disappointment in me it is as if i was becoming insane she loved her sister also and i think yet more tenderly but as the sister once wrote the natures god has given us differ as widely as different races florence was deeply sensible of the attractive side of her sister's character lady verney had indeed a most attractive mind she was very vivacious inquiring and highly gifted both as an artist and as a writer she was a perfect hostess and her memory is pleasant to all who knew her if she lacked some of her sister's stronger english characteristics she had a light touch which florence did not possess and florence felt the charm of all this no one less than i she wrote wants her to do one single thing different from what she does she wants no other religion no other occupation no other training than what she has she has never had a difficulty except with me she knows nothing of struggle in her own unselfish nature but for that very reason she could not sympathize with because she could not understand her sister's difficulties in a passage which is doubtless autobiographical florence wrote very few people can sympathize with each other in any pursuit or thought of any importance if people do not give you thought for thought receive yours digest it and give it back with the impression of their own character upon it then give you one for you to do likewise it is best to know what one is about and not to attempt more than kindly cheerful outward intercourse some find amusement in the outward do not suffer inwardly because the attention is turned elsewhere meanwhile florence felt that everything she said or did was a subject of vexation to her sister a disappointment to her mother a worry to her father i have never known a happy time she exclaimed to herself except at rome and that fortnight at kaiserswerth it is not the unhappiness i mind it is not indeed but people can't be unhappy without making those about them so she strove to attain happiness she tried to submit her will to what her spiritual confidants told her must be taken to be the will of god to trust that in his own good time he would make her vocation sure in such confidence to find relief and to throw herself meanwhile into the round of immediate duties but the more she struggled the more she failed she could not subdue the imperious longing to be up and doing which surged within her the thoughts and feelings that i have now she wrote i can remember since i was six years old it was not that i made them a profession a trade a necessary occupation something to fill and employ all my faculties i have always felt essential to me i have always longed for consciously or not during a middle part of my life college education acquirement i longed for but that was temporary the first thought i can remember and the last was nursing work and in the absence of this education work but more the education of the bad than of the young but for this i had had no education myself finding no outlet in active reality she lived more than ever in a land of dreams everything has been tried she exclaimed to herself foreign travel kind friends everything and again my god what is to become of me eighteen months before she had resolved on a great effort to crucify her old self to break through the habits entailed upon me by an idle life of living not in the present world of action but in a future one of dreams since then nations have passed before me but have brought no new life to me in my thirty-first year i see nothing desirable but death she was perishing as she put it for want of food and she could find no impulse to activity 
Her habit of late rising grew upon her. For what had she to wake for? Starvation does not lead a man to exertion. It only weakens him. O oh, weary days, O oh, evenings that seem never to end, for how many long years I have watched that drawing-room clock and thought it would never reach the ten, and for twenty or thirty more years to do this? And again, oh, how I am to get through this day, to talk through all this day, is the thought of every morning. This is the sting of death. Why do I wish to leave this world? God knows I do not expect a heaven beyond, but that he would set me down in St. Giles's at a Kaiser's worth, there to find my work and my salvation in my work. Part 2 Such cries from the heart, cries for the food for which she was hungering, and which her parents could or would not let her take, filled many a sheet of Florence Nightingale's diaries, letters, and memoranda. Mountains of difficulties, as she says in one place, were piled up around her. Looking forward to a new year, 1851, she could see nothing in front of her but the same unsatisfying routine. The next three weeks, she said in one of her written colloquies with herself, you will have company, then a fortnight alone, then a few weeks of London, then Embley, then perhaps go abroad, then three months of company at Lee Hurst, next the same round of Embley company, and then with a humorous transition not infrequent in her musings, she asked, but why can't you get up in the morning? I have nothing I like so much as unconsciousness, but I will try. As the year advanced, a more decided spirit of revolt begins to appear in her diaries. One of her perplexities hitherto had been a doubt whether the mountains of difficulties were to be taken as occasions for submission to God's will, or whether they were piled up in order to try her patience and her resolve, and were to be surmounted by some initiative of her own. She now began to interpret God's will in the latter sense, I must take some things, she wrote on Whit Sunday, June 8, 1851, as few as I can to enable me to live. I must take them. They will not be given me. Take them in a true spirit of doing thy will, not of snatching them for my own will. I must do without some things, as many as I can, which I could not have without causing more suffering than I am obliged to cause anyway. She would cease looking for the sympathy and understanding of her mother and sister. I have been so long treated as a child, and have so long allowed myself to be treated as a child. She would submit to such tutelage no longer. Various plans had at different times found place in her dreams. She would collect funds for founding a sisterhood, an institution, a hospital. But one thing she saw clearly and consistently— if she were ever to have an opportunity of doing good work in nursing or otherwise in service to the poor, she must first learn her business. There is a long letter of 1850 from her to her father, in which she argues the point, not specifically with reference to herself, but as a general proposition. Something more than good intention is necessary in order to do good. Philanthropy is a matter of skill and an apprenticeship in it is necessary. An opportunity occurred sooner than she had dared to hope, which enabled her to serve such an apprenticeship. Her sister was still in bad health, and a visit to Carlsbad was again proposed. She insisted on being allowed to start with her mother and her sister, and to spend at Kaisersworth the time that they would spend upon the cure and subsequent travels. She reached Kaisersworth early in July and stayed there as an inmate of the institution until October 8. Section 3 Kaisersworth is an ancient town on the Rhine, on the right bank, six miles below Dusseldorf. In its church of the 12th century, a reliquary is shown in which are preserved the bones of St. Suet Bertus who came there from Ireland to preach the gospel in 710. Eleven centuries later, a Protestant pastor of Kaisersworth repaid the debt to the British Isles by founding the famous institution for Guinnesses, which was now to give Florence Nightingale an important part of her training. 
the order of deaconesses as she was careful to point out in her account of kaiserswerth was known in the primitive church and long before st vincent de paul established the sisters of mercy in sixteen thirty three protestant communities had in fourteen fifty seven organized presbytery since many women chose a single state not because they expected thereby to reach a supereminent degree of holiness but that they might be better able to care for the sick and young it was in eighteen twenty three to twenty four that the young pastor of kaiserswerth theodore fleidner set out on a journey to holland and england to beg for funds to relieve his parish which had been ruined by the failure of a silk mill in england the little princess victoria headed his list of subscribers in london he met mrs elizabeth fry and was greatly impressed with her work in newgate shortly after his return he founded eighteen twenty six the rhenish westphalian prison association presently he met a kindred spirit and frederica munster a woman in comparatively easy circumstances who was devoting herself to reformatory work they married and in eighteen thirty three in a tiny summer-house in the pastor's garden a refuge was opened for the reception of a single discharged prisoner three years later they added on an equally modest scale at first an infant school and a hospital in which to train volunteer nurses as deaconesses from these humble beginnings has grown a great congeries of institutions the fame of which has spread throughout the philanthropic world there are thirty branch or daughter houses in various parts of germany they are to be found also at jerusalem alexandria cairo beirut smyrna and bucharest not only its own daughter houses but all independent institutions for deaconesses owe their existence to kaiserswerth for all subsequent work wrought by deaconesses whether in france switzerland or america whether lutheran methodist or episcopalian has been the fruit of the kaiserswerth tree but the forest began as a tiny acorn pastor fleidner started his work not with grandiose schemes or full-fledged programmes but with individual cases and personal devotion this was a point to which miss nightingale called particular attention in her account of the place it is impossible not to observe she said how different was the beginning from the way in which institutions are generally founded a list of subscribers with some royal and noble names at the head a double column of rules and regulations a collection of great names begin and end most new enterprises the regulations are made without experience honorary members abound but where are the working ones the scheme is excellent but what are the results miss nightingale's intensely practical genius had ever a holy horror of prospectuses in some notes written on june fifteenth eighteen forty eight i find this passage eschew prospectuses they are the devil and make one sick it is like making out a bill of fare when you have not a single pound of meat what do the cookery books say first catch your hair all the instances on the continent have begun in one of two ways at kaiserswerth a clergyman and his wife have begun not with a prospectus but with a couple of hospital beds and have offered not an advertisement but a home to young women willing to come at Bern, a mademoiselle wurstenberger a woman of rank and education goes to kaiserswerth to learn and her friend to strasburg they return and open a hospital with two rooms increase their funds others join them and are taught by them to publish first is as bad a practical bull as is the name of the prospective review a few years were to pass and florence nightingale herself was to begin her work in the world not with a program but with a deed the institutions of kaiserswerth when she was there in eighteen fifty one were still on a comparatively modest scale they comprised as she enumerates them a hospital with one hundred beds an infant school a penitentiary with twelve inmates an orphan asylum and a normal school for school mistresses there were in all one hundred and sixteen deaconesses of whom ninety-four were consecrated the remainder being still on probation the consecration consisted only of a solemn blessing in the church without vows of any kind of the one hundred and sixteen deaconesses sixty-seven 
were on service in other parts of germany or abroad the rest were engaged in working the various institutions at kaiserswerth itself after six months trial they received a modest salary just enough to provide their clothes there was no other reward except that the mother house stood open to receive those who might fall ill or become infirm in its service everything was clean and well ordered but there was no luxury the board was simple to the verge of roughness the place was pervaded by two notes it was a place of training and a place of consecrated service the training was both in practice and by precept every week the pastor gave a conversational lecture to the deaconesses finding out from each the difficulties she might have experienced in her work and suggesting how they could best be met the education of the young the ministration of the sick the art of district visiting the yet more difficult work of rescue and reformation all were taught in such a place as this florence nightingale found by actual experience as already she had learnt to expect from reading the reports the realization in some degree of her most earnest desires the training in nursing was it is true not particularly good it fell far short of the professional standard which the nightingale school was afterwards to set up she objected strongly in later years to current statements that her own training was confined to kaiserswerth the nursing there she wrote was nil the hygiene horrible the hospital was certainly the worst part of kaiserswerth i took all the training that was to be had there was none to be had in england but kaiserswerth was far from having trained me on the other hand the tone was excellent admirable and pastor fleidner's addresses were the very best i ever heard the penitentiary outdoor work and vegetable gardening under a very capable sister were excellently adapted to the case and pastor fleidner's solemn and reverential teaching to us of the sad events of hospital life was what i have never heard in england but here at kaiserswerth miss nightingale found a better life for women a scope for the exercise of morally active powers and here though the field was limited was provided in some sort the training which alone could fit women for larger responsibilities elsewhere here was the service of man organized as the service of god here was opportunity for the dedicated life as she had found it also in the trinita de monti her manner of life at kaiserswerth and her joy in it were told in letters to her mother on sunday i took the sick boys a long walk along the rhine two sisters were with me to help me to keep order they were all in ecstasies with the beauty of the scenery and really i thought it very fine too in its way the broad mass of waters flowing ever on slowly and calmly to their destination and all that unvarying horizon so like the slow calm earnest meditative german character the world here fills my life with interest and strengthens me in body and mind i succeeded directly to an office and am now in another so that until yesterday i never had time even to send my things to the wash we have ten minutes for each of our meals of which we have four we get up at five breakfast quarter before six the patients dine at eleven the sisters at twelve we drink tea that is a drink made of ground rye between two and three and sup at seven we have two ryes and two broths ryes at six and three broths at twelve and seven bread at the two former vegetables at twelve several evenings in the week we collect in the great hall for a bible lesson the pastor sent for me once to give me some of his unexampled instructions the man's wisdom and knowledge of human nature is wonderful he has an instinctive acquaintance with every character in his place except that once i have only seen him in his rounds the operation to which mrs bracebridge alludes was an amputation at which i was present but which i did not mention to blank knowing that she would see no more in my interest in it than the pleasure dirty boys have in playing in the puddles about a butcher's shop i find the deepest interest in everything here and am so well in body and mind this is life now i know what it is to live and to love life and really i should be sorry now to leave life i know you will be glad to hear this dearest mum god has indeed made life rich in interests and blessings and i wish for no other earth no other world but this 
The room in which Miss Nightingale slept during her residence in Kaisersworth was in the orphan asylum. She took her meals with the deaconesses. The Spartan severity, but no less the beautiful spirit of the place, were clear in her recollection nearly half a century later. In 1897, the authorities of the British Museum applied to her for a copy of the pamphlet on Kaisersworth, which she had printed in 1851. The penciled note, which she sent with a torn copy of the pamphlet, the only one she could find, is preserved in the museum library. I was twice in training there myself, she wrote, September 24, 1897. Of course, since then, hospital and district nursing have made giant strides. Indeed, district nursing has been invented. But never have I met with a higher tone, a purer devotion than there. There was no neglect. It was the more remarkable because many of the deaconesses had been only peasants. None were gentlewomen when I was there. The food was poor. No coffee but bean coffee. No luxury but cleanliness. Pastor Fleidner told a visitor to Kaisersworth that no person had ever passed so distinguished an examination or shown herself so thoroughly mistress of all she had to learn as Miss Nightingale. Section 4. Happy as Miss Nightingale was at Kaisersworth, there was yet one thing lacking. She wished, it is true, for no other earth. She had found her pictured heaven. Her life was full and rich. Yet with all her self-reliance, and even in the moment of first victory in her long struggle for self-expression, she yearned, woman-like, for sympathy. Nay, and not only woman-like, not till we can think, said Carlyle, that here and there one is thinking of us, one is loving us, does this waste earth become a peopled garden. It was not enough to Florence that she should have had her way, and that her parents should have acquiesced. Her loving heart craved for their positive sympathy. Her mind, half leaning for all its masterfulness, demanded that what she had decided should be accepted by those dear to her as their choice also. I should be as happy here, she wrote to her mother, August 31, as the day is long if I could hope that I had your smile, your blessing, your sympathy upon it, without which I cannot be quite happy. My beloved people, I cannot bear to grieve you, life and everything in it that charms you, you would sacrifice for me. But unknown to you is my thirst, unseen by you are waters which would save me. To save me, I know, would be to bless yourselves, whose love for me passes the love of women. Oh, how shall I show you love and gratitude in return, yet not so perish that you chiefly would mourn? Give me time, give me faith, trust me, help me. I feel within me that I could gladden your loving hearts, which now I wound. Say to me, follow the dictates of that spirit within me. O oh, my beloved people, that spirit shall never lead me to anything unworthy of one who is yours in love. But her mother and her sister, though they loved and admired her, or perhaps from their point of view because they did so, were unable to give any such active sympathy as that for which she craved. Her sister hoped that the visit to Kaisersworth would be only an episode. It was a good thing. She had written to her mother for Florence to go there, as we can get her back sooner to Lee Hurst. To Florence herself she wrote affectionately, but yet with gentle irony. She sent a lively letter describing in detail the birth of her friend's twins. I tell you, as you are going to be a sage femme, to, I suppose. Mrs. Nightingale, for her part, had acquiesced in the visit to Kaisersworth, but was already wondering what people would think of her daughter's escapade. I have not mentioned to anyone, wrote Florence, July 16, where I am, and should also be very sorry that the old lady should know. With regard, however, to your fear of what people will say, the people whose opinions you most care about, it has been their earnest wish for years that I should come here. The Bunsons, I know he wishes one of his own daughters would come. The Bracebridges, the Sam Smiths, the Lady Inglis, the Sidney Herberts, the Plunkets, all wish it, and I know that others, Lady Byron, Caroline Bathurst, Mr. Tremon here, Mr. Rich, whose opinions, however, I have not asked, would think it a very desirable thing for everybody. With regard to telling people the fact afterwards of my having been here, I can see no difficulty. The Herberts, as you know, even commissioned me to do something for them here. The fact itself will pain none of them. Mr. and Mrs. Herbert, who were at Hamburg, presently paid her a visit at Kaiserswerth. 
Mrs. Nightingale and her elder daughter reached Cologne on their way home in October 1851, and there Florence rejoined them. Our dear child Florence, wrote the mother to Madame Mole, October 9, came to us yesterday and has gone this morning to visit certain deaconesses and others. I long to be at home and among our people. Daily and hourly I congratulate myself that our home is where it is. Oh, what a land of justice and freedom and all good things it is, compared to what we have seen. And how surprising that with all our advantages and our freedom won, we should not be so much better than other people. Well, I hope Florence will be able to apply all the fine things she has been learning, to do a little to make us better. Partha and I are much too idle to help, and too apt to be satisfied with things as they are. End of Apprenticeship at Kaiserswerth, 1851part one chapter nine of the life of florence nightingale volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyus cook an interlude eighteen fifty two who would be free themselves must strike the blow. Byron. The three months which Miss Nightingale spent at Kaiserswerth in 1851 were a turning point in her career, but they were not immediately effectual in altering the tenor of her life. The battle for freedom was not yet completely won, but the mountains of difficulty in her way had been turned, and henceforth the resistance offered to her was but a rear-guard action. A note of serenity in marked contrast to the storm and distress of earlier years now appears in some of her letters. She had firmly resolved on taking her life into her own hands, and at Kaiserswerth she had already served some apprenticeship. She was resolved no less firmly to follow up the advantage, and though there were still to be some difficulties ahead, she could afford to be patient for a while. To Miss H. Bonham Carter, Umberslade, January 8, Brussels Sprouts, is added already, I mean at correspondence. I mention it to show how little women's occupations are respected, when people can think that a woman has time to spin out long theories with every young fool who visits at her house. This place is grand. Inigo Jones and Papa is content. I like Dr. Johnson but I can always talk better to a medical man than to anyone else. They have not that detestable nationality which makes it so difficult to talk with an Englishman. I suppose the habit of examining organizations gives them this. Poor Cassandra has found an unexpected ally in a young surgeon of a London hospital, a son of Dr. Johnson, who sits next Papa at the table d'hote. The account he gives of the nurses beats everything that even I know of. This young prophet says that they are all drunkards, without exception, sisters and all, and that there are but two nurses whom the surgeon can trust to give the patients their medicines. I thought you would be pleased to hear how bad they are, so I tell you. Johnson is extraordinarily careful, but he does not strike me as having genius like Gully. The company is of a nature which would give Mama some hopes of me that I should learn the value of good society by the contrast. To her father, May 12, 1852. On my 32nd birthday, I think I must write a word of acknowledgement to you. I am glad to think that my youth is past and rejoice that it never, never can return that time of follies and bondage of unfulfilled hopes and disappointed inexperience when a man possesses nothing not even himself i am glad to have lived though it has been a life which except as the necessary preparation for another few would accept i hope now that i have come into possession of myself i hope that i have escaped from that bondage which knows not how to distinguish between bad habits and duties terms often used synonymously by all the world it is too soon to hallow before you are out of the wood and like the 
Magdalen in Correggio's picture, I see the dark wood behind, the sharp stones in front, only with too much clearness. Of clearness, however, there cannot be too much. But as in the picture there is light, I hope that I may live, a thing which I have not often been able to say, because I think I have learnt something which it would be a pity to waste, and I am ever yours, dear father, in struggle as in peace, with thanks for all your kind care. F. N. When I speak of the disappointed inexperience of youth, of course I accept that, not only as inevitable, but as the beautiful arrangement of infinite wisdom, which cannot create us gods, but which will not create us animals, and therefore wills mankind to create mankind by their own experience, a disposition of perfect goodness which no one can quarrel with. I shall be very ready to read you when I come home any of my works in your own room before breakfast if you have any desire to hear them. Au revoir, dear Papa. Section 2 There were various reasons for the comparative serenity of Miss Nightingale's mind during this period of pause. One was the obvious call of filial duty for the moment. Her father was in poor health and had been advised to take the water cure under Dr. Johnson at Umberslade Park in Worcestershire. Florence, being herself convalescent at the time from an attack of the measles, was the more ready to companion her father. She was at Umberslade with him for some weeks at the beginning and again at the end of the year. Her observation of some of the patients there, as in a former year at Malvern, was the origin of an epigrammatic definition which I find in one of her notebooks. The water cure, a highly popular amusement within the last few years amongst athletic invalids who have felt the tedium vitae and those indefinite diseases which a large income and unbounded leisure are so well calculated to produce. Then again, towards the end of the year, her kinswoman, Aunt Evans, was smitten down. She was the sister of her father's mother and died at the age of ninety. Florence attended her in her last illness and, as emergency man, made all the arrangements for her funeral. George Eliot was, I believe, distantly connected with Aunt Evans's family, and it was in this year that she and Florence met. I had a note from Miss Florence Nightingale yesterday, wrote George Eliot in July 1852. I was much pleased with her. There is a loftiness of mind about her which is well expressed by her form and manner. Florence also at this time called upon Mrs. Browning, who in a letter to a friend three years later said, I remember her face and her graceful manner and the flowers she sent me afterwards. She is an earnest, noble woman. In August 1852, Miss Nightingale visited Ireland and inspected the Dublin hospitals, somewhat, it seems, to her disappointment. She went in September with her father to stay with Sir James Clark, Queen Victoria's physician, at Burke Hall, near Ballater. She always got on well, as we have just heard, with medical men, and the opportunity of discussing her plans and thoughts with so eminent a physician must have pleased her greatly. Section 3. The letter to her father given above refers to Miss Nightingale's works, and herein is to be found a second explanation of this peaceful interlude in her life. She had, as I have said, renounced a literary career, but she drew a sharp distinction between what she called literature for its own sake and writing as subservient to action. She was intensely anxious to find some theological sanction less assailable than she deemed the popular creeds to be for her religion of practical service. Again, as I have also said, she was determined to open up a new sphere of usefulness for women. These were the subjects of her works, which comprised a novel and a book on religion. Of the novel, no manuscript has been found among her papers, but in one of three volumes of Suggestions for Thought, which she printed privately in 1860, there is a section entitled Cassandra, dealing with the life at home of an ordinary English gentlewoman. It may be conjectured that the form of the novel was abandoned after 1852, and the theme treated instead in the pages of Cassandra. 
the manuscript book on religion was doubtless enlarged between eighteen fifty two and eighteen sixty into the main portion of the suggestions for thought of which the first volume was dedicated to the artisans of england already in eighteen fifty one in a sheet of good resolutions miss nightingale had planned to devote some portion of her life at home to giving a new religion to the tailors the hero of alton locke published in eighteen fifty was it will be remembered a tailor miss nightingale herself had some acquaintance with operatives in the north of england and in london among those of what are called holyoke's party she met these latter through mr edward truelove whom some readers of earlier generations may still remember as a publisher and vendor of radical and free-thinking literature the literary and scientific institution in john street fitzroy square was in the forties the headquarters of owenite socialists the secularists whose chief prophet was george jacob holyoke and other advanced persons in eighteen forty six mr truelove had come up from harmony hall the owenite community at tytherley in hampshire to act as secretary of the institution in john street and in a small house next door he set up his shop afterwards removed successively to the strand and high holborn a west end lady who did not at first give her name used to pay occasional visits to the shop in john street and have long conversations with the wife of the proprietor the lady was miss nightingale and the acquaintance developed into a friendship with mrs truelove which extended over many years mr truelove was an unworldly man conducting his affairs with entire disregard for business principles conventional opinions and constituted authorities his shop as mr holyoke said was one of the fortresses of prohibited thought not garrisoned without daring and provisioned it may be added scantily enough miss nightingale continued to see mrs truelove from time to time in later years wrote to her occasionally sent her books and various presents regularly and in times of her husband's difficulties and literally trials never withheld sympathy miss nightingale's object in her first expeditions to john street had been to discover and discuss the kind of literature affected by the more intelligent working men the conclusion at which she arrived was that the most thinking and conscientious of the artisans have no religion at all she set to work accordingly to find a new religion for them in this undertaking she took much counsel with one of her aunts this was aunt mai her father's sister mary shore married to mr samuel smith her mother's brother a large number of her letters on religious subjects was preserved by miss nightingale they show spiritual insight and a considerable talent in speculative thought the postscript of miss nightingale's letter to her father given above contains one of the fundamental ideas in her scheme of theology the idea of perfect goodness willing that mankind shall create mankind by man's own experience the same idea was suggested by aunt mai when she wrote to her niece the purpose of god is to accomplish the welfare of man not as a gift from him but as to be attained for each individual and for the whole race by the right exercise of the capabilities of each during eighteen fifty one and eighteen fifty two aunt and niece corresponded at great length on these high matters and by the end of the latter year miss nightingale had her new religion ready for the criticism of her friends many thanks she wrote november nineteen to her cousin hilary for your letter of corrections and annotations all of which i have adopted i should much like to have a regular talk with you about the novel i have not the least idea whether i shall have to remodel the novel and religion entirely for i am so sick of it that i lose all discrimination about the ensemble and the form her object is explained in a letter of about the same date to another friend to r monkton milnes i am going abroad soon before i go i am thinking of asking you whether you would look over certain things which i have written for the working men on the subject of belief in a god 
all the moral and intellectual among them seem going over to atheism or at least to a vague kind of theism i have read them to one or two and they have liked them i should have liked to have asked you if you think them likely to be read by more but you are perhaps not interested in this subject or you have no time which is fully taken up with other things if you tell me this it will be no surprise or disappointment lord houghton read the manuscript attentively and did not forget it several years later when miss nightingale was ill and thought likely to die he wrote to her suggesting that if she had made no other arrangements for the preservation and possible publication of her essay she might think of entrusting it to him i have often thought he said march eleventh sixty one of asking you what you meant to do with the papers you have written on social and speculative subjects they surely should not be destroyed and yet i hardly know to whom you will entrust them who would not misunderstand misinterpret and misuse them if you were to leave them in my hands they would be at any rate safe from irreverent handling or crude exposure and could be used in any way more or less future that you might think fit by that time however the work had been submitted to the judgment of other men of letters and to that later period further reference to the subject had better be postponed section four the formulating of a religion whether for the tailors or others is no short task and miss nightingale's works must have well filled her mind during otherwise unoccupied hours in eighteen fifty two but the works were only by work her main concern was to continue her apprenticeship in nursing some vexatious delays and difficulties were still to be encountered but she faced them with a brighter confidence than before and the last stage of the struggle wears an aspect more of comedy than of tragedy she had successfully asserted her independence once in going to kaiser's work in an imaginary dialogue with her mother she makes herself say why my dear you don't suppose that with my talents and my european reputation and my beautiful letters and all that i'm going to stay dangling about my mother's drawing-room all my life i shall go and look out for work to be sure you must look upon me as your son i should have cost you a great deal more if i had married or been a son you must now consider me married or a son you were willing to part with me to be married in presenting the case in this light to her parents florence had now a valuable ally in her aunt my something of a diplomatist as well as of a philosopher was within the powers of that excellent woman without any interference which could be resented by insinuating a word here suggesting a phrase there and pouring oil upon troubled waters everywhere aunt my did a good deal to smooth the last stages in her niece's struggle for independence like all good diplomatists the aunt sought first for a basis of compromise she was able to sympathize with both sides she was wholly favorable to her niece's aspirations and claims but as a mother herself she could enter into the case of her brother and his wife it was not that they were selfishly obstructed it was that finding so much interest and enjoyment themselves in their own way of life they desired in all love that the daughter should not deprive herself of the same privileges but could not a compromise be arranged let it be agreed that florence should spend part of each year in pursuit of what the mother considered her daughter's fancies and spend another part at home which was in fact now in force the compromise served well enough for a while but florence wanted something more and here again aunt my's diplomacy prepared the way with a good strategic eye she saw that mrs nightingale held the key of the position mr nightingale in his heart was at one with florence he admired her and believed in her he was quite willing that she should go her own way and was not reluctant to make her some independent allowance such as would enable her to conduct a mission or an institution but as he said to his sister whenever he broached anything of the kind to his wife and elder daughter he found them united against him mr nightingale was one of those amiable men who are inclined to take the line of least resistance it was mrs nightingale's opposition therefore that had to be overcome your mother reported the aunt would i believe be most willing that you undertake a mission like mrs fry or mrs chisholm 
but she thinks it necessary for your peace and well-being that there should be a mr fry or captain chisholm to protect you and in conscience she thinks it right to defend you from doing anything which she thinks would be an impediment to the existence of mr f or captain c a good many mothers even in these days will i doubt not be on mrs nightingale's side but aunt my having made her sister-in-law define the position pressed the advantage in an ingenious way florence was already thirty-two and a time comes soon after that age when even the most sanguine mother begins to despair it was agreed accordingly that at some future specified age florence should be free to do the work of a mrs fry or a mrs chisholm without the protection of a mr f or a captain c there was even some talk of obtaining a written agreement to that effect specifying the age but aunt my thought better of such a plan and contented herself with calling in another witness to the verbal understanding this was the lady mrs bracebridge who two years later was to accompany miss nightingale on a mission more renowned even than that of mrs fry or mrs chisholm but from the point gained by aunt my's diplomacy and florence's own persistence a logical consequence followed presently at some future unspecified age florence was to be free to control some philanthropic institution but what would be the use of being free to do so unless she were also trained and qualified section five having lived and learnt among the protestant deaconesses in germany miss nightingale was next determined to do the like among the catholic sisters in france she sought the good offices of manning whose acquaintance she had made in rome five years before and who had now lately been received into the roman communion manning put himself into communication with his friend the abbe de jeannette in paris the abbe obtained leave from the council of the sisters of charity for the english lady to study their institutions it had been explained to him that miss nightingale was also desirous of studying the hospitals in paris the abbe accordingly selected a house belonging to the sisters which would offer every advantage in this respect her cousin miss hilary bonham carter who was intent on the study of art and had been invited to stay with monsieur and madame mole was to accompany her to paris and lady augusta bruce was also to be of the party it was in the salon of madame mole that lady augusta met her future husband dean stanley thus then it had been arranged the necessary authorization from the sisters had been obtained in september the start was to be made in november but as the time approached mrs nightingale drew back she wrote of the plan not as something agreed upon but as a new proposition i am afraid she said to aunt my that flo is thinking of some new expedition perhaps to paris i cannot make up my mind to it florence was staying at a friend's house in london her father came in and reported that her mother was greatly distressed there was company coming to embley and could florence have the heart to leave her mother partha would be in hysterics every one would be in despair could she not delay an aged kinswoman moreover was ill as already related florence yielded perhaps more to this last consideration than to the others and the start was postponed there was a lingering hope that the expedition to paris might be abandoned and a suggestion was made to that end why must florence go to the sisters and roman catholic sisters too abroad why should she not stay at home and conduct some small institution on her own account there was a house available for such a purpose at cromford bridge close to their own lee hurst and mr nightingale would provide the necessary funds in this way the best might be made of both worlds of theirs and of hers florence was touched but remained of her own mind to her sister january three oh my dearest pop i wish i could tell you how i love you and thank you for your kind thoughts as received in your letter to-day if you did but know how genial it is to me when my dear people give me a hope of their blessing and that they would speed me on my way as the kind thought of cromford seems to say they are ready to do i will write to mamma about paris and cromford my pop whether at one or the other my heart will be with thee now if these seem mere words because bodily i shall be leaving you have patience with me my dearest i hope that you and i shall live to prove a true love to each other 
i cannot during the year's round go the way which for my sake i know you have wished there have been times when for your dear sake i have tried to stifle the thoughts which i feel ingrained in my nature but if that may not be i hope that something better shall be if i ask your blessing on a part of my time for my absence i hope to be all the happier with you for that absence when we are together miss nightingale refused cromford bridge house it was most unsuitable for the purpose the only more unsuitable place was the forest lodge at embley which her sister partha had suggested in the following year florence joined the sisters of charity in paris and thus after many struggles and delays was she launched upon her true work in the world end of an interlude eighteen fifty two part one chapter ten of the life of florence nightingale volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyus cook freedom paris and harley street eighteen fifty three to october eighteen fifty four lo as some venturer from his stars receiving promise and presage of sublime emprise wears evermore the seal of his believing deep in the dark of solitary eyes f w h myers the institution in which florence nightingale was to serve her apprenticeship in paris was the maison de la providence belonging to the sieur de la charite in the rue oudinot faubourg st germain the abbe de jeannette described in a letter to manning the attractions which would offer to his protege the principal house managed by twenty sisters received nearly two hundred poor orphans and also conducted a creche a hospital was attached to it next door for aged and sick women within ten minutes walk miss nightingale would find two other hospitals one a general hospital the other a children's hospital the english demoiselle would conform in accordance with her desire to the rules of the house as a postulant rendering all necessary service to the sick the only restrictions were that she would not be able to enter the refectory or the dormitory of the sisters she would have to sleep and take her meals in her own room but she would be free to visit the poor in company with the sisters to serve the sick under their direction in various hospitals and infirmaries and to assist in the care of the orphans alike in class and at play such was the life in paris to which miss nightingale was looking forward eagerly she left london for paris on february three eighteen fifty three with her cousin miss bonham carter and they stayed with monsieur and madame mole in the rue de bac before entering the maison de la providence miss nightingale desired to visit and study other institutions in paris she was armed with a comprehensive permit from the administration generale de l'assistance publique to study in all the hospitals of the city she availed herself indefatigably of this permission spending her days in inspecting hospitals infirmaries and religious houses and having the advantage of seeing the famous paris surgeons at their work now as at all times she was a diligent collector and student of reports returns statistics pamphlets among her papers of this date are elaborately tabulated analyses of hospital organization and nursing arrangements both in france and in germany and a circular of questions bearing on the same subjects which she seems to have addressed to the principal institutions in the united kingdom her evenings were spent in company with her host and hostess there were soirees dansant in the rue de bac she went once or twice with madame mole to balls elsewhere and also to the opera she met many english visitors and distinguished parisians having completed her general inquiries into the paris hospitals she presented herself to the reverend mother of the maison de la providence and had arranged a day for her admission when she was suddenly recalled to england by the illness of her grandmother who died at the age of ninety-five great has been the occasion for flo's usefulness wrote mr nightingale to his wife and i shall never be thankful enough wrote florence herself to her cousin in paris that i came 
i was able to make her be moved and changed and to do other little things which perhaps smoothed the awful passage and which perhaps would not have been done as well without me a family event of a different kind interested miss nightingale at this time her cousin blanche shore smith had become engaged to arthur hugh clough miss nightingale greatly liked him as a long engagement seemed likely miss nightingale interested herself in the future of the young couple discussing the proper limits of parental allowances in such matters drawing up elaborately detailed estimates of household expenditure not forgetting to include future charges for a young family as by the statistics of the average birth rate they might be calculated statistics were already almost a passion with her section two negotiations were now on foot for miss nightingale to take charge of a benevolent institution in london and madame mole advised her to keep in their places the great ladies who were concerned in it neither now nor at any time was she much in love with committees but not every word in the following account of the negotiations need be taken very seriously to madame mole lee hurst april eighth in all that you say i cordially agree and if you knew what the fashionable asses have been doing their offs and their ons poor fools you would say so ten times more i shall be truly grateful if you will write to pop my people know as much of the affair now as i do which is not much you see the f a s or a f s which will stand for ancient fathers and be more respectful as they are all puseyites the f a s want me to come up to london now and look at them and if we suit to come very soon into the sanatorium which i am afraid will preclude my coming back to paris especially if you are coming away soon for going there without you would unveil all my iniquities as the f a s are quite as much afraid of the r c s as my people are it is no use telling you the history of the negotiations which are enough to make a comedy in fifty acts they may be summed up as i once heard an irish shoeless boy translate virgil obstupui i was all the gither bothered stederunt que come I, and my hair stood up like the bristles of a pig vox falsibus heisit and divil a word could i say well divil a bit of a word can i say except that you are very good dear friend to take so much interest and that i shall be truly glad if you will write to pop dans le sang de mousse all your advice which i sent to mrs bracebridge i give my profoundest adhesion to i would gladly point the finger of scorn in the liveliest manner at the f a s and ride them roughshod round grosvenor square i will even do my very best but i am afraid it is not in me to do it as i should wish it would be only a poor feint a mean caricature but i will practice and you shall see me my people are now at thirty old burlington street where i shall be in another week please write to them there and if you can do a little quacking for me to them the same will be thankfully received in order that i may come in when i arrive not with my tail between my legs but gracefully curve round me in the old way in which perugino's devil wears it in folds round the waist i am afraid i must live at the place if i don't it will be a half and a half measure which will satisfy no one however i shall take care to be perfectly free to clear off without its being considered a failure at my own time i can give you no particulars dearest friend because i don't know any i can only say that unless i am left a free agent and am to organize the thing myself and not they i will have nothing to do with it but as the thing is yet to be organized i cannot lay a plan either before you or my people and that rather perplexes them as they want to make conditions that i shan't do this or that if you would well present my plans as you say to them it would be an inestimable benefit both to them and to me hilly will tell you all i know that it is a sanatorium for sick governesses managed by a committee of fine ladies but there are no surgeon students nor improper patients there at all which is of course a great recommendation in the eyes of the proper the patients or rather the impatients for i know that what it is to nurse sick ladies are all pay patients poor friendless folk in london i am to have the choosing of the house the appointment of the chaplain and the management of the funds as the f a s are at present minded but isaiah himself could not prophesy how they will be minded 
at eight o'clock this evening what specially annoyed miss nightingale was that some of the fashionable ladies in the course of gossip had begun to wonder whether her appointment would have the approval of her family some officious friend had suggested that it would be cruel to take her away from her home this difficulty was disposed of by miss nightingale's assurance that the appointment would be submitted to the approval of her mother and father her father now agreed to make her an independent allowance paid quarterly in advance it was on a scale sufficiently liberal to enable her to offer her services to the institution entirely gratuitously she also agreed to pay all the charges board and lodging included of the matron mrs clark whom she was to bring with her another difficulty was then raised the superintendent of a nursing home ought to be present when the doctors went their rounds and when operations were performed but would it be seemly for a gentlewoman to do this miss nightingale insisted and an agreement was arrived at in april she was to enter upon her duties as superintendent as soon as new premises had been secured and meanwhile she was free to resume her studies in paris section three she returned to paris on may thirty and after a week spent with monsieur and madame mot during which she again inspected various hospitals she entered the maison de la providence in the rue Oudinot on june eighth from paris she kept up correspondence with regard to the new premises for the institution in london the indispensable conditions of a suitable house are she wrote to lady canning june five first that the nurse should never be obliged to quit her floor except for her own dinner and supper and her patient's dinner and supper and even the latter might be avoided by the windlass we have talked about without a system of this kind the nurse is converted into a pair of legs secondly that the bells of the patients should all ring in the passage outside the nurse's own door on that story and should have a valve which flies open when its bell rings and remains open in order that the nurse may see who has rung the letter continues for some pages to describe other requirements about a hot water supply and the like points which are now in the a b c of hospitals or nursing homes but which then were novel counsels of perfection the idea of a lift in particular was new inquiries were made by the ladies in various parts of the country and there were many hitches before a suitable apparatus was installed the correspondence is significant of the attention to practical detail which characterized all miss nightingale's work meanwhile her work with the sisters of charity among the poor came to a tiresome pause the nurse had herself to be nursed the nature of the calamity is described in a letter to madame mole who was paying visits in england at the time back drawing-room at madame mole's rue de bac one twenty june twenty eighth my dearest friend do you see where i am here's a go as monsieur mole told you here am i in bed in your back drawing-room poor monsieur mole appears to bear it with wonderful equanimity and reconciliarment like his danseurs not so i it is the most impertinent the most surprising the most inopportune thing i have ever done me established in a lady's house in her absence to be ill if m mole had any sins i should think i was the avenging puka appointed to castigate him as he has none i am obliged to arrest myself at the other supposition that it is for my own it was not my fault though really here is how the things have happened i have had the measles at the sewer and of all my adventures of which i have had many and queer as will be never recorded in the book of my wanderings the dirtiest and the queerest i have ever had has been a measles in the cell of a sewer de la charite they were very kind to me and dear m mole wrote to me almost every day and sent me tea which however they would not let me have and he lastly in his paternity would have me back where i came yesterday and established me in the back drawing-room to my infinite horror and now i am getting better very fast and mean to be out again in a day or two i had got rid of the eruption and all that before i came m mole is so kind and comes to see me and talk which i suppose is very improper but i can't help it and he has been like a father to me and never was such a father i really am so ashamed of all his kindness and the trouble i give them that my brazen old face blushes crimson and i assure you this paper ought to be read julie the servant is very kind to me but i hope not to be long on their hands 
as to my calamity itself it is like the mariage de mademoiselle who could have foreseen it it really was not my fault there was no measles at any of my posts and i had had them not eighteen months ago so that erect in the consciousness of that dignity i should not have kept out of their way if i had seen them the doctor would not believe i could have had them before well i am so ashamed of myself that i shall lock myself up for the rest of my life and never go nowhere no more for you see it is evident that providence who was always in my way and who as the superior said is très admirable meaning wonderful and having done this does not mean me to come to paris nor to the sur having twice made me ill when i was doing so and given you all this trouble for me to come to paris to have the measles a second time is like going to the grand desert to die of getting one's feet wet or anything most unexpected please write to m mohl and comfort him for his disaster i am so repentant that i can say nothing which the catholics tell me is the mark of a true humiliation thank you a thousand times for all your kindness i come to england next week f n m mohl required no comfort miss nightingale's father wrote to thank him for his kindness to her the kindness he gallantly replied was on her side in giving him the advantage of her society and conversation her gentle manner he wrote july twenty five covers such a depth and strength of mind and thought that i am afraid of nothing for her but that her health should fail her End of part one of freedom paris and harley street eighteen fifty three to october eighteen fifty four part one chapter ten of the life of florence nightingale volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyus cook freedom paris and harley street continued part four convalescence was rapid on july thirteenth she returned to london and a month later on august twelfth eighteen fifty three miss nightingale went into residence in her first situation the place in question already briefly described in one of her letters to madame mole was that of superintendent of an establishment for gentlewomen during illness this institution had been founded a few years before at eight chandos street cavendish square to give medical assistance and a home to sick governesses and other gentlewomen of narrow means it was managed by a council which in its turn appointed a committee of ladies and a committee of gentlemen we need not trouble ourselves with the relations between the two committees though they much troubled miss nightingale but it is characteristic of the ideas of the time that the ladies made over to the gentlemen all payments contracts and financial arrangements as also the selection of medical officers and male servants some years later kinglake devoted several pages of his most elaborate satire to a comparison of the male pretensions and the female performances in their respective spheres in the hospitals of the crimea but on the present occasion miss nightingale found the ladies more difficult than the gentlemen the institution had languished in chandos street she was called in to give it new life suitable new premises had been found at number one upper harley street and there miss nightingale lived with a few brief intervals until october eighteen fifty four she had also a pied-a-terre in some lodgings taken for her by her aunt in pell mell where she occasionally saw her friends and whither she resorted on sunday mornings in order not to scandalize the patients in harley street by being known not to go to church she had stipulated for extensive powers and control and she was not one to let any agreed power suffer diminution from desuetude the ladies on the council and the committee included besides lady canning already mentioned lady ellesmere lady cranworth lady monteagle lady caroline murray and others well known in the worlds of society and philanthropy miss nightingale had her special friends and allies among them such as lady canning and lady inglis 
and mrs sidney herbert presently joined the committee in order to lend her support since their meeting in rome mrs herbert and miss nightingale had seen much of each other for wilton house was within calling distance of embley miss nightingale had assisted at the birth of one of mrs herbert's children and amongst miss nightingale's papers belonging to this period is a syllabus of religious teaching for a girls school which they had adapted from the madre st columba's lessons to girls mrs herbert now wrote from wilton offering to come up to a committee meeting i thought some wicked cats might be there who would set up their backs and if so i should like to have mine up too and again i hope you will write to me dearest flo should any little difficulties arise whilst we are out of town difficulties did arise in plenty but miss nightingale was sometimes peremptory and at other times showed herself a master in the gentle art of managing committees to madame mole one upper harley street august twenty clarkie dear i would write but i can't i have had to prepare this immense house for patience in ten days without a bit of help but only hindrance from my committee if Monsieur Mole would write a book upon English societies, I would supply him with such statistics as would astonish even him. But it's no use talking about these things, and I've no time. I've been in service ten days, and have had to furnish an entirely empty house in that time. We take in patience this Monday, and have not got our workmen out yet. My committee refused me to take in Catholic patients, whereupon I wished them good morning, unless I might take in Jews and their rabbis to attend them. So now it is settled and in print that we are to take in all denominations whatever, and allow them to be visited by their respective priests and muftis, provided I will receive, in any case whatsoever, that is not of the Church of England, the obnoxious animal at the door, take him upstairs myself, remain while he is conferring with his patient, make myself responsible that he does not speak to or look at any one else, and bring him downstairs again in a noose and out into the street. And to this I have agreed, and this is in print. Amen. From Committees, Charity, and Schism. From the Church of England and all other deadly sin. From Philanthropy and all the deceits of the devil, good Lord, deliver us. In great haste, ever yours, overflowingly, it will do me so much good to see a good man again. To her father, 1 Upper Harley Street, December 3, 1853. Dear Papa, you ask for my observations upon my line of statesmanship. I have been so very busy that I have scarcely made any resume in my own mind, but upon doing so now, for your benefit, I perceive. When I entered into service here, I determined that, happen what would, I never would intrigue among the committee. Now I perceive that I do all my business by intrigue. I propose in private to A, B, or C the resolution I think A, B, or C most capable of carrying in committee, and then leave it to them, and I always win. I am now in the heyday of my power. At the last general committee, they proposed and carried without my knowing anything about it, a resolution that I should have fifty pounds per month to spend for the house, and wrote to the treasurer to advance it me, whereupon I wrote to the treasurer to refuse it me. Lady Blank, who was my greatest enemy, is now, I understand, trumpeting my fame through London, and all because I have reduced their expenditure from one shilling tenpence per head per day to one shilling. The opinions of others concerning you depend not at all or very little upon what you are, but upon what they are. Praise and blame are alike indifferent to me, as constituting an indication of what myself is, though very precious as the indication of the other's feeling. Last General Committee, I executed a series of resolutions on five subjects and presented them as coming from the medical men. One, that the successor to our house surgeon resigned should be a dispenser and dispense the medicines in the house, saving our bill at the druggist's of a hundred and fifty pounds per annum. Two, a series of house rules of which I send you the rough copy. Three, a series of resolutions about not keeping patients of which I send you the foul copy. Four, a complete revolution as to diet which is shamefully abused at present. Five, an advertisement for the institution of which I send the foul copy. All these I proposed and carried in committee without telling them that they came from me and not from the medical men. 
and then and not till then i showed them to the medical men without telling them that they were already passed in committee it was a bold stroke but success is said to make an insurrection into a revolution the medical men have had two meetings upon them and approved them all nem con and thought they were their own and i came off with flying colours no one suspecting my intrigue which of course would ruin me were it known as there is as much jealousy in the committee of one another and among the medical men of one another as ever what's his name had of marlborough i have also carried my point of having good harmless mr blank as chaplain and no young curate to have spiritual flirtations with my young ladies and so much for the earthquakes in this little molehill of ours to her father i send you some more documentary evidence the tale of my quarterly report my committee are such children in administration that i am obliged to tell them such obvious truths as are contained in what i make the medical men say this place is exactly like the administering of the poor law we have cases of purely lazy fits and cases deserted by their families and my committee have not the courage to discharge a single case they say the medical men must do it the medical men say they won't although the cases they say must be discharged and i always have to do it as the stop-gap on all occasions by such hearts and by such readiness to shoulder responsibility miss nightingale reduced chaos to order and her management of the institution won praise in all quarters it was hard work for the lady superintendent was here there and everywhere shepherding those who had cure of souls managing the nurses assisting at operations checking waste in the coal cellar or the larder when a thing wanted to be done she did it herself mrs herbert heard with anxiety that her friend had strained her back by lifting a patient though she was suffering from lumbago at the time there were smaller worries too the british workmen and the british tradesmen also tried her sorely the chemist she wrote to her father sent me a bottle of ether labelled s spirits of nitre which if i had not smelt it i should certainly have administered and should have had an inquiry into poisoning and the whole flue of a new gas stove came down the second time of using it which if i had not caught it in my arms would certainly have killed a patient then there were the anxieties necessarily incident to a nursing home we have had an awful disappointment she wrote to her father eighteen fifty four in a couching for a cataract which has failed the eye is lost though no fault of bowman's and i am left after a most anxious watching with a poor blind woman on my hands whom we have blinded and with a prospect of insanity i would rather ten times have killed her these are the cases not those like the poor german who died which make our lives so anxious what was afterwards to characterize her work in a larger field was already observed in harley street it was the combination of masterful powers of organization with womanly gentleness and sympathy letters of gratitude which she received from patients after their discharge from harley street speak of her unwearied and affectionate attention they were often addressed to her as my good dear and faithful friend or my darling mother and a friend and mother she was indeed to many of the young women who came under her care she had a large and influential circle of friends and acquaintances and she was indefatigable in finding convalescent homes or sympathetic care or openings in the colonies for those who stood in need of such assistance she was much interested in the scheme for female emigration which sidney herbert had started in eighteen forty nine and in which he and his wife superintended every detail though the work was hard and the anxieties many miss nightingale did not lose heart our vocation is a difficult one she wrote to miss nicholson january tenth eighteen fifty four as you i am sure know and though there are many consolations and very high ones the disappointments are so numerous that we require all our faith and trust but that is enough i have never repented nor looked back not for one moment and i begin the new year with more true feeling of a happy new year than ever i had in my life she had found her vocation but her family had not yet quite fully accepted it on their side there was still some looking back her father indeed took pride in his daughter's success and the correspondence between them at this time is very pleasant he was himself a county magistrate concerned in the administration of hospitals and asylums and he followed every move in his daughter's strategy with lively interest he admired her masterfulness but was not quite sure that she might not carry it too far 
you will have he wrote to govern by a representative system after all in england we go this way to work and a good way it is for a good autocrat is only to be found at intervals despots do nothing in teaching others republicans keep teaching each other all day long he was most sympathetic in her difficulties but he was not sure that those about him would be so there is a postscript in one of his letters which tells a good deal between the lines better write to me at the athenaeum so as not to excite inquiry her mother and sister seemed to have thought that while they were in london florence might have lived at home or at any rate have often been with them why should she be wearing herself out away from them their point of view was put by madame mole who was the affectionate friend of both sisters to madame mole harley street august twenty seventh eighteen fifty three i have not taken this step clarky dear without years of anxious consideration it is the result of the experience of years and of the fullest and deepest thought it has not been done without advice and it is a step which being the growth of so long it is not likely to be repented of or reconsidered i mean the step of leaving them i do not wish to talk about it and this is the last time i shall ever do so but as you ask me a plain question clarky dear i will give you a plain answer i have talked matters over made a clean breast as you express it with partha not once but thousands of times years and years have been spent in doing so it has been therefore with the deepest consideration and with the fullest advice that i have taken the step of leaving home and it is a fait accompli with regard to my sacrificing my peace and comfort it is true that i am here entirely for their sakes but to serve my country in this way has been also the object of my life though i should not have done it in this time or manner but it is not a sacrifice any more than that i have done a thing in a bad way which i should fain have done in a good one for this is sure to fail so farewell clarky dear don't let us talk any more about this it is as i have said before a fait accompli having at so great difficulty won her freedom florence clearly felt that any policy of half and half now might necessitate in the future a renewal of the struggle her sister was still in very delicate health and florence was advised by the family doctor himself that her visits involved much disturbing excitement besides the work at harley street if it was to be done efficiently required constant residence and unremitting attention and it was written he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me section five in august eighteen fifty four miss nightingale took a few days holiday at lee hurst where mrs gaskell the authoress was on a visit to mr and mrs nightingale it was then that mrs gaskell wrote the description of florence's personal appearance which has already been given page thirty nine mrs gaskell was struck no less by the beauty of her character she gave a sketch of miss nightingale's career and then continued it is not like st elizabeth of hungary the one efforts of her family to interest her in other occupations by allowing her to travel etc but the clinging to one object she must be a creature of another race so high and angelic doing things by impulse or some divine inspiration not by effort and struggle of will but she seems almost too holy to be talked about as a mere wonder mrs nightingale says with tears in her eyes alluding to anderson's fairy tales that they are ducks and have hatched a wild swan she seems as completely led by god as joan of arc i never heard of any one like her it makes me feel the livingness of god more than ever to think how straight he is sending his spirit down into her as into the prophets and saints of old and in another letter i am glad that miss blank likes north and south i did not think margaret was so over good what would she say to florence nightingale i can't imagine for there is intellect such as i never came in contact with before in woman only twice in man great beauty and of her holy goodness who is fit to speak a famous writer has said of the saints that the greatest and most helpful of them have always shown some wit or humour and of florence nightingale mrs gaskell noted further she has a great deal of fun and is carried along by that i think she mimics most capitally miss nightingale cut short her holiday on hearing that an epidemic of cholera had broken out in london she volunteered to give help with the cholera patients in the middlesex hospital she was up day and night receiving the women patients chiefly it seems outcasts in the district of soho undressing them and ministering to them the epidemic however subsided and she returned to her normal work in harley street section six 
The work there did not fail within its appointed scope, but in another way the failure which Miss Nightingale had predicted in her letter to Madame Mole soon became apparent. The scale of the undertaking was more restricted than Florence had desired, and she saw no means of widening it. She had wanted to receive patients of all classes, to enroll many volunteer nurses, to have opportunities for training them. Among a wide circle, both at home and abroad, her knowledge and her talents were well understood, and already in her correspondence for a year or two past, she appears as a woman to whom reference was made as to one speaking with authority. A missionary in Paris applied to her for two well-qualified matrons. Alas, she had to reply, I have no fish of that kind. She was making the most of her present opportunity, but it was narrow. Some of her friends had thought from the first that she was wasting her powers on unsuitable soil in Harley Street. Monkton Milnes, who paid a visit to Embley in December 1853, wrote to his wife, They talk quite easily about Florence, but her position does not seem very suitable. I wish we could put her at the head of a juvenile reformatory. Her own primary object was to train nurses and other friends mrs bracebridge among the number advised her to leave harley street since there she found no scope for so doing king's college hospital had just been rebuilt and another friend miss louisa twining opened negotiations in august eighteen fifty four for securing miss nightingale's appointment as superintendent of nurses there some of the medical men who had been impressed at harley street with her rare combination of gifts were most anxious that she should consent to take up such a post dr william bowman in particular strongly pressed her and was confident that if she agreed he could get the appointment en train in the autumn miss nightingale's mother and sister sought as strongly to dissuade her the sister laid stress on florence's doubtful health the mother added objections on the score of the medical students they both urged that if she must do something of the kind great ormond street and work among children were more suitable and convenient florence herself was greatly drawn to king's college hospital and began devising plans on the model of kaiserswerth for enrolling a staff of nurses among farmers daughters but the immediate future hid in it another fate for florence nightingale thy lot or portion in life said the caliph ali is seeking after thee therefore be at rest from seeking after it so miss nightingale may have read in emerson and in homelier phrase her good aunt mai had said to her if you will but be ready for it, something is getting ready for you, and will be sure to turn up in time. Which things, Florence, I doubt not, laid up in her heart. When news began to arrive from the east, did she recall a prophecy which had been made about her by a friend long before the Crimean War was dreamt of? Lady Lovelace, the daughter of Lord Byron, the Ada, sole daughter of my home and heart, had, before her death in 1852, written a poem in honor of her friend florence nightingale i have quoted some of it already the piece ends with a presage in future years in distant climes should war's dread strife its victims claim should pestilence unchecked be time strike more than sword than cannon maim he who then reads these truthful rhymes will trace her progress to undying fame. End of Freedom, Paris, and Harley Street continued. Part Two, Chapter One of the Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1, by Edward Tyus Cook. Part 2. The Crimean War, 1854-1856. Who is the happy warrior? Who is he that every man in arms should wish to be? It is the generous spirit who, when brought among the tasks of real life, hath wrought upon the plan that pleased his boyish thought, or if an unexpected call succeed, come when it will, is equal to the need. Wordsworth Chapter 1 The Call October 1854 Not for delectation's sweet, 
not the cushion and the slipper not the peaceful and the studious not the riches safe and palling not for us the tame enjoyment pioneers o oh, pioneers walt whitman on september twenty the battle of the alma was fought and the country as greville noted was in a fever of excitement the disembarkation of the allied british and french forces for the invasion of the crimea had begun on the fourteenth their advance was not resisted until they reached the bank of the alma where the russian commander was awaiting attack in so strong a position that he was confident of victory in less than three hours the allied troops had driven the enemy from every part of the ground lord raglan the commander of the forces congratulated the troops on the brilliant success that attended their unrivalled efforts in the battle on which occasion they carried a most formidable position defended by large masses of russian infantry and a most powerful and numerous artillery the river which the russian commander had hoped to make the grave of the invaders became famous in the annals of british valor thou on england's banners blazoned with the famous fields of old shalt where other fields are winning wave above the brave and bold and our sons unborn shall nerve them for some great deed to be done by that twentieth of september when the alma's heights were won o thou river dear forever to the gallant to the free alma roll thy waters proudly proudly roll them to the sea nearly forty years had passed since the british army had been engaged in european warfare the battle of the alma though it disclosed little tactical skill and though it was not followed up as it might have been had at any rate shown the desperate courage of the british soldier the note of exultation which inspired the verses of archbishop trench expressed the popular mood presently there was a change the number of killed and wounded was very large but though many homes were thrown into mourning it was felt in the words of the official bulletin that such a victory could not be achieved without a considerable sacrifice the country did not at the time grudge the sacrifice but lord raglan's dispatch was followed by another the crimean war was the first in which the special correspondent played a conspicuous part and the dispatches sent to the times by mr william howard russell availed even to overthrow a ministry in the times of october nine attention was drawn to the futility of the nursing arrangements on the british side the old pensioners who had been sent out for such service were not of the slightest use the soldiers had to attend upon each other on the twelfth a long letter from our special correspondent dated constantinople september thirty ended with the following passage it is with feelings of surprise and anger that the public will learn that no sufficient preparations have been made for the proper care of the wounded not only are there not sufficient surgeons that it might be urged was unavoidable not only are there no dressers and nurses that might be a defective system for which no one is to blame but what will be said when it is known that there is not even linen to make bandages for the wounded the greatest commiseration prevails for the sufferings of the unhappy inmates of scutari and every family is giving sheets and old garments to supply their wants but why could not this clearly foreseen want have been supplied can it be said that the battle of the alma has been an event to take the world by surprise has not the expedition to the crimea been the talk of the last four months and when the Turks gave up to our use the vast barracks to form a hospital and depot, was it not on the ground that the loss of the English troops was sure to be considerable when engaged in so dangerous an enterprise? And yet, after the troops have been six months in the country, there is no preparation for the commonest surgical operations. Not only are the men kept in some cases for a week without the hand of a medical man coming near their wounds, not only are they left to expire in agony, unheeded and shaken off though catching desperately at the surgeon whenever he makes his rounds through the fetid ship but now when they are placed in the spacious building where we were led to believe that everything was ready which could ease their pain or facilitate their recovery it is found that the commonest appliances of a workhouse sick ward are wanting and that the men must die through the medical staff of the british army having forgotten that old rags are necessary for the dressing of wounds if parliament were sitting 
some notice would probably be taken of these facts which are notorious and have excited much concern as it is it rests with the government to make inquiries into the conduct of those who have so greatly neglected their duty on the following day a further letter from the special correspondent was published it is impossible he wrote for any one to see the melancholy sights of the last few days without feelings of surprise and indignation at the deficiencies of our medical system the manner in which the sick and wounded are treated is worthy only of the savages of dahomey the worn-out pensioners who were brought as an ambulance corps are totally useless and not only are surgeons not to be had but there are no dressers or nurses to carry out the surgeon's directions and to attend on the sick during the intervals between his visits here the french are greatly our superiors their medical arrangements are extremely good their surgeons more numerous and they have also the help of the sisters of charity who have accompanied the expedition in incredible numbers these devoted women are excellent nurses these scathing attacks changed the mood of the country there was still exultation in victory and still readiness to pay its price but the special correspondent's charges of neglect towards the sick and wounded raised a feeling of bitter resentment of resentment against the authorities but also of pity for the victims the times accompanied the special correspondent's letter on october twelfth by a leading article making appeal to its readers who were sitting comfortably at home to bestir themselves and render such help as might be possible to the soldiers in the east a letter was published next day from sir robert peel who had enclosed two hundred pounds to start a fund for supplying the sick and wounded with comforts other contributions were quickly forthcoming and on october fourteenth a letter was published asking why have we no sisters of charity there are numbers of able-bodied and tender-hearted english women who would joyfully and with alacrity go out to devote themselves to nursing the sick and wounded if they could be associated for that purpose and placed under proper protection two there were those among the ladies of england who had not waited to be stung into action by such appeals on the first news of the failure of the british nursing arrangements they had asked themselves whether they might not help not merely by money but by personal service one of the first to move was lady maria forrester she must have read and marked the letter in the times on october nine for already by october eleven she had placed herself in communication with miss nightingale offering money to send out some trained nurses i was so anxious something should be done she said to lady verney that i would have gone myself only i knew that i should not have been the slightest use happily the minds of those who could be of the greatest use were moving in the same direction if a party of women nurses were to be sent out to the east with any prospect of success there were two persons in england whose cooperation was essential and by fortunate chance they were personal friends one was Mr. Sidney Herbert, the secretary at war. The preposition which I have placed in italics must be noted. The reader would not thank me for entering at length into all the intricacies of war office organization, disorganization, and reorganization which went on during the Crimean War and have continued to our own day. But this much it is necessary to remember, that in 1854 there was a secretary for war, the duke of newcastle and a secretary at war mr sidney herbert the curious part of the arrangement was that the secretary at war had nothing to do with war as such he was technically only a financial and accounting official but mr sidney herbert in the emergency created by the crimean war stepped courageously beyond the strict bounds of his office he had already shown himself by many beneficent measures of practical reform to be the soldier's friend he was deeply interested, as we have heard, in the care of the sick. He knew how overworked was his colleague, the Duke of Newcastle, and in this matter of hospitals he assumed the position of volunteer delegate of the Secretary of State. I wish, wrote Mr. Gladstone to Monkton Milnes, October 15, 1855, that some one of the thousand who in prose justly celebrate Miss Nightingale would say a single word for the man of routine who devised and projected her going. Lord Stanmore has said not a word, but a volume in that sense. 
what was truly admirable was the man of routine's bold departure from routine the employment of female nurses in the army was in this country entirely novel it would probably excite some jealousy in the medical profession it was sure to be criticized by the military men the cabinet had much else to think of the duke of newcastle had more on his hands than any one human being could properly accomplish mr herbert from his influence in the cabinet from his winning manner and general popularity was the man to carry through the new departure he had pondered long over the problems of nursing both in military hospitals and in civil life he could see no reason why a task which in civil life was entrusted almost exclusively to women should in the case of military hospitals be confined to men the french government had sent out fifty sisters of mercy mr herbert could see no reason why england should not do something of a like kind he determined to make the experiment he was strengthened in his resolve by the fact that he was intimately acquainted with the character and the powers of the second indispensable person he knew miss florence nightingale the preceding part of this volume has shown by what circuit first her life had been one long preparation for precisely such work as was now wanted she and the minister had read the dispatch in the times with equal if different interest to mr herbert it came as a call for something to be done if the ministry were to avoid dangerous criticism and to this motive which must rightly actuate every minister there was added the conscience of a high-minded man sincerely and eagerly anxious to do all that was possible to improve the treatment of the sick and wounded soldiers to miss nightingale as she read the dispatch and the stirring appeal which accompanied it the words came with something of the force of a call from above for nearly ten years of her life she had consciously yearned and half consciously for a much larger period after ample scope in which to exercise her power of organization and her desire to serve the sick and suffering during many of those years she had been training herself so as to be ready to use her opportunity when it should occur and here was the opportunity at hand in which patriotism confirmed her personal aspirations god's good time had come the minds of the minister and of miss nightingale were kindled together they reached the flash point of action at almost an identical moment private initiative forestalled official overtures only by a few hours working in harmony they carried the scheme into operation with an unparalleled rapidity End of section 15the Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1, by Edward Tyus Cook. The Call, Continued. 3. Within two days of the publication of the dispatch from constantinople miss nightingale and her friends had made their plans she submitted them to the minister in the following letter addressed to his wife miss nightingale to mrs herbert one upper harley street october fourteenth eighteen fifty four my dearest i went to belgrave square this morning for the chance of catching you or mr herbert even had he been in town a small private expedition of nurses has been organized for Scutari, and I have been asked to command it. I take myself out and one nurse. Lady Maria Forrester has given two hundred pounds to take out three others. We feed and lodge ourselves there, and are to be no expense whatever to the country. Lord Clarendon has been asked by Lord Palmerston to write to Lord Stratford for us, and has consented. Dr. Andrew Smith of the Army Medical Board, whom I have seen, authorizes us and gives us letters to the chief medical officer at Scutari. I do not mean to say that I believe the Times accounts, but I do believe that we may be of use to the wounded wretches. Now to business. 1. Unless my ladies' committee feel 
that this is a thing which appeals to the sympathies of all, and urge me, rather than barely consent, I cannot honorably break my engagement here, and I write to you as one of my mistresses. 2. What does Mr. Herbert say to the scheme itself? Does he think it will be objected to by the authorities? Would he give us any advice or letters of recommendation? And are there any stores for the hospital he would advise us to take out? Dr. Smith says that nothing is needed. I enclose a letter from E. Do you think it any use to apply to Miss Burdett Cooth? We start on Tuesday, if we go, to catch the Marseille boat of the 31st for Constantinople, where I leave my nurses, thinking the medical staff at Scutari will be more frightened than amused at being bombarded by a parcel of women, and I cross over to Scutari with someone from the embassy to present my credentials from Dr. Smith and put ourselves at the disposal of the doctors. 3. Would you or someone of my committee write to Lady Stratford to say, this is not a lady, but a real hospital nurse, of me, and she has had experience? My uncle went down this morning to ask my father and mother's consent. Would there be any use in my applying to the Duke of Newcastle for his authority? Believe me, dearest, in haste, ever yours, F. Nightingale. Perhaps it is better to keep it quite a private thing, and not to apply to Governor qua Governor. This letter was posted on Saturday. Mr. Herbert had left London to spend Sunday at Bournemouth, and thence, unaware of the communication which was on its way to him from Miss Nightingale, he addressed the following letter to her. Sidney Herbert to Miss Nightingale. Bournemouth, October 15, 1854. Dear Miss Nightingale, you will have seen in the papers that there is a great deficiency of nurses at the hospital at Scutari. The other alleged deficiencies, namely of medical men, lint, sheets, etc., must, if they have really ever existed, have been remedied ere this, as the number of medical officers with the army amounted to one to every ninety-five men in the whole force, being nearly double what we have ever had before, and thirty more surgeons went out three weeks ago, and would by this time, therefore, be at Constantinople. A further supply went on Thursday, and a fresh batch sail next week. As to medical stores, they have been sent out in profusion, lent by the ton weight, 15,000 pairs of sheets, medicine, wine, arrowroot, in the same proportion. And the only way of accounting for the deficiency at Scutari, if it exists, is that the mass of stores went to Varna and was not sent back when the army left for the Crimea. But four days would have remedied this. In the meanwhile, fresh stores are arriving. But the deficiency of female nurses is undoubted none but male nurses having ever been admitted to military hospitals. It would be impossible to carry about a large staff of female nurses with the army in the field, but at Scutari, having now a fixed hospital, no military reason exists against their introduction, and I am confident they might be introduced with great benefit, for hospital orderlies must be very rough hands, and most of them, on such an occasion as this, very inexperienced ones. I receive numbers of offers from ladies to go out, but they are ladies who have no conception of what an hospital is, nor of the nature of its duties, and they would, when the time came, either recoil from the work or be entirely useless, and consequently, what is worse, entirely in the way. Nor would these ladies probably ever understand the necessity, especially in a military hospital, of strict obedience to rule. Lady M. Forrester, Lord Roden's daughter, has made some proposal to Dr. Smith, the head of the Army Medical Department, either to go with or to send out trained nurses. I apprehend she means from Fitzroy Square, John Street, or some such establishment. The Reverend Mr. Hume, once chaplain to the General Hospital at Birmingham, and better known as author of the scheme for transferring the city churches to the suburbs, has offered to go out himself as chaplain with two daughters and twelve nurses. 
he was in the army seven years and has been used to hospitals and i like the tone of his letters very much i think from both of these offers practical effects may be drawn but the difficulty of finding nurses who are at all versed in their business is probably not known to mr hume and lady m forrester probably has not tested the willingness of the trained nurses to go and is incapable of directing or ruling them there is but one person in england that i know of who would be capable of organizing and superintending such a scheme and i have been several times on the point of asking you hypothetically if supposing the attempt were made you would undertake to direct it the selection of the rank and file of nurses will be very difficult no one knows it better than yourself the difficulty of finding women equal to a task after all full of horrors and requiring besides knowledge and goodwill great energy and great courage will be great the task of ruling them and introducing system among them great and not the least will be the difficulty of making the whole work smoothly with the medical and military authorities out there this it is which makes it so important that the experiment should be carried out by one with a capacity for administration and experience a number of sentimental enthusiastic ladies turned loose into the hospital at scutari would probably after a few days be misas a la porte by those whose business they would interrupt and whose authority they would dispute my question simply is would you listen to the request to go and superintend the whole thing you would, of course, have plenary authority over all the nurses, and I think I could secure you the fullest assistance and cooperation from the medical staff, and you would also have an unlimited power of drawing on the government for whatever you thought requisite for the success of your mission. On this part of the subject, the details are too many for a letter, and I reserve it for our meeting. For whatever decision you take, I know you will give me every assistance and advice. I do not say one word to press you. You are the only person who can judge for yourself which of conflicting or incompatible duties is the first or the highest, but I must not conceal from you that I think upon your decision will depend the ultimate success or failure of the plan, your own personal qualities, your knowledge and your power of administration and among greater things your rank and position in society give you advantages in such a work which no other person possesses if this succeeds an enormous amount of good will be done now and to persons deserving everything at our hands and a prejudice will have been broken through and a precedent established which will multiply the good to all time i hardly like to be sanguine as to your answer if it were yes i am certain the bracebridges would go with you and give you all the comfort you would require and which their society and sympathy only could give you i have written very long for the subject is very near my heart liz mrs herbert is writing to mrs bracebridge to tell her what i am doing i go back to town to-morrow morning shall i come to you between three and five will you let me have a line at the war office to let me know there is one point which i have hardly a right to touch upon but i know you will pardon me if you were inclined to undertake this great work would mr and mrs nightingale give their consent the work would be so national and the request made to you proceeding from the government who represent the nation comes at such a moment that i do not despair of their consent deriving your authority from the government your position would secure the respect and consideration of every one especially in a service where official rank carries so much weight this would secure to you every attention and comfort on your way and there together with a complete submission to your orders i know these things are a matter of indifference to you except so far as they may further the great objects you have in view but they are of importance in themselves and of every importance to those who have a right to take an interest in your personal position and comfort i know you will come to a wise decision god grant it may be in accordance with my hopes 
Believe me, dear Miss Nightingale, ever yours, Sidney Herbert. There was no hitch, such as Sidney Herbert half feared, from reluctance on the part of Miss Nightingale's parents. Her uncle, Mr. Samuel Smith, husband of her Aunt May, of whose helpfulness we have heard, had already half obtained their consent to her going as a volunteer. All hesitation was removed when the news came that she was asked to go by and for the government itself. My love, wrote Miss Nightingale's sister to a friend, October 18. Government has asked, I should say entreated, Flo to go out and help in the hospital at Scutari. I am sure you will feel that it is a great and noble work, and that it is a real duty, for there is no one, as they tell her, and I truly believe, who has the knowledge and the zeal necessary to make such a step succeed. And to the same friend a day or two later, Before in Harley Street I did not feel sure that she was right. There seemed so much to be done at home. But now there is no doubt that she is fitted to do this work, and that no one else is, and that it is a work. I must say the way in which all things have tended to and fitted her for this is so very remarkable that one cannot but believe she was intended for it. None of her previous life has been wasted. Her experience all tells, all the gathered stores of so many years. Her Kaiserswerth, her sympathy with the R. Catholic system of work, her travels, her search into the hospital question, her knowledge of so many different minds and different classes, all are serving so curiously and much more than I have time for. Yes, and perhaps even the difficulties which affectionate solicitude had placed in Florence Nightingale's way might have been counted among her preparations for a task involving great power of will and determination. Miss Nightingale saw Mr. Herbert on Monday, October 16, and the matter was arranged between them. Mrs. Sidney Herbert and the other ladies of the Harley Street Committee readily released their superintendent. Her faithful friends, Mr. and Mrs. Bracebridge, agreed to accompany her. Mr. Herbert had assured Miss Nightingale of their willingness without any previous consultation, a fine instance, surely, of friendly confidence. The Duke of Newcastle, who had some slight personal acquaintance with Miss Nightingale, and the other members of the cabinet cordially approved the initiative of their colleague, and three days later Miss Nightingale received her official appointment and instructions. The Secretary at War to Miss Nightingale War Office, October 19, 1854 Madame, having consented at the pressing instance of the government to accept the office of superintendent of the female nursing establishment in the English General Military Hospitals in Turkey, you will, on your arrival there, place yourself at once in communication with the chief army medical officer of the hospital at Scutari, under whose orders and direction you will carry on the duties of your appointment. Everything relating to the distribution of the nurses, the hours of their attendance, their allotment to particular duties, is placed in your hands, subject, of course, to the sanction and approval of the chief medical officer. But the selection of the nurses in the first instance is placed solely under your control, or under that of persons to be agreed upon between yourself and the Director General of the Army, and ordnance medical department, and the person so selected will receive certificates from the director general or the principal medical officer of one of the general hospitals, without which certificates no one will be permitted to enter the hospital in order to attend the sick. In like manner the power of discharge on account of illness or of dismissal for misconduct, inaptitude, or other cause is vested entirely in yourself but in cases of such discharge or dismissal, the cost of the return passage of such person home will, if you think it advisable, and if they proceed at once, or so soon as their health enables them, be defrayed by the government. Directions will be given by the mail of this day to engage one or two houses in a situation as convenient as can be found for attendance at the hospital, or to provide accommodation in the barracks if thought more advisable and instructions will be given to Lord Stratford de Redcliffe 
to afford you every facility and assistance on landing at Constantinople, as also to Dr. Menzies, the chief medical officer of the hospital at Scutari, who will give you all the aid in his power and every support in the execution of your arduous duties. The cost of your passage both out and home of yourself and the nurses who may accompany you or who may follow you will be defrayed by the government as also the cost of house rent, subsistence, etc., etc., and I leave to your discretion the rate of pay which you may think it advisable to give to the different persons acting under your authority. In the meanwhile, Sir John Kirkland, the army agent, has received orders to honor your drafts to the amount of one thousand pounds for the necessary expense of outfit, traveling expenses, etc., etc., of which sum you will render an account to the purveyor of the forces at Scutari. You will, for your current expenses, payment of wages, etc., etc., apply to the purveyor through the chief medical officer in charge of the hospital, who will provide you with the necessary funds. I feel confident that, with a view to the fulfillment of the arduous task you have undertaken, you will impress upon those acting under your orders the necessity of the strictest attention to the regulations of the hospital and the preservation of that subordination which is indispensable in every military establishment. And I rely on your discretion and vigilance carefully to guard against any attempt being made among those under your authority, selected as they are with a view to fitness and without any reference to religious creed, to make use of their position in the hospitals, to tamper with or to disturb the religious opinions of the patients of any denomination whatever, and at once to check any such tendency, and to take, if necessary, severe measures to prevent its repetition. I have the honor to be, Madame, your most obedient servant, Sidney Herbert. The instructions promised in this letter were duly sent to the commander of the forces, the purveyor-in-chief, and the principal medical officer, and the way was smoothed for Miss Nightingale, as they thought in Downing Street, by supplementary letters to some of the officials. A letter was sent to the purveyor-general, October 19, in which Mr. Sidney Herbert trusts that you will use every endeavor to assist Miss Nightingale in the performance of the arduous duties she has voluntarily undertaken the success of which must necessarily depend upon the assistance and cooperation of others, and cannot fail to be of great benefit to those gallant men who have suffered in the service of their country. Similarly, Dr. Charles Trevelyan, Assistant Secretary to the Treasury, remarking that the commissariat officers are the bankers and stewards of the army, wrote, as he told Miss Nightingale, October 20, to Commissary General Filder, and Deputy Commissary General Smith, the senior officer at Scutari, to request that they will from the first give you all the support they are able, and instruct their officers of every grade to do the same. Any difficulties which might confront her would not be caused, it seemed, by lack of support at home. 4. Private support was forthcoming as readily as official. Mr. Henry Reeve, an old friend of Miss Nightingale and her family, rejoicing that she had now an opportunity of action worthy of her, spoke to the great Delaney, and requested him to direct Mr. MacDonald, who was being sent out to administer the Times Fund, to cooperate with Miss Nightingale. Mr. MacDonald was a man, as Mr. Reeve testified, and as Miss Nightingale was to discover, to the great advantage of their common cause of remarkable intelligence and activity. Two days after the receipt of her official instructions, five days after her interview with Mr. Herbert, Miss Nightingale and her party left London, October 21. The amount of work which fell upon Miss Nightingale during the ten days, October 12 through 21, was enormous, and some of the details she was obliged to delegate to others. The headquarters of the expedition during its outfit were established at Mr. Sidney Herbert's house in Belgrave Square, and there Miss Mary Stanley and Mrs. Bracebridge interviewed applicants. Miss Nightingale, foreseeing, only too truly, as the event was to show, the difficulty both of finding suitable women and of supervising them, 
was inclined to limit the number to twenty. Mr. Herbert, thinking that such a new departure should be made on a considerable scale, proposed a larger number, and Miss Nightingale gave way. Forty was the number agreed upon, but the material which offered itself was not promising. Here we sit all day, wrote Miss Stanley. I wish people who may hereafter complain of the women selected could have seen the set we had to choose from. All London was scoured for them. We sent emissaries in every direction to every likely place. We felt ashamed to have in the house such women as came. One alone expressed a wish to go from a good motive. Money was the only inducement. Ultimately, thirty-eight nurses were obtained. Mr. Herbert, in the concluding passage of his instructions, relied on Miss Nightingale's vigilance to prevent religious tampering. This was an instruction which she had discussed with him, for she foresaw, again only too well, the odium theologicum that might confront her. She was primarily concerned to get the best nurses as such, but she was anxious also that the different churches or shades should be represented. In this desire she was in large measure disappointed. Application was made both to St. John's House, an institution inclined towards Tractarianism, and to the Protestant Institution for Nurses in Devonshire Square. In each case the answer was returned that nurses could only be supplied if they were to be subject to their own committees. The government's condition of subjection to Miss Nightingale's control was rejected. The authorities of St. John's House proposed that their nurses should be accompanied by the master of the house to act as their guardian. It will readily be imagined how impossible Miss Nightingale's position would have been on such terms. The proposal shows, incidentally, how little some people understood of the conditions of discipline necessary in a military hospital. Mr. Sidney Herbert, the chaplain general of the forces, and Miss Nightingale met at the council of St. John's House. The point of Miss Nightingale's exclusive control was conceded, and the master stayed at home. The lady superior of St. John's House at this time was Miss Mary Jones, who, to the end of her life, remained one of the most valued and tenderly devoted of Miss Nightingale's friends. The authorities in Devonshire Square, on the other hand, would not surrender the point of separate control, and accordingly no nurses were supplied by the distinctively Protestant institution. We are only vexed, wrote Lady Verney, because Flo so earnestly desired to include all shades of opinion, to prove that all, however they differed, might work together in a common brotherhood of love to God and man. The party, as ultimately recruited, was composed of ten Roman Catholic sisters, five from Bermondsey and five from Norwood, eight Anglican sisters from Miss Sellen's home at Devonport, six nurses from St. John's House, and fourteen from various English hospitals. It has often been supposed that the nurses who accompanied Miss Nightingale were ladies of gentle birth, but, with a few exceptions, this was not the case. On the eve of their departure, the nurses were addressed by Mr. Herbert in his dining-room. He told them that if any desired to turn back, now was the time of decision, and he impressed upon them that all who went were bound implicitly to obey Miss Nightingale in all things. All started on their ways, we are told, strengthened by his heart-stirring words, and cheered no less by the sunny brightness of his presence than by his kindly and unfailing sympathy. Unhappily, the effect was not in all cases permanent, as we shall hear. 5. Do not answer this, wrote a minister to Miss Nightingale, for I am sure you must have more on your hands now than a Secretary of State. But what struck those about her was her perfect calm. No one is so well fitted as she to do such work, wrote Lady Canning to Lady Stuart de Rothesey, October 17. She has such nerve and skill, and is so wise and quiet. Even now she is in no bustle and hurry, though so much is on her hands, and such numbers of people volunteer services. She had only one worry. Her pet owl had died. When her family were leaving Embley to see her off, the feeding of the owl was forgotten in the hurry and flurry. It was embalmed, and, 
the only tear its mistress shed through that tremendous week says her sister was when i put the little body into her hands poor little beastie it was odd how much i loved you for the rest she was as calm and composed in this furious haste wrote her sister october nineteen with the war office the military medical board half the nurses in london to speak to her own committee and institution as if she were going out for a walk she was quiet because like wordsworth's happy warrior in the heat of excitement she kept the law in calmness made and saw what she foresaw like the character drawn by another master hand in the tumult she was tranquil because she had pondered when at rest a small black pocket-book is preserved in which were found at miss nightingale's death a few of the many letters received just before she left england for the east perhaps they were the very last letters received perhaps they were there for other reasons one spoke of a mother's love monday morning god speed you on your errand of mercy my own dearest child i know he will for he has given you such loving friends and they will be always at your side to help in all your difficulties they came just when i felt that you must fail for want of strength and more mercies will come in your hour of need they are so wise and good they will be to you what no one else could they will write to us and save you in that and in all ways they are to us an earnest of blessings to come i do not ask you to spare yourself for your own sake but for the sake of the cause ever thine another letter reminded her of the love of god god will keep you and my prayer for you will be that your one object of worship pattern of imitation and source of consolation and strength may be the sacred heart of our divine lord always yours for our lord's sake henry e manning and a third among them was from the friend whose life she had declined to share but whose sympathy was still precious to her my dear friend he wrote october eighteen i hear you are going to the east i am happy it is so for the good you will do there and the hope that you may find some satisfaction in it yourself i cannot forget how you went to the east once before and here am i writing quietly to you about what you are going to do now you can undertake that when you could not undertake me god bless you dear friend wherever you go end of part two chapter one the call Part Two, Chapter Two, of the Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One, by Edward Tyus Cook. The Expedition, Problems Ahead. On the ocean, no post brings us letters which we are compelled to answer. No newspaper tempts us into reading the last night's debate in Parliament. The absence of distracting incidents, the sameness of the scene, and the uniformity of life on board ship leaves us leisure for reflection. We are thrown in upon our own thoughts and can make up our accounts with our consciences. Froud Miss Nightingale and her party left London on Saturday, October 21. Among those who saw them off was her cousin, Arthur Hugh Clough. The principal halts were made in Paris and Marseilles. At Paris, Miss Nightingale had hoped to recruit some sisters for nursing service. She went to the headquarters of the Order of St. Vincent de Paul, furnished with letters from the British government and the French military authorities, and accompanied by the British ambassador's private secretary in order to strengthen her application. But it was refused. At Marseilles, with what turned out to be admirable forethought, she laid in a large store of miscellaneous provisions. Her uncle, Mr. Sam Smith, accompanied the party to Marseilles, and from his letters we obtain vivid glimpses of the expedition and route. Kindly received everywhere, he wrote, October 26, by French and English, 
Still, it was very hard work for Flo to keep Forty in good humor. Arranging the rooms of five different sects each night before sitting down to supper took a long time. Then calling all to be down at six ready to start. She bears all wonderfully, so calm, winning everybody, French and English. A correspondent wrote to the Times from Boulogne, describing how the arrival of the party there caused so much enthusiasm that the sturdy fisherwomen seized their bags and carried them to the hotel, refusing to accept the slightest gratuity, how the landlord of the hotel gave them dinner and told them to order what they liked, adding that they would not be allowed to pay for anything, and how waiters and chambermaids were equally firm in refusing any acknowledgment for their attentions. Lady Verney, in a letter to a friend, acutely noted a yet more remarkable thing. The railroad would not be paid for her boxes. At Marseilles, the expedition excited lively interest, and its chief was overwhelmed with attentions. Where she was seen or heard, wrote the proud uncle, there was nothing but admiration from high and low. Her calm dignity influenced everybody. I am sure the nurses quite love her already. Some cried when she exhorted them at the last, and all promised well. Blessings on her. She makes everybody who joins with her feel the good and like it, instead of disposing them against it, as some well-meaning, oppositious spirits do. And again in another letter, Words cannot tell Mrs. Bracebridge's devotion to Flo, nor Flo's to the cause. Neither sat down but for a hurried meal. Shopkeepers, visitors, nurses, servants, every single instant. Flo never crossed the threshold. There she was, receiving in her little bedroom, not at bedtime, the inspector general, the consul and agent, a queen's messenger, times correspondent, and two or three shopkeepers with the same serenity as if in a drawing-room quite descouvré. Her influence on all, to captain and steward of boat, was wonderful. The rough hospital nurses, on the third day after breakfasting and dining with us each day, and receiving all her attentions, were quite humanized and civilized, their very manners at table softened. We never had so much care taken of our comforts before. It is not people's way with us. We had no notion Miss N. would slave herself so for us. She looked so calm and noble in it all, whether waiting on the nurses at dinner in the station, because no one else would, or carrying parcels or receiving functionaries. The Bracebridges are fuller than ever of admiration of her, as I am. She looked better and handsomer than even the day she sailed. I went back with the literary public of Marseilles, all full of admiration. It was very doleful sitting in Flo's deserted room. She sailed from Marseilles on board the Vectus on Friday, October 27, loudly cheered from an English vessel in the harbor, carrying with her, as a friend had written, the deep prayers and gratitude of the English people. 2. From the moment when public announcement of her mission was made, she had, indeed, become a popular heroine. Though well known in society, she had been as yet a stranger to public fame, so much so that the Times itself, in printing the announcement, October 19, said, We are authorized to state that Mrs. Nightingale, etc., Delaney cannot have kept his eye on the news columns, for not until some days had elapsed was it discovered to the public that Mrs. Nightingale was in fact Miss. Who is Mrs. Nightingale? was a heading in the Examiner, October 28, and the question was answered in a biographical article. Some passages of it deserve record here, for it went the round of the press throughout the world, and was the source from which, from that day to this, the popular idea of Florence Nightingale has been derived. The article stated succinctly, and with substantial accuracy, the course of her life, dwelt upon the facts that she was young, graceful, feminine, rich, and popular, enlarged, with less accuracy, upon her delight in the palpable and heartfelt attractions of her home, described her forsaking the assemblies, 
lectures, concerts, exhibitions, and all the entertainments for taste and intellect with which London in its season abounds, in order to sit beside the sick and dying, and concluded thus, she has set out for the scene of war, at the risk of her own life, at the pang of separation from all her friends and family, and at the certainty of encountering hardship, dangers, toils, and the constantly renewing scene of human suffering, amid all the worst horrors of war. There are few who would not recoil from such realities, but Miss Nightingale shrank not, and at once accepted the request that was made her to form and control the entire nursing establishment for all sick and wounded soldiers and sailors in the Levant. While we write, this deliberate, sensitive, and highly endowed young lady is already at her post, rendering the holiest of women's charities to the sick, the dying, and the convalescent. There is a heroism in dashing up the heights of Alma in defiance of death and all mortal opposition, and let all praise and honor be, as they are, bestowed upon it. But there is a quiet forecasting heroism and largeness of heart in this lady's resolute accumulation of the powers of consolation, and her devoted application of them, which rank as high and are at least as pure. A sage few will no doubt condemn, sneer at, or pity an enthusiasm which to them seems eccentric, or at best misplaced, but to the true heart of the country it will speak home, and be there felt that there is not one of England's proudest and purest daughters who at this moment stands on so high a pinnacle as Florence Nightingale. The discovery by the public that the head of the nursing expedition was not Mrs. Nightingale, a matron, but a young lady, graceful, rich, and popular, added to the enthusiasm which her devotion called forth. Her services were rendered gratuitously, her necessary expenses were to be defrayed by the government, and officialdom opined that no voluntary contributions, either in money or in kind, were needed. Happily for the comfort of our soldiers in the East, private individuals took a different view, and, in addition to the Times Fund, donations were sent to Miss Nightingale personally, both by her friends and by the general public. An account rendered after her return from the East shows that from the general public she received nearly £7,000 in money. This fund added to the help which she obtained from the Times and supplanted by expenditure out of her private purse enabled Miss Nightingale greatly to extend the scope of her work. The statement that she was rich requires some qualification. Her father was rich, but the personal allowance which he had made to her when she declared her independence in 1853, was five hundred pounds a year, and it remained at this figure for several years. During her mission to the East, she devoted the whole of it to her work. Gifts in kind and offers of personal service also poured in. Now that Miss Nightingale was at sea, the task of dealing with such matters was undertaken by her sister and a friend. The Nightingale family had taken a house for the time, in Cavendish Square, number four, which became the headquarters of a charitable bureau. I am well nigh rid out, wrote Lady Verney to Madame Mole, November six, one hundred seventy letters to answer in the last fortnight, and very difficult ones, some of them. I should like you to hear a batch of the offers of all kinds we receive, some so pretty, some so queer. Old linen is abating, I am happy to say. Even knitted socks are slacker, but nurses, rabble and respectable, ladies, and very much the reverse, continue to reign. It is tremendous. However, having reached number 276, we are going to shut the door. Mary Stanley and I sit daily at the receipt of custom, and funny things do we see and hear. Human nature is a wondrous work, whether of God Almighty I sometimes begin to doubt." It is worth noting, in view of an unfortunate dispute that presently arose, that both Lady Verney and Miss Stanley distinctly understood that additional nurses would only be sent if Flo asks. All applicants were so informed. 
but so keen was the desire to serve that many ladies so lady verney wrote are undergoing hospital training on chance three miss nightingale meanwhile was at sea on her way to constantinople revolving many things in her mind she had been called to a mission upon which issues very near to her heart depended if it succeeded then as mr herbert had written to her not only would an enormous amount of good be done now to the sick and wounded but a prejudice would have been broken through and a precedent established which would multiply the good to all time and so as we all know it was destined to be but at the time the fate of the experiment was doubtful it was mr herbert's conviction that no one except florence nightingale could make it succeed but it was by no means certain that even she could do so she took in her hands the reputation of the minister who trusted her and her own and not her reputation only but the hopes the aspirations the ambitions which had ruled her life she determined to succeed and she counted the difficulties which would confront her writing two years later and giving account of her stewardship she paid her tribute of thanks to those among the officials medical as well as military to whose benevolence ability and unselfish devotion to duty she was indebted for facilities without which in a position such as hers new to the service and exposed to much criticism and difficulty she would have been utterly unable to perform the work entrusted to her she saw from the start that she would be exposed in the very nature of the case to some medical jealousy and much military prejudice the idea of employing female nurses at scutari had been mooted before the army left for the east but was abandoned as the duke of newcastle explained because it was not liked by the military authorities of the military prejudice against the intrusion of women even for the gentle office of nursing into the rough work of war some entertaining illustrations are happily on record lieutenant colonel sterling afterwards sir anthony sterling k c b was on active service during the crimean campaign first as brigadier major and afterwards as assistant adjutant general to the highland division he was an elder brother of carlyle's john sterling and himself possessed of some literary skill a solid substantial man carlyle calls him he was also a man who loved to stand by the ancient ways he wrote a series of lively letters during the campaign and in his will directed that they should be published nowhere so clearly as in sterling's highland brigade in the crimea have i found contemporary evidence of the prejudices against which the experiment of mr herbert and miss nightingale had to contend during miss nightingale's visit to balaclava in eighteen fifty five some dispute arose among the nurses miss has added herself wrote colonel sterling to the hospital of the forty second and she will not acknowledge the voice of the nightingale who has written an official letter to lord raglan on the subject i suppose he will order a court-martial composed of nurses who will administer queer justice our colonel is something of a wag he cannot help laughing at the nightingale because as he explains he has such a keen sense of the ridiculous he is so pleased with his quip about the female court-martial that he returns to it in another letter he is tickled too by a saying of the mess-room that miss nightingale has shaved her head to keep out vermin one can almost hear the honest colonel's guffaw as he wonders whether she will wear a wig or a helmet women he supposes imagine that war can be made without wounds they will be teaching us how to fight next and as for their ideas of nursing why some of the ladies actually took to scrubbing floors it amused him but angered him no less he has to admit that he believes the nightingale has been of some use but he bitterly resents her capture of orderlies for mere purposes of nursing and when he is asked when will she go home answers with christopher sly would it were done however he writes presumably sidney herbert is gone and i hope there is not to be found another minister who will allow these absurdities miss nightingale read sir anthony's book when it came out in eighteen ninety five 
and made some severe marginalia upon it, remarking upon his absolute ignorance of sanitary things, noting the misprints as a fair index to the whole, and finally dismissing the book as one long string of seniority complaints. But I protest that she need not have been so angry, and indeed perhaps she was not so angry as she seemed, for her caustic pen was not always a true index of her mind. For my part, I take my hat off to Sir Anthony Absolute. His honest, old-fashioned outbursts let in a flood of light upon one side of the difficulties which were to confront Miss Nightingale upon landing at Scutari. She pondered much also upon the possibilities of friction with the medical officers, and here, too, our colonel has some light to give us. The chief medical officer out here, he wrote, ought to have been entrusted with nightingale powers. The service in all its branches stuck together, it will be seen, and no blame to it for that. But if a fighting colonel smarted under what he deemed a slight upon an army medical officer, how much more might the medical service itself be expected to resent any encroachment upon its appointed province? How keenly it did resent such encroachment may be gathered from the Life and Letters of Sir John Hall, M.D., by Mr. Mitra, whose book supplies us with the same kind of illustration in regard to the army doctors that we may gather from Colonel Sterling's in regard to the soldiers. Sir John, like Sir Anthony, thought the whole thing very droll. He was stationed in the Crimea, and we shall hear something of the strained relations between him and Miss Nightingale when we follow her thither. But at Scutari also there were some few medical officers who retained even to the last a ridiculous jealousy of any meddling by Miss Nightingale and her staff. She foresaw this danger and made up her mind to avert it by every means in her power. And there was a third danger which she foresaw also. Not only had she to overcome military prejudice and to avert medical jealousy, but she had also to prevent religious disputation. This last task was beyond her powers, as it has ever proved beyond those of men, women, and angels, for by this cause even the angels fell. No work, however beneficent, has ever yet been found beyond the capacity of the odium theologicum to mar and embitter. Miss Nightingale's mission did not escape the common lot, as we shall hear but she was keenly sensible of the danger. Miss Nightingale pondered over all these things as the ship sped on its way to the Golden Horn, and the more she pondered, the more she was driven to decide upon a course of action, very different from what many people supposed that she would adopt, but entirely consonant with the bent of her own mind. She saw quite clearly that, if she was to avoid the rocks ahead of her, what was needed was not so much genial, impulsive kindness, reckless of rules and defiant of constituted authority, but rather strict method, stern discipline, and rigid subordination. The criticisms to which she exposed herself in the superintendence of her nurses were based not upon laxity, but upon her alleged severity. As for her own conduct, she supposed that her work, when she landed, would be that of the matron of a hospital. If, as it turned out, she became rather, as she put it, mistress of a barrack, it was because she found herself in the midst of conditions which the constituted authorities at home had not foreseen, and before which those on the spot stood powerless. Miss Nightingale was happily possessed of an original mind and a resolute will. She saw evils which cried out for remedies and new occasions taught new duties. End of Part 2, Chapter 2